Welcome to the Creator Accelerator course by Creator Launch. If you're watching this, then it means that you're different. You have either started or feel compelled to start walking down an unconventional path. It means that you're like me. It means that you see the conventional way of doing things, going to school, deciding what you're gonna do for the rest of your life at the age of 16, getting into debt by going to college, university, learning outdated lessons from crusty old professors that have no idea what it takes to succeed in the real world, then getting a job, working yourself to the bone for 50 years, all in the hope that by the end, you have enough money saved to retire and finally live the life of your dreams. I know I don't need to explain to you why that's total bullshit, otherwise you wouldn't be here. So how is it that we have all this incredible technology that allows us to do things a thousand times faster, a thousand times more efficiently, and a thousand times better than we could 50 years ago, yet we're living in a civilization where more than ever, people are expected to work 50 plus hours a week, doing a job they hate, getting told what to do by bosses that suck, commuting hours every day to sit in a room lit with bright, fluorescent lights, doing meaningless work that has no clear impact. Yeah, it doesn't make sense. <laughs> but thankfully, there is another path that we can now walk. It's a path that's filled with meaningful, purposeful, and impactful work. A path of infinite opportunity to live your days as you wish with no bosses, no commutes, no corporate bullshit. It's a path where you get to decide what you do every day. A path where you get to decide who you work with and surround yourself with. It's a path where you get to build a dream life of freedom to say no to the things you don't want to do. Welcome to the unconventional path of being a creator. This community and course is dedicated to the ones who see the world as a beautiful playground of mystery, adventure, and exciting challenge. Welcome to Creator Launch University. In the Creator Accelerate course, you're gonna learn fundamental skills, character traits, and beliefs that I've used to build my dream life and also make my first 10K online. And I've managed to transform it from one where I felt lost trapped, unfulfilled, not too long ago, and I transformed it into a life where every single morning I wake up electrified and excited to make an actual impact. The Creator Accelerator course is made up of five modules. These are the fundamental modules that are the precursor to the Launch Mastermind program, which is our 12 month long private community and growth infrastructure program for hyper ambitious creators. They're really looking to scale their one person high ticket business to extreme levels so they can make a true impact with their life's work. The course includes full training on how I use my Creator OS Notion dashboard every single day to dream, plan, and manage my life as a creator and business owner. The biggest mistake creators make is learning things and not implementing them. So my ask of you is all the exercises that I give to you in this course, complete them. <laughs> I've done them myself, so I know exactly how long it takes. But this is the foundation that you need to build if you want to complete the life of being a winner in the creator economy. Because look, it is a competition. Do not expect to compete if you don't do the fundamentals. Your entrepreneurship journey is a marathon. And you need to start thinking in years and decades, not weeks and months. So enjoy the process of self-discovery and dream life design, lean into it. And if you feel resistance towards what you're doing or what I'm recommending you to do, just remind yourself, there's another creator who is doing it and they will beat you. So with that said, welcome to the Creator Accelerator course. Let's get to work. Welcome to the Creator Accelerator course by Creator Launch. 
So we have one, two, three, four, five modules in the Creator Accelerator course. This first module is the introduction module. And we've got a few different things we're going to cover in this topic. But they're going to move on to the microeducation model, the understanding yourself module, leveling up, and then dream life design. It's going to be a vibe. So my mission at Creator Launch is to empower as many people as possible to find their purpose, break free, make their impact, and unlock their true potential. These are all things that are extremely important to me. And I'm very fortunate that I now live a life where I feel like I've broken free. And every morning I start by journaling and reminding myself that I'm now living the life that I dreamt of three years ago when I was commuting every single day into work, spending three hours on a train, cramped, falling asleep, having absolutely no direction, no purpose or anything like that. And in three years, I'm here and I get to live my days as I wish. And I'm hoping that this course is going to help you move towards that type of lifestyle, which I'm super grateful to have. My vision at Creator Launch is to build a brand that's synonymous with empowering the next generation of creators and one person business owners to build their dream life of freedom. That's really what it's all about. Ultimately, it's freedom. And freedom means different things to different people. But to me, it means essentially just being able to have the option to say no. I believe freedom is the option to say no to things that you do not want to do. And one of the things that you find in the entrepreneurship journey is that as you level up, you get more opportunities passed on towards you. And it doesn't necessarily mean that you should say yes to them. Uh, in fact, what you want is the option to say no to things that you don't want to do. And these are my values. So elite quality, quality is absolutely everything to me and something that I really want my brand to be, again, synonymous with. I know this is still, I'm still very early in my journey, but I'm very excited about creating content, products, services, and experiences that are of a completely different level of quality to what is out there. And I do believe like from being in this game for a couple of years now, a few years, I've seen what's out there and I'm really proud of what I've been able to build here. And I hope you guys will be able to see the effort that I put into this and, uh, Hopefully you gain from it. Speed is queen. Probably the core sentiment that you need in entrepreneurship is you've got to move fast. You've got to move fast. You've got to move quick. So speed is queen. Repeated excellence. Now, there's no point just doing good things once, but it's doing good things over and over and over again. And one of the shortcuts to repeated excellence is doing reps, putting in reps unrivaled experience. Again, you maybe see a theme here, but I don't want my brand to ever be associated with low quality, low effort. And everything that I'm doing here is to make sure that you guys are getting something that you can't get anywhere else. That's really ultimately what that means to me. And then this one is actually linked to Speed is Queen. 80% down is 100% fucking awesome. Now that's something that I stole from Dan Martel, the author of uh, Buy Back Your Time. And he has this, his quote is, 80% done is 100% freaking awesome. But I don't mind, I like saying the F word. 80% done is 100% fucking awesome. And that really is the idea that there is nothing that beats putting stuff into the marketplace and actually testing and getting results from the market. So get it out there and see what the results are. I guess that's me. So potentially you might have no idea who the hell I am. Um, and so just to give you a little bit of a background into to who I am, I'm kind of going to walk you through because I think it's important to understand my journey so that you can understand how this potentially relates to your journey. So I'm a, I guess I come from a scientific background. Like a lot of the methodologies and I, like kind of my thesis around business is based on kind of a scientific method alongside kind of a creative aspect, which I love. It's like kind of the, the mix of, creation and art, uh, create art and science. And so I did two degrees. I studied seven years at university. I was a biomedical scientist. So I had a bachelor's in biomedical science. 
I then went on to study dentistry as a postgraduate and graduated. And for the first couple of years of my, my dentistry career, I worked my ass off. I surrounded myself with the best dentists in the world and managed to get myself my, what I consider to be my dream job. And we'll talk about that in a, in a, in a second. After that, I then made a migration into the tech industry. And I worked in tech for, I guess, since I've been in tech since. I would consider this to be technology. I consider everything that I do to be based in technology. Um, but I worked for some of the biggest brands in the world. Um, I consulted for some of the biggest brands in the world when it came to their online teams, helping them improve their online experiences for their customers. And so uh, I have quite a good amount of expertise around kind of customer experience and online business. And I moved that into what I kind of do now, which is helping one person business owners. That's my niche now. My niche now is one person business owners. Um, I've also been an agency owner. So uh, I kind of talk on that in a second. I've now been a coach. So I currently coach students. Um, I'm a creator myself. And most importantly, I believe the most important one is that I am a life enthusiast. So I believe to be an interesting human, you have to live an interested life. You have to be interested in shit. You have to be a permanent student. And this is something that I guess has been just consistent across my whole life. I've always dived deep into topics. And I think if I can get across one philosophy for you, it's that depth in understanding, depth in depth in your skills, your knowledge, that is the secret. And you have to be curious. Now I have this saying that's kind of linked to my my podcast, The Summit Club, which is like the summit is infinite and it's there to be infinitely curious. So to get to the summit, you have to be infinitely curious. The summit doesn't exist. And maybe that doesn't make any sense to you. It makes sense to me. Some of you may know who this guy is. I mean, his his name's over here, but this is Tom Brady. So widely considered to be the GOAT, the greatest of all time in NFL, so American football. And the reason I show you this is because, as I said, my first degree was in biomedical science. So I had a, uh, I had a, my professor in my final year of my undergraduate degree used to be the strength and conditioning coach of Tom Brady when he was ta had this photo taken whilst he was getting drafted at college. So my professor who taught me the, uh, the science behind muscular, like my, my final year project was all around muscular hypertrophy. So that's why I'm fucking Jack now. Um, but I learned, I learned the fundamentals of, of, uh, how to grow a body from the best of the best because this guy my professor was the guy that took tom brady and added helped him add like 30 pounds onto his frame because he was known for being like thin just non-athletic and i was very lucky that i got to work with that professor in my my university uh career so that was the first time when i was like 19 20 21 where i got this kind of like trigger of interest around kind of self self mastery self actualization and personal development and yeah i got curious and i got interested and again this is uh yeah this is actually me so this was me when i started university so i was still jacked um and this was me at the end of university after three years um just a little bit more jacked. And it's because I took the lessons that I learned from my professor who taught me the, the fundamentals, the core fundamentals of building muscle. And I used that and I used it myself and got in great shape for the first time. And that's been a kind of like consistent across my, my life is that my health comes first. This was me as a dentist. And as I mentioned, I kind of, when I left dental school, I was considered like the absolute nerd of dentists. So I managed to make a name for myself as a young dentist by proactively surrounding myself and networking with the best dentists in the world during my first year after graduation. 
I knew that I didn't want to be in the, I didn't want to work in the public health part of dentistry because I knew that my ability to help my patients was handicapped by the public health kind of limits on how much money you could spend on procedures. And I was like, fuck that. I want to do the absolute best for my patients. I just, I just want to do that. And so I was like, well, shit, I'm going to have to be a private dentist. And in the UK, it typically takes about five, six, seven years to be able to even start thinking about getting a a private job where you have patients that come to you and you just tell them what they need and they pay for it. And I recognized very early on, I was like, well, I need to, <laughs> this is not the path for me. I want to do the absolute best for my patients. How am I going to do that? And I did that by recognizing that who are the people that gatekeep the best jobs in the industry, in the private private kind of like dentistry world within the UK? And it was dentists who had good names. And so I was like, well, shit, I can, I can find these people. So I spent the first year shadowing. I would go, I would travel all over the country. Um, I would shadow some of, the, some of the best dentists in the world. I networked with them online. This was my first kind of like, she was my second foray into online communities. So I became really deeply embedded in an online community of the best dentists in the world called Dental Town, where all these guys who were the biggest nerds were posting cases, how to do stuff, pushing people, pushing each other to their net, to the, to their, like the absolute next limit or the next level. And I found that intoxicating. I found that feeling of surrounding and pushing myself to be intoxicating. And this was back in 2013 and 14, before social media was really taking off, before Instagram was, Instagram had only just like started. So no videos, no one was posting stuff. I began, I started posting photos and videos of teeth or photos of like my cases and teeth and stuff back in 2014. And that got me noticed. Um, I got some articles posted online and um, in some of the biggest, like well-respected publications online. And after the end of my first year, I managed to get my dream job. I managed to network myself and pr prove that I was capable enough to get a private job in under a year when it would typically take people seven years to be able to do that. And so this is my first, one of the ways I did this was I got clear on my goals. And that is going to be one of the fundamental principles of this course and how I'm going to showcase to you how I've done it. And then, yeah, this was, this photo was taken more than 10 years ago now. So this was 10, probably 2014 when this photo was taken. And on this whiteboard, I would have next to my desk in my first year, I had a list of all the dentists that I wanted to network with. And I had it next to my, on my wall and I had it there and I would just tick them off. Every month I would go and travel across the country, go and spend a day with one of the best dentists in in the country. And I quickly got renowned. Like it was the very, yeah, looking back, it was, um, I followed my gut instinct. No one was telling me, I eventually had a mentor that very weirdly showed me that this, his life 30 years from now was um, not all rosy, not what I thought it would be. And this guy who I looked up to turned out that he he was pretty grumpy, pretty sour, pretty bitter about the state of the industry, the state of where the medical field was going in the UK, the state of dentistry in the UK. And I was like, shit, I've just got my dream job, but now I'm looking at my mentor and my mentor is saying it's shit. His life is kind of like, he wouldn't say it, but I was like, I can sense that this guy's not happy. And ultimately happiness is what it's all about, right? So I really was like, okay, so I've got this job and I didn't realize at the time until I had the job, my dream job, I was only seeing a few clients, a few patients every day doing the procedures that I love to do and pa passing off the stuff I didn't love to do to other people, other specialists. And, um, I was there, I was sat in this like white walled room and I was like, fuck, this is my life for the next 40 years. And to say that it slapped me around the face, that realization would be an understatement. And ultimately it got me to considering what the hell I'm doing with my life. 
And at the time, online business, there was none of this stuff on YouTube. There was no Gary V. There was none like Gary V was still doing wine library at the time. Like online business just wasn't what it is today. And so I was like, <laughs> I think I want to do something else. And I was early, early enough in my career. I was still like 25 years old. I was still young enough, 25, 26. And I just took the risk. And the single thing that I did that probably changed my trajectory the most was I got a coach. I paid an amount of money that I didn't have access to. I put three grand, 3,000 pounds on an Amex and I worked with a career coach. Um, and for six months, he helped me uncover what potentially I could go on to next. And we highlighted through that process that the tech industry was where I wanted to be. And so um, that was based around my interests on Tim Ferriss. I'd read the four hour work week when I was in my second year of university. And then eventually it was like, this is where I, this is, I think this is where I want to be, or at least this is where I'm going to start walking towards. And long story short, after six years of working in the tech industry, I was like, well, I don't want to be in the tech industry anymore. And fortunately that coincided with the rise of online business and the creator economy. And I'm really, really happy now that I'm doing work that I love doing every day, helping people, helping as many people as I can, which is why I got into this in the first place. I wanted to help people, but my sphere of influence as a clinician was really limited. It was only limited to the number of people that I could literally fit my fucking hands into. And I'm very glad that I'm at, um, now where I'm at now. So that was dentistry. <laughs> that was me again. So then the question is, where do I go next? And this is a gift taken from the first job, first full-time job that I had in tech. I was a sales rep. So I joined a hardware tech startup, an education tech startup. And my job was to sell our suite of products, which you could see in this briefcase and go and sell them to the biggest retailers or as many retailers within the UK as possible. And within the space of a year, I went from my first week where I, my manager was asking me, he asked me, turn around, he's like, Tom, can you send over the deck for the meeting? And I was like, dude, what the fuck is a deck? And he was like, it's a presentation. And I was like, okay, I am, I'm green here. I don't know what the hell I'm doing. So first year in business, didn't have a clue what I was doing. And fast forward 18 months, I had managed to sell our products into basically all of the major retailers apart from grocery retailers within the UK. So these are some of the biggest, most notable retailers within the UK. And this was the most fun job that I ever had because I was working in a startup that had maybe 30 people, 30, 40 people, 30 employees. It was small enough where it was like fun. It was fast moving. It was chaos. And I learned everything and I had a fucking great manager as well. Like I've had a lot of shit managers in my time, but my first manager here, I was so lucky. So shout out to Luke, who is also an entrepreneur now. And he was an incredible manager to me. He, never made me feel like I didn't know stuff, even though I didn't, he was always very, uh, supportive and he was, I think he was a couple of years younger than me. So I had an amazing experience working for this business, learned the fundamentals of business at this business. I didn't know what margin was. I didn't know what profit was. I didn't know what revenue was. I didn't know what turnover was. I didn't know what anything was. And this, this business, this job taught me everything. And so if like, if you're if you're really starting out, if you're watching this and you're just starting out in your journey and your career, the biggest thing that I would recommend is go and work for a young, small startup where it's chaos. You will be given so much responsibility that you will have to learn fast and you will learn so fast and you will have a shit ton of fun. It may feel crap at, at some times, which it definitely did. There was one time where I had to go and I had to go and stand in a uh, stand in a conference hall in, in Nuremberg in Germany for basically like five days straight, 8am until 6pm 
in this gigantic conference center whilst people would come up to me and be like, what's this? And I'd be like, oh, this is, and then they'd be like, cool, bye. It was, there were some miserable times, but there were some also incredibly fun times. So yeah, if you're starting out and you're like, oh, I just want to do, I want to do this. Go, the best advice I can give you is go and work at a startup where someone else will teach you. Okay. So that was my first job. And then I was like, uh, well, shit, I'm like 26 now, 27. And I'd never had a break, never had a single break. And I was from the age of 15 until 27, had not had a single break, had never done any traveling, had never done anything. Um, and so I was like, I'm going to do something that I've always, always wanted to do, which was go and work in the mountains in a ski resort because one of my loves is my biggest passions is skiing. And, uh, I went and worked for two years in the mountains. So this is me sat on top of a mountain, watching the sunrise in Austria. And those two years were the most fun years of my entire life. And again, lesson for you, if you're young and you haven't done anything with your life, the best thing that you can do is go and travel. Go and put yourself, take yourself out of your current situation and go drop yourself into somewhere that feels fucking scary. And I never had as much fun. I never, I made so many friends. I saw things that I never expected I'd see. And I lived a life in my mid to late twenties that most people live in their early twenties, but I got to see it. I got to live it through the lens and perspective of someone who it's to done seven years of university, worked as a doctor and done all these things. And it gave me a huge amount of appreciation for the opportunity to do that. So if, again, if you haven't done that, highly recommend you go and do that. And if you want to go see a video of me, of what my life was, like, there's actually a video of this on my YouTube channel. If you go back to all my old videos. So yeah, eventually I worked in tech, I came back and I worked, came back after a couple of years of break and then I went back into tech and this time I went into software. So I worked in software for three, three years and again, worked with some of the biggest brands in the UK. Um, and I specifically worked with their online teams to improve their online customer experiences and, uh, worked as a consultant for their team. So I worked one-on-one, -on -one. I would tell them how to make their websites better and their apps better. And, uh, that was also sick. And I learned a ton about online customer journeys, user experience. So I've got a very good kind of basic understanding of user experience. And again, it was fun, but it was the corporate grind. And I was like, it's time for me to fucking start my business. And Claudia was my first ever business partner. And she was a, uh, she was a colleague of mine at one of the one of the businesses that we did this, we did software for, we worked with some of the biggest retailers out there and we were like, we can do e-commerce, we can do it. And so we started an e-commerce brand selling sustainable beauty products. And that was my first mistake that I made in business. I made an assumption that Claudia, who is really fashionable, loved fashion, I assumed that she all therefore also loved beauty. And I didn't realize that they were two very distinct categories big fucking error on my part. And we were also very similar people. So we had similar skills, interests, and again, second error. When choosing a business partner, you don't choose the same person as you, you choose someone who complements your skill set. So I learned the, less, this lesson the hard way. And this lesson cost me about $15,000 of debt. Buying inventory that didn't get sold, and that sucked. But, I learned a lot and this is one of the lessons of the creator economy is that unless you fucking try and do stuff, you never learn. And so I actually had in-game learning of building a brand, working with influencers, buying products, making ads, like I learned it all. And so this gave me the fundamental knowledge even though it failed because my thesis, which was people love sustainability, which people don't fucking give a shit about the sustainability. I am, um, which I found out the hard way. 
And this is why I don't recommend people go into businesses like e-commerce, where you have to put up a large in front, like upfront investment to get the get the ball rolling and get get the business started. And uh, yeah, like I learned a lot, but ultimately it failed, and it left me with a load of debt and obviously a bruised ego because you know you go to your family and your friends and you're like, I'm going to start this thing. It's going to fucking work, and then it doesn't work, and that sucked. But I I tried. And that's the biggest thing I want to get to you to get across to you is that you need to try. So shout out to all my friends and all the people that helped me with this business. Um, on to the next. Spoiler alert. It failed. Well, now you know that. But why did it fail? No profit margins. No one cared about sustainability. And I we collectively lost about 30K. And then I started because out of absolutely no, I had no off ramp. I had nothing. I was like, I'm not going to get a job. And so I started creating content on YouTube. I met a lot, bunch of really cool people and, and had an amazing time creating biz, creating content on YouTube. And I met my new business partner, my next business partner. So Liam, who is a, uh, is a YouTuber as well. And we connected cause we were kind of making videos on the same types of topics um, back a couple of years ago. And he, we were like, we can, we wanted to make an agency in the UK. So we decided we wanted to make an agency. So we started an agency about two years ago now. And we went all in. We started a podcast. We were making content. We had a small team and we were helping build communities for emerging tech businesses and, uh, companies that wanted to build communities on discord. And so this was really my first kind of like kind of start in community-based marketing and the creator economy. And, uh, so I've been building communities now for more than a couple of years. I've built a couple of my own communities, uh, on different projects. And this one as well, we had kind of, we were building communities for businesses. We had a shit ton of fun. We had a shit ton of fun. Traveled around the world, uh, got to hang out with really cool people, really at the kind of like cutting edge of technology and culture, which was very cool. And yeah, look, we built that business business at the time I left to 40K per month, which on the, you know, on the surface seems not bad, right? But again, no profit margins. The heavy lifting was done by us and it was done for you services. We were doing everything. I was building the communities. I was managing the communities. I was doing the marketing strategy. We were doing the marketing. We were doing everything. And it sucked. It took its toll on my health. And keep in mind that health is my number one priority. And I went from being in okay shape to being in the worst shape of my fucking life. And this was, this was a year ago. This was a year ago. This is what I looked like 12 months ago. And the good news is I've got it back and I'm looking in better shape now. But I realized who I want to serve throughout all of those kind of movements and pivots and fuck, fuck, fucking around and finding out, I realized who I wanted to serve creators me like i wanted to serve me and this is why because the world is shifting the world is shifting and this is your opportunity so goldman sachs has predicted the creator economy could approach half a trillion dollars by 2027 and that's pretty good that's pretty cool. And so what what I did was I wanted to pivot and I started pivoting our services to help creators. And so this is a creator that we helped launch community and launch his group coaching program. We took him from $5,000 or I took him from $5,000 to $30,000. And this was when I decided to start Creator Launch. And this was a year ago. At the same time, I started my own podcast. So I have my own podcast where I post my long form content and I'm really looking forward to growing this as I kind of grow my brand. Like this is the summit club is really the, the kind of the whole idea around the summit club is that the summit of life is infinite. There isn't 
the summit. You never get to the top. And it's this whole kind of like philosophy around the never ending path and journey. But it's allowed me to interview some of the biggest creators in the world. So last year I interviewed some of uh, about 12 of the biggest creators out there. Ross Harkness, Dakota Robertson, Justin Scott, and a load of other creators. And I learned a ton from them. And that's one thing that the creator economy does, which is it democratizes access. It breaks down the barriers so you can get access to people, which is so cool. And then also at the same time last year, I saw an opportunity to work. So someone who I was following as a creator um, who was into building systems and businesses was launching his new venture and was looking for freelancers to help. And this is a newsletter studio for creators. So this is a newsletter agency. So it's an agency done for you services where apart from writing the actual newsletter itself, it would help you with growth strategy. It was a growth partner for newsletters. And it was owned by this guy. This guy is Sahil Bloom. Um, so this guy was my boss last year and he's one of the biggest creators out there. And uh, I learned a ton at that business and I did it. I learned that I worked as a freelancer for about four months and it was very intentional. I did it really purely for the networking and to be able to get access to Sahil and others. And this newsletter was really behind some of the biggest newsletters that you see out there today. So I learned a shit ton about email marketing and newsletters, which was sick. So again, like I had my own business, but I wasn't afraid to go and do freelancing work to get experience on the side. And that's again, like a, a mindset that I think for you, when you're starting out, do the biggest thing, biggest regret that I have or kind of mistake I made was going all in and just trying to start everything from scratch when I could have been more strategic with it. And I'm really glad that I took this opportunity and ran with it when it presented it to myself. So I've been a consultant, I've been an agency owner, I've been a freelancer, and I've been a coach. Now, individually, each of these models have a low scale ceiling. They are an amazing way to get to your first 10K per month. But I believe that it caps out pretty, pretty fast because ultimately you're the only person that is there to deliver the services. My kind of thesis is based around a hybrid approach where you do whatever it takes, no matter the delivery system in a hybrid methodology. And I'm kind of calling mine a microeducation business model. And you deliver services as a consultant, an agency, freelancer, coach, you do whatever it takes to deliver results. And I'm really happy that I built an amazing first kind of foundation of community. And I've worked with some incredible people. Let's walk through. So I consider it our community, not our students. So Tim is in Amsterdam. He's a movement coach. Loved working with him and helped him launch his kind of product uh, last year, which was sick. Georgia is a corporate wellness consultant. Shout out to Georgia. Steven is a relationship coach who travels all over the world doing um, kind of wellness retreats called House Manifest, which is super sick. Jake is an Amazon FBA coach in the UK, crushing it. You know, this dude made over 50K in his, uh, across his community and mentorship in at the beginning of the year, which is incredible. Phil's a tech leadership consultant. Rebecca is a publishing consultant. Alex, Ma Alex Mathers is how you pronounce his name, is one of the most prolific brand consultants and writers on X, on Twitter and on LinkedIn. So go check him out. He's amazing. Uh, Ben's an Amazon FBA coach, really big kind of YouTube platform and Instagram huge on TikTok. Felipe is a podcast and audience building consultant, built his podcast uh, to over 200,000 followers and is now building his business based on helping others grow podcasts, which is a huge industry. And he's one of the best out there. Ben is an emerging tech consultant who I've been working with. I've been working with on di different projects for a couple of years. And he came to me and was like, Tom, I just, I need some help. I need some, I need some clarity. And so he came to me and we were like, let's get you some clarity then. 
and I worked with him, started working with him in June and I got him to go through a bunch of exercises to highlight where he wants to go. Where does he actually want to go? And he was like, well, I'd like to buy, I'd like to buy a second house. I'd like to do all these things. Um, but I don't know how I'm going to do it. And we recognized, we were like, well, okay, we tight, we put up, put down the numbers and we we're like, dude, you, you basically need to get to 30 K a month to be able to afford this life that you want. So let's put a plan in place. And he, when he started working with me, he was earning 8,000 pounds a month. And five months later, he was earning $40,000 per month, like just over 30,000 pounds per month. And he'd done it. And that was all due to just gaining clarity and focus on what he needs to do. So that's really sick. Jack is a self-improvement coach. He now has his own microeducation business as well, all around self-improvement. He is a, one of the tr classical digital nomads who's cl traveled Argentina. I think this is Costa Rica. And he's a really cool guy. Um, uh, go follow him on Instagram X. He's super cool. Teodor is a focus and productivity coach. Um, and he's recently gone back to university because he realized he wants to be an academic. And that is one of the only reasons, in my opinion, apart from a uh, formal education needed to be able to do a job, you should go to university. So Taylor wants to be renowned as one of the academics, kind of Jordan Peterson-esque, that type of thing. And he realized he needs to get a certain level in academia to be able to have a conversation or be around the same table as those types of people. So it's not all like you need to do this, need to do this. And our North Star is to get get our students to predictable 30K plus per month as coaches, consultants, freelancers. And my vision is simple. Make business simple and predictable for one person business owners and build your life, your dream life of freedom. Some of you may have seen this. I kind of made this up when I kind of realized at least for my life, I was like, this seem seemingly is the case. I believe success is at the meeting point of four elements. Time, proven game plan, clarity, and accountability. And so this is what I built at Creator Launch. I built, I built something that allows enough time. So 12 months, so I work with students for 12 months. I give them a proven game plan. So we have our authority and attraction flywheel and our kind of social follow follow funnel that we use to be able to get leads for our business and turn leads into customers. I help them with a custom roadmap. So every single student is at a different point of their journey. So I have to help them identify where they're at and where they need to get to in the next steps. So what are the milestones and checkpoints that we need to get them there? And then accountability. I look at, I look at accountability as kind of like four layers. So there's one-on-one -on -one accountability, there's group accountability, there's buddy accountability. So we have accountability pods with other entrepreneurs and then we have community accountability. So those are the four levels and we have that. We have one-on-one -on -one coaching with me. We have messaging support with me, group coaching, accountability pods with other entrepreneurs, trainings, resources, masterclasses, and the community. And so this is what I believe you need is the kind of core fundamentals to get success. If you don't have accountability, what's gonna keep you consistent? If you don't have clarity, how do you know what step to take next? And if you don't have a proven game plan, then you're just going to change every single week. You're going to go from one thing to another, one thing to another, and you're never going to make any actual progress. And people think it takes weeks to get success. It doesn't. It takes time. But it all starts with the fundamentals. And that is what this course is all about. The fundamentals, the Creator Accelerates course. So welcome to the Creator Accelerates course. This course is everything that I have learned in my entrepreneurship journey so far and have implemented to totally transform my life. The core fundamentals to build a super profitable one person business in the creator economy. Disclaimer, I am not recommending you do anything that I say. This is purely a documentation of what I've done currently am doing. Take it or leave it but there is only one person responsible for your success, you. So let's get to it. First up is gonna be the creator economy opportunity itself. So let's, uh, let's dive in.
Okay, let's go. Right. So this is part one of the introduction module, and this is all about the creator economy. So let's define the creator economy first. So the creator economy is a software facilitated economy that allows content creators to earn revenue from their creations. Pretty simple, right? According to Goldman Sachs, the ongoing growth of the creator economy will likely benefit companies that possess a combination of factors, including a large global user base, access to substantial cap substantial capital, robust AI-powered recommendation engines, versatile monetization tools, comprehensive data analytics, and integrated e-commerce options. As you saw from the previous the previous uh, lesson, the creator economy could approach half a trillion dollars by 2027. That is forecast by Goldman Sachs, and that is what I'm going all in on. So when we look at the total addressable market, currently sits at around $250 million, who knows where that is actually at, but it's forecast to go to double in size in just three years. So 2027 is getting close. That is not far away. It's a couple, like three years away. And the creator economy is what allowed this dude to go from fighting for his life in a cage to being worth, 10 years later, $615 million. So this is one of his brands, one of his many brands that he has, Proper 12, his whiskey brand. And this is one of the elements of his net worth. It's also what allowed this girl to go from this to a net worth of $1.7 billion with her brand Skims and her sister, Kylie, to go from this to $680 million with Kylie Cosmetics and allowed this dude to ultimately be able to afford to buy a football club from selling his gin for $350 million. Now, this guy is now, I think this is what his net worth is, but that's the rock, but this is based around him also being a very shrewd investor on some of the in some of the biggest other companies out there. So well, you know who this is. You know who this is. And again, this dude managed to within the space of a few years go from being just a movie star to having a net worth of approaching a billion, which is wild. But how? How? First, we need to go look back in history. And this guy, this guy, is, this guy is famously known as being the wealthiest man in American history with a fortune at his max approaching $410 billion. This is John D. Rockefeller. And the currency of that generation in the industrial era, era was oil. And that's where he made his wealth. But we have a new oil. And it's what allowed Connor, Ryan, Kim, and Dwayne to get very, very wealthy. The new oil is attention. And this is the reason why this dude, Gary V, says at the start of every single video he posts on YouTube, there's a clip of him saying, attention is the number one asset because he realizes that that is the case. The great news, you don't have to be The Rock, Conor McGregor, Kim Kardashian, Ryan Reynolds. These guys are all ex examples of dudes that within the space of two years, two, three years max, um, Ali Abdal a little bit more, but like have built huge audiences that have allowed them to break free. And that is the core thesis of Credit Launch and the creator economy. The thesis is simple. Get attention, build a personal brand, become an authority. Simple, right? Simple, maybe not easy. Now, this is kind of where I'm set, set, setting my flag in the ground a little bit. This is the tuition cost 
to go and study at Harvard. $80,000 for the academic year 2023-2024, which that means all things considered when you add in um, kind of like all of the stuff, you end up with a bill for over $300,000 to be able to go for a four-year degree in uh, at Harvard. $300,000. Now that's clearly unsustainable. Traditional education just can't keep up with the pace of innovation. It just can't. Like those institutions where you have professors and lecturers and people who have been sat on their ass for decades, how do you expect them to keep up with the changing pace of tech technology and an, a business, an online business world where you have people who are playing at the cutting edge every single day and pushing the cutting edge? They just can't. They just literally can't. So when I say traditional education is crumbling, I genuinely mean that it just cannot keep up. And paying $300,000 for a degree where the statistics are like, it's going to take you six years to be able to earn 100K salary after graduating from Harvard. That's the average. It takes six years for an average Harvard graduate to start making at least 100K. And my belief is that 100K these days is fucking nothing. We have entered a new era of education, and in my opinion, this is your opportunity. The world's never been more complex, and we are in desperate need of people who can fill the knowledge gap that is constantly widening. You don't need a large audience to make life-changing money. I'm an example of that. I don't have a huge audience, but I've managed to do pretty well. And all you need to do all business ultimately is, is bridging the gap. You need to help someone or some business bridge the gap from where they currently are to where they want to get to. And this gets overcomplicated so much, picking your niche. Your niche is really simple. It is at the meeting point of three things, your skills, your interests, your passions, and what the market needs. People always miss this out. They just think, oh, I'm just gonna do something that I love and people are gonna buy it. No, you have to know. And I, you, if you cast your mind back to my to the first, the first uh, training where I talk about my journey and my first entrepreneurship failure, which was making an assumption that people gave a fuck about sustainable beauty products, I did not assess the market needs. I also made a, a massive mistake about our interests. Didn't have the interests. And we didn't, sure as shit, didn't have the skills. So the business failed. And there's a better way. But it's understanding that it's a never ending journey. So the key takeaways so the creator economy is forecast to double over to over 500 million in the next three years. Attention is the new oil. Traditional education is failing. This is the opportunity for my online microeducation businesses. Business is bridging the gap. It is just taking someone from where they currently are to where they want to get to. And your niche is at the nexus of your skills, your interests, and market needs. Okay, next up, we are going to dive into what it takes and how to become an authority and an attractive character in the creator economy. Let's dive in. Okay, right, next up, we have becoming an authority and, attra and an attractive character. So winning winning in the creative economy is dependent on becoming an authority in your specialist area and becoming an attractive character worthy of being followed. Quite simple. You have to be interesting enough uh, to for people to want to follow you. How do we do it? So this is based around the idea of the trifecta of influence. So the trifecta of influence is made up of three things. An attractive character, a new opportunity and a future based cause. So what do these things mean? So these guys will be familiar to you. So I'll put myself in front of Paul Mosey. So this is someone that has a background, a story, a transformation, a mission of values and beliefs, which again, if you think back to my first presentation that I did, I went through my background, I went through my story, I showed my transformation, I shared my mission, I shared my values, and I showed my beliefs. Okay? 
and they think a, they think and they spend a ton of time thinking carefully about their character. They think about this. So the new opportunity. This is this is the vehicle that has allowed the attractive character to go through their transformation. So it could be a diet plan that helps them lose weight. It could be a program that helps them learn learn how to make more money. In Alex Hormozzi's case, it was his book, $100 million offers. This was his new opportunity. And he had a future-based cause. So a reason why this person is doing the thing that they are doing. So the reason why after at the end of every single or the beginning of every single video that he posted on his YouTube channel, it was he used to preface it by saying, I used to be broke and I don't want you to be. And you, ha you have to answer the, ask, answer the question, why am I doing what I'm doing? Like, why? So an attractive character ultimately is who? The future-based cause is why. So why are you doing what you do? And the new opportunity is what? When you have defined these three pillars of the trifecta of influence, your content strategy and your monetization roadmap will become clear. Let's give you an example. I want to help people discover their purpose, grow their personal brand, and build a profitable business that gives them autonomy over their choices. Remember I said freedom is just the ability to say no. So for me, my new opportunity is help people discover their purpose, grow their personal brand, and build their profitable business. And the future-based cause, why? So I can so then give them autonomy over their choices. And the how is my vehicle that I've produced, which is Creator Launch. So key takeaways. A personal brand is built through the trifecta of influence. An attractive character, who? A future-based cause, why? And a new opportunity, how? And next up, we'll find out what's next. Welcome to the Micro Education Business Model module. In this module, we're going to be covering the five common myths of entrepreneurship, as I see them. And I'll be sharing my thesis around microeducation, how I define it, what the opportunity is for you, and the exact strategy I've used to build my business, and how you can do the same. If I can get one thing across to you, it's that there are no rules here. There are just principles. The microeducation business model is a flexible approach where we just answer one question. What is the best way to get my customers towards the better future that they desire. It's a hybrid approach of coaching, consulting, and done for you service providing. You get to choose how to deliver those services. So just use the principles that I share and you will build a business that thrives. Let's dive in. Okay, this is the entrepreneur myths. Oop, wrong one. So this is part of the microeducation model module and this is all about the five common myths of entrepreneurship at least from my perspective so the first one is the myth of zuck so again yeah preface to this is that these are just my opinions this is my perspective on entrepreneurship my journey through entrepreneurship so what is the myth of zuck the myth of zuck is based around this idea that you need a big and or new idea to be a wildly successful entrepreneur. It is based around everyone looking at the likes of Mark Zuckerberg, Jeff Bezos, Richard Branson, Elon Musk, and thinking, oh shit, like I need my big idea. When in fact, these people have just built businesses based off the foundation of other people's ideas they have just made them better. So before the Tesla was invented, <laughs> it wasn't invented, the electric car was a thing. Elon Musk just came along and decided that he wanted to make a commercially viable version of the electric car. So he made, built Tesla. Before Facebook, there was MySpace and the social media, the idea of social media, there were multiple social media platforms before Facebook and right time, right place, Mark Zuckerberg took an idea and he 
made Facebook <laughs> and the rest is history. So this is really the myth of Zuck is based around the fact that there is no such thing as a truly original idea. Everything is an evolution of an existing idea. And that brings us on to myth number two, the myth of the blue ocean, a lovely blue ocean. Look how blue that ocean looks. It looks amazing. No competition. Fuck that. We want competition. The myth of the blue ocean is that you need to start a business where there is no other competition. It's bullshit. You need to see what is out there and you need to see where the successful fishermen are fishing and you need to go put your rod next to theirs and over time learn how to fish. So what that means is you need to learn how to be better and produce a better product than what is existing in the marketplace already. You then get incrementally better at fishing over time. And yes, it takes time and it takes investment to have energy, resources, time, people to get better. And that is that is the game. Do not over overcomplicate this thing and think you need to come up with a brand new idea. You do not, that is not entrepreneurship. Everyone starts somewhere. Again, going back to Elon Musk, like his first business, he wanted to figure out how to make payments better online. And he made, what was it, P2 or can't remember. I can never remember the name of that first business of his, of his, but it was eventually acquired by PayPal. He moved on to PayPal and then again, rest is history. You just get making stuff better than what ex already exists. Myth number three, <laughs> shout out if you know who this dude is. I'm going to break it to you. This guy is Pablo Picasso. And this really is based around the idea that like you need to be an artist who is creating wonderful pieces of art, beautiful pieces of art. And that every single thing that you need to do, you need to be this unique, perfect, you know, absolutely incredible piece of art. And the truth is, is that you do need to get there, but you only get there through putting in the reps. So what do I mean? So the myth of the artist is based around the business success is based on your ability to systematize your processes so that time after time you create consistent, exceptional products, experiences, and most importantly, trust with customers. Let me give you an example of what I mean by that. Now, if you haven't eaten at McDonald's, I don't know what you're doing because McDonald's is one of the best things that this planet has ever had <laughs> um, because it under the underpinning of McDonald's is the idea of consistency. Now, those of you who may not be familiar with the story of McDonald's and how it was built, well, it was built by two brothers, the McDonald's brothers. And they started this restaurant where this dude called Ray Kroc came along and he experienced this restaurant where previously all restaurants you had to place an order and wait 15, 20 minutes for your food to arrive. When Ray Kroc placed an order at McDonald's with the McDonald's brothers, his food was immediately placed in front of him within seconds. And he was like, what the fuck is this? This doesn't make any sense. But he tasted the burger and the burger was exceptional, absolutely exceptional. And the reason was, was because the McDonald's brothers had come up with systems, a load of systems to make making an incredible burger absolutely consistent. So that time after time, you could go to the McDonald's restaurant, the one that existed. And when you placed an order for a burger, you'd get it within seconds. And you knew after, as soon as you took that first bite, that was a McDonald's burger. And this is why McDonald's is the brand that you know and love today. And that when you go to McDonald's and you put an order in for a Big Mac, you will get a slightly damp, <laughs> but altogether very the same taste anywhere across the world because they use the same systems to make the same tasting burger time and time again. And this is what brings people back. And candidly, this is what brings me back to McDonald's every time I have a hangover, because I want that fat, fucking horrifically bad for you food that makes you feel good. And you go back for the consistency. And that is what you need to do with your business. You need to build, build a consistent business, systematize your business, and you don't need to be an artist about it. 
And the best way to learn about this is through this book called The E-Myth Revisited by Michael E. Gerber, Why Most business, Small Businesses Don't Work and What to Do About It. This is one of the mandatory reading book, books on the Launch Mastermind uh, program. And then number four, the myth of solopreneurship. Now look, shout out to this guy. Some of you may know who this guy is. Um, this was this is Justin Welsh, um, who is what most people might consider, who at least I consider to be the grandfather of solopreneurship. So he was the guy who popularized the term solopreneurship uh, about three, four years ago. I took his course on how to uh, create content and I use you know, some of those methodologies to this day. And some of you will have taken his course. Some of you will be familiar with it. And he is the person who beats the drum about solopreneurship. And I think that I believe that solopreneurship is a, is a myth and it's a myth for these reasons. Solopreneurship is a vehicle to get you from being an employee to being a full-time entrepreneur. It is a phase, not the ultimate destination that we are aiming for. Solopreneurship is not how you break free. You don't break free from being a solopreneur because being a solopreneur means that you just have a job. And what's the point of being an employee and swapping a, jo a one job for a job which has more responsibility? So it's not how you break free. Solopreneurship is the side hustle phase. So this is where you build enough velocity to escape your job. And then you learn the skills of entrepreneurship by learning how to build systems like we spoke about before and work with others. That is really important. So solopreneurship, it's not the destination. It is just the vehicle. Finally, the myth of you. Right now, you are accumulation of your past experiences, behaviors, habits, lessons, network, and desires. Your current existence reflects this accumulation. Therefore, to change your existence, you need to change you. You need to mythologize you. You need to turn yourself into a new person. And the way you do that is the process that we're gonna go through shortly which is crafting and designing a new identity. And I'm gonna walk you through the process that I've done. Uh, and this is all in the Creator OS part of the work, worksheets and exercises that I'm gonna take you through. So let's, uh, before we dive into that stuff, let's just go over the micro education business model. Just a note on this, um, <laughs> obviously, so when I create create these presentations, this is giving you a little behind the scenes. I use I use AI to create these uh, these visuals, and I typed in to Midjourney, so the the software that I use to create these. I typed in a micro education business, and I find this funny, curious because this is what AI spits out. So look at these things and like what. <laughs> Why would AI create a jar full of money and a tree coming out of it, growing out of it? Now, I'm not just, now this is me and I'm creating a business around how microeducation, the business model itself is quite, quite realistically the best way, most effective way, most efficient way to make money and AI is Proving it. So just a little side note, well, that was quite, quite interesting. Okay. Let's dive into the microeducation business model in the next module. Okay. Let's get into it. So this is the high ticket microeducation business model. Let's zoom into this bad boy. So I've got a question for you. What is easier selling a $2,000 product five times or selling a $20 product 500 times? Well, the answer is it depends. If you don't have existing distribution, the answer is A. That is the answer. So what are we gonna to cover today? Just want you to think about this. <clears throat> what is a value creator? 
what is a microeducation business as I define it? And what is the exact game plan that I've used to build my business? So we're going to cover this all today. So it really all starts with what we covered in the attractive character section in the in the training. So the trifecta of influence is made up of an attractive character, a future-based cause, and a new opportunity. Remember, this is the who, this is the how. No, sorry, this is the how, the new opportunity is the how, and the future-based cause is the why. So why are we doing what we're doing? Let me get this straight up. <clears throat> so, sorry, just struggling with the pinch and zoom here. Let's start with the attractive character to remind you. So this is someone that has a background, a story, a transformation, a mission, values and beliefs. And they spend a ton of time thinking about thinking carefully about their character. And this is the reason why all of these guys are well on their way to becoming billionaires, the modern billionaires. Think about how young some of these people are like they are absolutely going to become billionaires. Most of them are very close, if not already there anyway. So. The new opportunity, which is the vehicle. So there's in the online business space, I'm going to use these examples as online consulting, drop servicing, which is a man Gadzi's recent one. I'll get rid of that one. We've got micro SaaS, SMMA, the AI automation agency, drop shipping, micro education. So we've got the new opportunity. And then we have the future based cause. People follow people with a cause. That's one thing to really note about this. Like it or not, Leaders without a valiant cause will never have a following that lasts and certainly will never inspire people to greatness. So we've seen this happen time and time again. We had Sam Ovens with consulting.com. That was his future-based cause, which was helping people quit their nine-to-fives and build a consulting business. Gym launch. We had gym owners being able to fill their gyms for once. Amand Gazi with his online platform, Educate. And this guy's called Ollie Roberts, and he built story learning as a competitor to common solutions in the in the language learning space like Rosetta Stone and Duolingo. He built a $10 million per year education company just on teaching people how to learn languages through the art of story learning, storytelling. <clears throat> we've got Ali Abdal with his part-time YouTuber Academy, and we've got Dan Ko with his new software, Cortex. This guy will look familiar to you. This guy is Sam Ovens. So when he started consulting.com back in, I don't know, whatever, whenever it was, like 2015, 2016, um, he spent five years posting videos every week and month and on YouTube, and they got huge amounts of views. And this really showcased him as an attractive character because he was knowledgeable. Now, his new opportunity that he was pushing was online consulting and the future based cause was consulting.com. And this was what allowed Sam Ovens to make $34 million in annual revenue. And he was just selling a $2,000 product and he made $34 million an hour in annual revenue. So how did he do it? Well, he had a rod and he put a magnet on it and he put that rod in an ocean where he could find potential customers. And the ocean was Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. I know who's running Facebook ads. And what he would do is he would take those, those people and he would put them in a pool. And the pool was a Facebook group. And he built a community called consulting.com. And guess what? This dude may look familiar too. We had Hormozy. Before he was the Hormozy that we know and love, who was the author of um, $100 million offers and leads, he was pushing Gym Launch Secrets, his book around filling gyms. And he was the attractive character, but he was only an attractive character within his niche. And he was running Facebook ads. And his new opportunity was gym turnarounds and his future-based cause was gym launch. And this is what allowed him to make $30 million in annual revenue. And he was selling gym launch as an infrastructure to gym owners as a licensing infrastructure for $16,000. This is from Leila Hormozy, just clarifying that that was the case. 
And they still do it now. Jim Lorsch is still there now, although the Hormozis are out of it. So these guys have done it. <clears throat> Here are a couple of other guys who've done it. Now, they these guys are different in that they haven't come from the perspective of, I have a business that I'm going to help people with. These guys are what I call synthesizers. And Andrew Kirby, in fact, has created his kind of his his brand around synthesis and being a synthesizer. And these are value creators. And so Andrew Kirby, big YouTuber, for years posting valuable YouTube content. He's a unique and attractive character and his niche is information synthesis. Hamza, valuable YouTube content, unique, attractive character, and his niche is radical self-mastery. And so they did the same. They used content. I don't know if they, I don't think they've used ads. They might use ads. I don't know. I don't think so. And they use lead magnets for them. It's their their schools, their, their communities, their school communities. And they have free versions that they upsell to paid versions. They put their rod in, they attract people, and they go put them in their school community. And then they warm them up with long form content on YouTube and Spotify. And that is what we do. So the high ticket micro education business in my this is the way i look at it I, there's no rules no rules you can do what that do it the hell you want but i see it the way i see it is a new hybrid way to deliver coaching consulting and freelancing essentially services that result in a transformation and you can do it on school you don't have to build it on school it can be on any platform any community platform discord circle um kajabi is pretty shit facebook groups it doesn't matter like school, I've been using it now for a couple of months. And the truth is I hated it when I first used it as a community member because I wasn't used to that type of interface or Facebook groups. I'd never, I've never been involved in Facebook groups and that is what they designed it on. And school is designed like that. And I just didn't, didn't like it, but they have, uh, as a user, as a, someone who is actually building a community on it, it is bloody good. Like my background is in user experience and UI. They have been very good with how they've designed this platform. So thumbs up to Sam and the crew on school. Now, just to preface, there are no rules here. And that's beautiful. You get to do whatever the fuck you want. So there are principles though. So let's go over the principles. One, learn a skill. Two, create content. Number three, do the skill. Four, teach the skill. Five, build a community. Six, sell the implementation and the infrastructure, all the infrastructure. This is where the big bucks are at. And this is what I'm doing at Creative Launch. So I'm doing all these things, learn skills, create content around those skills do the skills, teach the skills, build a community. And I'm sell selling in my mastermind program, the infrastructure to help people scale past 30K per month. So the micro education business roadmap. So this is a quote from Dan Coe. Education is the pillar of progress and evolution. Education changes human behavior. Education creates useful people that contribute to society, earn more and create jobs. Education is the absolute fundamental core of being a human. We would be fucked. We would literally just be still slugs. We would still be slugs if we didn't have education. So find a problem, learn how to solve it, document how you solved it, distill into a replicable process, give it to others that want help. Find a problem, learn how to solve it, document how you solved it, distill it into a replicable process, Give it to others that want help. You with me? In my opinion, the best way to build a microeducation business is seeing it as a, whatever the mix needs to be to get results for your people that you serve through a range of either done for you, done with you, or do it yourself services. You fucking decide what you want to do. That's the beauty of it. There are no rules. And in my opinion, to get the best results with people, you typically need a mix of all of them. Okay. This is the roadmap. 
The skill acquisition phase is the first phase. The proof phase, proving that you are capable of doing what you say you can do, is next. We then have the community building phase, then the get paid phase. So first up, skill acquisition phase. Learn a high value skill, work for free. So if you if you don't have anything, if you're starting from absolute scratch right now, you have to work for free. You have to get proof that you're capable of doing it and you do it by working for free. That's how I've done it. That's how you have to do it. Don't think you can skip this step. Next is proof phase. Why you work for free is you go to someone and you say, hey, I'd love to try and help you in return for doing the shit for free for you. Please, can you give me a testimonial and a referral to someone in your network? Yeah, that is the game that we play when we're starting out. Proof phase, creating sales assets that are the proof that you are capable of what you say you are capable of doing. So this is creating assets like interviews, testimonials, case studies, VSLs, video sales letters, um, demos, walkthroughs, all types of sales assets that help people help people see that you're capable of doing what you say you're capable of doing and also helping them get results themselves. You then build leverage through content. And next up is the community phase. Funnel people into a community, provide free value, ascend to a paid product in the get paid phase and build your ecosystem. So as you've seen, if you look at uh, Creator Launch as an example, Creator Launch is a free community and I have a high ticket private community that I send people to. And you might be watching this now and you might be like, "Hmm, I wonder if I'm, if I'm a right fit for that. Let's jump on a call, see if you're a right fit. (laughs) Okay, so resources. What resources do you need to get people results? The answer is it depends, but you probably need a mixture of these things. Standard operating procedures, guides, exercises, coaching, templates, consulting, community, worksheets, cheat sheets, video trainings, guest expert masterclasses, and probably some other stuff that I've missed off here. These are all of the things that I've got a community at Creator Launch. Okay, let's get into the actual model now. So I've tried to distill this into its most simplest parts. So in five steps, this is the microeducation by business model, create a launch. This is the thesis. Number one, the system inputs. Number one is you create content. Number two is that you have conversations with people in the DMs who are engaging with your content. Either they follow you, interact with you, comment on your stuff, whatever. You then convert those conversations onto sales calls. You then convert a certain percentage of those sales calls into clients. You have you have success with those clients and you convert those those success cases into sales assets and you feed your content with those sales assets. It is a cycle and it never ends. <laughs> okay, let's get into more detail. This is a layered this is a Neanderthal level now. We were at the monkey level earlier. So at the top, this is the thesis that we run at the mastermind community at Creator Launch. You create growth content and follow ads. So I run follow ads, simple boosted reels on Instagram, and you have a target daily target ad spend and or the number of content, number of pieces of content you post. These are the key performance indicators. Now that is you're set serving that content to people who don't know you. You are then people finding find you and you create long form content on platforms like YouTube and Spotify. And this is where you post your sales assets. And this nurtures the people in your audience, your new audience. And what are you tracking? How much content you're posting on those platforms? You then funnel them into a free school community. What is the performance metric? Number of new members. You then connect with people in the DMs on on platforms like LinkedIn or Instagram. And what is the key performance indicator? Number of new conversations. You then convert a certain number of those into sales calls. You get pay in, paid in fulls. You collect revenue in cash and you turn sales calls into new clients. You then onboard them into a private community. I have mine on Telegram. And this is the KPI is number of new clients, students or clients. You then provide the infrastructure to guarantee success. And that's what I do at the mastermind. And the key performance indicators are 
client student success tracking and reporting. So we have uh, monthly KPI reports that we expect our students need to uh, submit. And we have tracking sheets that help them with pipeline creation, tracking and conversation tracking and ad performance. So we have a number of different methods that we use. We also have quarterly business reviews every quarter to see where they're at compared to their goals. And then you create sales assets based on those. That's the KPIs, number of testimonials, reviews and interviews. And then you throw it all back into the top and you go again. <laughs> okay, one more time. This is the human this is, we're nearly getting to the AI territory now. So at the top, we have cold audience, cold traffic. I don't know who you are. We create high impact content that builds authority, value content, or you use ads with clear ideal customer profile messaging saying you need to follow me. So we do this on the short form growth platforms like Instagram and LinkedIn, and we automate the process of get generating spicy leads, getting ideal potential clients who see who are who see who you are for the first time, and you get them into the top of your funnel. Next up, we turn them into a warm audience. Okay, this is interesting, and you do this with nurture content. You connect with people in the DMs and start having conversations, asking them why they why they followed you, what are they up to. What are they focused on? What are their goals? What are they trying to accomplish? Where, what are they struggling with? What are their challenges? And you create more content with value, authority, proof, testimonials, interviews, screenshots, and you create nurture content using sales assets on YouTube and Spotify. Give away all your methods for free. This video that you're watching is free. <laughs> I'm proof that this works. Keep proving that you're an authority, that knows what you're talking about and show that you understand your ideal client's biggest challenges and pain points and know how to overcome them. One of the biggest challenges, the biggest challenge that my ideal customers face is getting leads, getting qualified leads for their business. So we fix that. Okay. We funnel them into a free community. Oh, I want to learn more. And then you use free assets like uh, this free course that you're watching to help nurture people. Again, this is kind of like a meta. You're literally seeing this play out in reality right now. So the aims of this is to demonstrate that you're an authority, that you know what you're talking about. Demonstrate that you have success in both your business and your clients. Demonstrate that you have a robust and unique model mechanism and method and help educate members on the fundamentals. And I'm, hopefully you can agree that at the end of this course, that will be the case. Then we're getting into the DMs. So people are like, okay, They've watched your VSL, they've watched your video sales letter, maybe they've signed up for your newsletter and they're getting your weekly newsletter, seeing the case studies, seeing the success cases. Right, you have the solution I need. So we have now got a hot lead. You then convert them through DM appointment setting into an advisory strategy call. And this is where the good stuff happens. So benchmark numbers, we're trying to convert one out of 10 people onto a call. We're trying to offer at least 70% of people who jump on the call the offer, three out of 10 people just will not be the right fit. This is what we're trying to get to. It could take a couple of years for you to get to these benchmark numbers. So these could be a lot lower when you start off. Give them at least a, you have at least a 3K plus offer, high ticket, and you are getting started with at least 25% of people that you speak to on sales calls. So average conversion rate for sales calls in the high ticket space is between one and four to one and three. So 25% to 30% get paid in full. And you do this by creating a reciprocity bank with your long form content and targeting the right fit people, people who actually have money to pay you. So convert hot leads into new clients, have at least a 3K plus offer, find right fit clients for your program, make offers on 70% of your calls, take payment in full or give payment plan options, convert 25% of calls to new clients. The aim is a 70% plus profit margin. And most of you starting out when you to get to 20, 20K a month, it should be around 90% profit margin because it's mainly it's mainly you, maybe an appointment setter typically and or a video editor. So we're looking at 90% plus profit margin. And we're looking for at least a 4X ROAS. And this is very, very doable. This is a 4X four, four return on ad spend when you're running the, the funnel like, we're, well, like we do. And this is called client financed acquisition. What this means is that you pay to acquire the first client or you get them through a warm um, 
kind of warm outreach through your network. You get a client, they pay you 3K. You then take $1,000 and you put it into ads and then you get your next client. And therefore you never, ever, ever have to pay for the acquisition of a client. Client financed acquisition. That is the beauty of the high ticket is that you have margin to be able to do that. And then you scale ads to target daily spend. So let's say you want to spend, um, you want to make 20K a month and you know that it typically costs you $1,000 to uh, to bring in a new customer. Then you, and you know that it's a, you've got a 4X ROAS, then you know to get 20K, you need to put 5K in. And it's then 5K divided by 30 days is your target daily ad spend. And then that's how much you want to be spending on ads if per day, 166, okay, to make 20 grand. And then you reinvest that money into ads. New client, you go through onboarding, you give them access to all your resources, private community, and then your core students, client success pillars. So for us, it's content and ads, messaging and offer architecture, and then scalable world-class coaching, migrating from one-to-one -one coaching to group coaching. So one-on-one -on -one coaching, group, and then we deliver this with the four layers of accountability, one-on-one -on -one coaching, buddy coaching, peers, public. So one-on-one -on -one coaching with me, accountability buddy with other members of the community, accelerator pods with other members of the community, and community goal setting, so public. So that's the four layers of accountability, and that's how we deliver the service. And again, we have all these resources that we walked through earlier. Then we create sales assets, video sales letters, testimonials, interviews, case studies, and we post them all the way back up here. And we go again. And I think that is it. So I've taken you right through from monkey to AI stage, and you should know the microeducation business model game plan as I see it. And what I call this, I call this the attraction and authority flywheel. And this is our kind of like, this is how we get business. Sweet. I think that's it. Ciao. See you in the next one. Wait. The next one will be, I think the fundamental, no. Finding your purpose, maybe. Let's find out. Your current reality is a accumulation of all your previous experiences, your upbringing, your education, your network, your skills, your knowledge, your behaviors, and your habits. Your future reality is a merely accumulation of new experiences, new education, new skills, new knowledge, new network, new behaviors, you guessed it, new habits. In this module, I'm going to be walking you through the philosophy and methods that I've used to do deep self-discovery. This is a process that you'll need to revisit multiple times in your journey as you level up. It's the prep work that you need to do in the cycle of self-mastery and self-actualization. The better you know yourself, the better you can craft your dream future, and importantly, the new identity you will need to make that dream future a reality. Let's dive in. Okay, so this is the next module, which is understanding yourself. And this training is the importance of understanding yourself and the journey of self-discovery. This is me. Your current reality is accumulation of all of your previous experiences, your upbringing, your education, your network, your skills, your knowledge, your behaviors, and your habits. Your future reality is merely accumulation of new experiences, education, skills, knowledge, network, behaviors, and habits. I said it. In case this ever gets out there and quoted, it's me who came up with it first. You may be familiar with this scene from The Matrix, where Neo is trying to find the Oracle and have a chat with the Oracle. And he encounters this young child who says, try to bend the spoon. And the kid says, do not try and bend the spoon. That's impossible. Instead, only try to realize the truth. 
there is no spoon. Then you'll see that it is not the spoon that bends, it is only yourself. And that is the key philosophy of this understanding yourself module. You are able to bend your reality to whatever you want it to be. So the matrix <laughs> So the matrix is all about Neo's arc of self-discovery as he ultimately fulfills his destiny and becomes the one and stops bullets. And there's one of the famous scenes as he gets plugged in for the first time or uh, and he's like, he gets told he's going to learn jujitsu. And he's like, I'm going to learn jujitsu. <laughs> and he learns jujitsu in a matter of seven seconds. Now, some of you may be familiar with the phrase self-actualization. This is the realization or fulfillment of one's talents and potential potentialities, especially considered as a drive or need present in everyone. Everyone has an inner need to get better and fulfill their talents and fulfill their potential. That is why it's one of my core missions at Creator Launch is to help people fulfill their potential. And that is why this stuff is a critical component of the brand. Because I know for you to build a business, you need to become a better human. Self-discovery and understanding oneself is the precursor to self-actualization and mastering oneself. And it works as a cycle. You understand who you are and what you are. You get better. And you once again, understand who you are and discover who you are at that next level. So it is a cycle. Now, this is why it's important. So your understanding yourself matters because there's purpose, authenticity, resilience, and fulfillment. So understanding your values, passions, and strengths, it helps you align your business goals with your personal aspirations. I can tell you from firsthand that now I have complete clarity and alignment between my mission and purpose and my business. It makes getting up at 5 a.m. Like I am I literally wake myself up at like 4.30 because I'm so excited to get to work. It's a game changer. Authenticity. Being true to yourself fosters genuine connections with your audience and customers. So you need to understand your authentic self to be able to get it out there and put it out into the world. Resilience, knowing your weaknesses and areas for improvement enables you to develop resilience and adaptability in the face of inevitable challenges. You are going to get thrown so much shit in entrepreneurship and understanding that you are capable and a resilient human is going to help and give you fortitude in the inevitable experience of being kicked in the face, metaphorically, hopefully not literally. And understanding yourself matters because of fulfillment. Building a business that truly reflects your authentic self leads to a more fulfilling and sustainable entrepreneurial journey. And as someone who has tried, I think I'm on def my fourth business, and this is the first one that I've had full true alignment. And yeah, I can just completely agree to that. It is a game changer, but it takes fucking around and finding out to get to that level. So if you don't have that now, it's fine. But you need to go through the process of figuring this out. This is what makes your brand. Purpose, authenticity, resilience, fulfillment. This is what Braille pulls together and builds your brand. So what is the process of self-discovery? So it's made up of three different areas. So reflection, so journaling, meditation, or mindfulness exercises to promote self-awareness. Feedback, actively seeking feedback from mentors, peers, and customers to gain insights on your strengths and growth in areas for growth. Assessments, utilize tools like personality tests, strength finders, or emotional intelligence tests to gain deeper insights into your personality and preferences. That is what we're going to take you, that's what I'm going to take you through. So integrating self-discovery into your business. Brand identity decision-making and team building. 
So brand identity, develop a brand identity that is authentically reflects your values, personality, and unique selling proposition. Decision-making, use self-awareness to make informed decisions that align with your long-term vision and values. Team building, build a team that complements your strengths and fills in your blind spots, fostering a culture of authenticity and collaboration. It is critical that you understand yourself so that you are able to craft and design your business so that it flourishes. This is what I've built into Creator OS. I have built these self-discovery exercises into it. And this is how I've kind of sectioned them out. So there's the data gathering phase. So the self-discovery data gathering phase. So this is made up of finding your purpose through going and looking at your, finding your Ikigai, doing a genius test, purpose test, looking at your past behaviors, taking a personality test, doing the eight questions exercise. And then there's the data cleaning side, which is taking that data and then actually making it into something that you can help build your business and life. So this is made up of the mission, vision, and values and the idea generator. Cool. And let's dive into those. Okay. Finding your purpose. This is part of the understanding yourself module. And this is about the Ikigai and purpose tests, finding your purpose. So Ikigai might be something you're familiar with or not. If you aren't, Ikigai is based on the Japanese concept of basically reason for being. So Iki, Iki stands for life and Gai is reason. And it's referring to something that gives a person a sense of purpose and a reason for living. And it is really, now this is an interesting kind of topic because there are some people that say this isn't the reality of what Ikigai means. But let me take take you through the kind of like the, the modern version of Ikigai. And that's really made up of four different areas. So what you love, what the world needs, what you can be paid for, what you're good at. So what you love, what you, what you love, what the world needs, what you can be paid for, what you're good at. And this results in your mission, your vocation, your profession, and your passion. This is when that Venn diagram first came about. It was in 2011. And from a Spanish author who made this Venn diagram of the, uh, the idea of Ikigai. But there's a bit of a slight misconception about this. People like to get stuck up on it. I think it doesn't really fucking matter, to be honest. But the popular Ikigai Venn diagram promises a formula. Find the overlap between what you love, what you're good at, and what the world needs, and what you can get paid for. But this myth misses the mark on the original Japanese concept. Rather than a destination, Ikigai is a journey. It's about starting small, releasing yourself, seeking harmony, appreciating little joys, and being present. So Ikigai isn't a destination, it is a journey. And the idea is that Ikigai is, you know, you take all of these things, you list them out, and then your Ikigai is found right in the middle. When, in fact, the better way to look at it is your Ikigai is everything that is within these four circles. It's everything. Your Ikigai is everything. And it is a journey. Okay. This is uncovering your superpowers. And this is part of the understanding yourself module. Uncovering your superpowers. To become your best you, you must know you. Points for if you know who the hell these two are. <laughs> I'll give you a hint. It is a mother and daughter. And I'm sure maybe there's some of you who do know who these, these two are. Who are they? They are Isabel Briggs Myers and her mother, Catherine Briggs. And those names and what well, those names might sound familiar because they were the inventors of the Myers Briggs type indicator. And this is a personality test. <laughs> so the Myers-Briggs type indicator is the most common way to test personalities. And the basis of it are these four dichotomies, these kinds of like, uh, kind of like clashing, uh, clashing ideas of uh, identity types. And so we have extroversion versus introversion, someone who is extroverted versus someone who is introverted, someone who is loud and outgoing versus someone who's shy. 
We then have sensing versus intuition. So people who have high, like highly sensitive or people who go with kind of like instinct and intuition. We then have people who are thinking more logical, more um, kind of more calculated. And then we have people who are feeling, people who are more emotive, who can lead with emotion and make decisions based on emotion. We then have judging, J. So judging versus perceiving. So judging from uh, kind of like looking at a circumstance and judging it versus perceiving, which is putting yourself into the into that perspective and then perceiving that perspective. How the hell does the MTBI, MBTI impact you and your business? In a load of ways. So it really helps across five, it, it kind of, it helps you across five different areas. So we have decision-making, communication, leadership, team dynamics, and customers. Knowing your personality will give you the firepower to be able to make sure that you are talking to your teammates in the right way, communicating correctly in your marketing strategy and content, helping others around you and your team excel in their jobs, and most importantly, being able to speak to your customers. Like You need to be able to speak to your customers, and if they have a different personality type than you, then you need to know that. You need to be able to communicate in different ways. So decision making. So decision making, thinking types, they might prioritize logic and objective criteria in decision making, focusing more on facts and data. Feeling types may consider the impact on decision of decisions on people and relationships, prioritizing harmony and empathy. Sensing types may prefer concrete details and practical considerations, and then intuition types may focus on future possibilities and innovative solutions. Communication. Extroverts may prefer face-to-face -face commu interactions and group discussions. Introverts may prefer written communications or one-on-one -on -one conversations. Sensing types may appreciate specific details and practical examples. Intuition types may prefer big picture concepts and brainstorming sessions. So you can see how, like, depending on who you're speaking to, your communication style needs to be different. And this is exactly why, if you look at my... Uh, everything that I'm doing here on, in the Creator Accelerator and in Creator Launch University, I'm using a broad range of communication styles and methodologies and tools and tactics. I have playbooks, written stuff so that people who are better, learn better at reading read through stuff. I have presentations. So if people who learn better through like just watching it, looking at a presentation can go have access to those presentations and use those. And then there's videos. I'm a I'm someone who is an audio visual learner, so I communicate best through video and audio learning. Thought about everything here. So I've used, I'm using a broad range so that I can fulfill communication styles depending on however my customers best learn. Leadership. Judging types may excel in planning, organization, and decision making, providing structure and direction to a team. Perceiving types may thrive in dynamic and flexible environments, encouraging creativity and adaptability. Extroverted leaders may energize and inspire their teams through enthusiastic communication and collaboration. Introverted leaders may lead by example and provide thoughtful guidance. So again, understanding who you are as a leader, you know, what is your what is your type? That is going to determine how you how you communicate strategy, ideas, planning like how you energize and inspire your teams, that's going to impact that. Team dynamics, really important. Balanced teams with a mixture of extroverts and introverts can benefit from both external enthusiasm and internal reflection. Teams with diverse sensing and intuition preferences can generate a wide range of ideas and approaches leading to innovative solutions. Combining thinking and feeling types can ensure that decisions are both logical and considerate of human Im impact. What that means is that you need diversity. You need diversity across your team in the way they are set up through their personalities, through their preferences, through the way they communicate, and through the way they, they learn. So think about that when building your team. You do not want a team where everyone is just the same. Customers providing detailed information and practical solutions may appeal may appeal to sensing customers, while providing innovative ideas and future future oriented solutions may resonate with intuition customers. That's really important. Let me go through that again. Providing detailed information and practical solutions may appeal to sensing customers, 
while offering innovative ideas and future-orientated solutions may resonate with intuition customers. So you can see how this could really impact on marketing and messaging. You know, these are two very different people and they're looking for two different things. Sensing people are looking for detail and information and their practical solutions. They just want to know how to do it. While intuition customers, they're looking for innovative stuff, stuff that feels cool and cutting edge. So think about that. Emphasizing the social aspects of your product or service may appeal may appeal to feeling customers, while highlighting the technical specifications and features may attract thinking customers. This is really fucking important. This is really, really important because people, people make decisions based on logic, but they buy with emotion. People make decisions based on logic, but they buy with emotion. And this is really important when you go through the sales process is that you understand that people will make a buying decision based on their emotion and their emotion, emotional feelings towards what you are providing them and the solutions that you provide. So think about that again with your marketing messaging, with your sales copy, with everything. Emphasizing the social aspects of your product or service may appeal to feeling customers. Highlighting the technical specifications or features may attract to thinking customers. So if you're working in a B2B setting and you're maybe working where you have potential multiple layers of decision making with an organization. So you've got the some, someone who is the ultimate decision maker, who is the person that signs, puts the signature on the contract. And then you have the person who is the uh, essentially the champion of the deal, who is the, the person who pushes the deal through at the lower level. So this could be your main point, your key point of contact. So for example, if you're selling lead generation to an enterprise business, then they're going to have director of marketing, they're going to, well, they're going to have CMO, director of marketing, they're going to have head of marketing, they're going to have marketing manager, and it might be the marketing manager that you're talking to about your new solution and, or your, um, or your consultancy. And your job is to understand that those different layers, those levels may look at things differently. So they may be the people down at the bottom you know, they might be looking at the technical specifications, but the people at the top might be looking at the impact of your solutions. So the director of marketing, the CMO, the chief marketing officer might be thinking, if we if we increase our email marketing conversion rates by 5%, we're going to be able to sell to this many more customers. We're going to make this much bigger of an impact. And the marketing manager is thinking, well, we just need to be able to convert, you know, have 3% more per email campaign. They're thinking about the technical specifications. They're looking at uh, what if we could just reduce bounce rate by 5%. So we actually get, what if we could increase open open rate by another 5%. So they're looking at the technical specifications. So especially in a B2B setting, you need to be thinking, who am I speaking to and who is the decision maker? And you need to target your messaging for those people. Really key. So that's this is why this shit is really, really, really key. Genius test. You are a genius, uncovering your entrepreneurial superpowers. This is one of the mandatory reading books within the Mastermind Group. I launched Mastermind Group. This is The Millionaire Master Plan by Roger Hamilton. And in it, he this is a kind of modified look at the MBTI, kind of simplified approach of looking at it. And really, this is understanding that you as an entrepreneur have specific superpowers that makes means you work in a certain way and you work well with other people in a certain way. So let's give you some examples. So we have four main types. We have the, the tempo type, who are people who serve. We have the steel type. I'm a steel uh, genius type who like the details. We have blaze type who like to connect. And then we have the dynamo type who like to create. These are the, you'll see who these people are. So the tempo types, these are the people who are there to serve. So we have the Warren Buffetts, relationship focused, empathetic, and excel at team building and communication. Nelson Mandela and Mahatma Gandhi, the tempos, the servers. The steels, who love detail, methodical and structured. Henry Ford, the Zug, and Tim Cook. So renowned for their detail and their attention to detail. Blazers, who love to connect action orientated and thrive on risk taking and experimentation. Oprah, Bill Clinton, and I can't remember what her name is, but she got cancelled, I think, last year. And then we have Dynamos. 
these are the these are the classic entrepreneurs. These are the ones that everyone thinks about when they think of entrepreneurship. They think of the Bransons, they think of the Musks, and they think of the Jobs, the Dynamos. And especially with this type, there is typically a very close link between this type and people who have ADHD. So very common for this type of uh, genius to have ADHD. So that is your superpower. Now, the ultimate sin of business partnerships. You need to partner with people who share the same values as you, but have complementary, different superpowers. Let me say that again. You need to partner with people who share the same values as you. So they have the same beliefs, values about how the world operates, but have complementary, different superpowers, different skills, knowledge, interests, areas of expertise and proclivities. How do I know this? Because I fucked up on this in the past. So, like I said in my first video, Claudia and I shared same similar interests, similar skills, and we made horrible business partners. So, lesson learned, that's your warning. Okay, this is your action. And we're going to do the 16 personalities test and the genius test in Creator OS. Okay, see you in the next one. Okay, this is understanding yourself. And this is understanding your past behaviors to help you uncover your niche. The secret. There is a secret to finding your destiny. There is a secret to unlocking limitless motivation, desire, and willpower. There is a secret to uncovering the impact you are destined to make. There is a secret to finding your niche. Your destiny and the impact of your life is hidden amongst your behaviors. The good news is it's never been easier to uncover the facts of your behavior. Your behaviors are all deeply understood by a few key organizations. What are these organizations? Number one, YouTube, your search history. Your search history shows what you're interested in. You just need to go to it and you need to see what you've searched for and what you've watched in the past few months. And that will tell you everything you need to know about what you like. Business, house music, golf. <laughs> Within four videos on YouTube, YouTube is able to tell me my top three favorite things. Business, house music, golf. <laughs> it is that fucking simple. And yes, I'm intending to build a personal brand based on business. Yes, I intend to learn how to make house music at some point. And yes, I intend to morph my brand into golf as I grow my brand. So YouTube knows. So go check it out. Number two, your favorite films, Netflix. Netflix knows exactly what you like. Now, here's a very interesting, interesting thing about your favorite films. And this is a spoiler alert. This may ruin your favorite films for you. But do you know why your favorite films are your favorite films? Or well, your favorite films, and again, spoiler alert, your favorite films are your favorite films because you relate to the main character. Okay. Think about your favorite films and there is something within that main character that you relate to. You relate to their story, their personality, their struggles, their challenges, the way they act, the way they communicate. There is something there. And I, th I was planning on sharing my like top five favorite films, but then I was like, I don't think that's currently out there in the in the world. And I do think with AI and everything, 
being able to genuinely hold on to some things that only you know is actually going to be really important. So think about that. So I'm not going to share my favorite films, but thinking about them, it makes total sense. So what are your favorite films? Do you relate to them? Spoiler alert. Your favorite films, your favorite because you identify with the main character. Number three, your favorite books. What are your favorite books? Go look on Audible. Go check out what you listen to. What do you read on Kindle? Like, what are your favorite books? This will give you a real insight into what do you like? What do you enjoy? Now, for a lot of you, some of you, your Instagram explore page might just be pictures and images of super hot women. (laughs) And before I curated mine by getting rid of all that shit, mine was probably similar. So the question is, is what is your explore page filled with? Your bank accounts. This is a screenshot of my bank account. It's not, but anyway, (laughs) this is John Jones, whoever the fuck that is. Uh, But luckily this is 20 years ago, so we're all good. So what are your spending behaviors outside of groceries, outside of um, general day-to-day expenditure, bills? Where do you spend your money? Like, what do you spend your money on? Go through your bank statement Go through the last like three months of your bank statement and go just pick out and just see where does where does your money outside of bills, rent and day-to-day expenses, where does it go? Where do you push your money to? You know, for me, I look at mine as playing golf, going on vacation. House music events. <laughs> there you go. So... Your behaviors are known very well by five platforms, YouTube, Netflix, Audible, Instagram, and your bank. And you have access to all that data. So go take a look, see what these people, are, these businesses are scraping information on, on about you. This is what makes up your niche. So next up, you're gonna to go to the Creator OS Notion dashboard and you're gonna to go to the self-discovery exercises playbook and you are going to take the past behaviors, go through the past behaviors worksheet, okay? And we will see you in the next one. Okay, this is the eight questions exercise, part of the understanding yourself module. And this is helping you to formalize your niche. So as again, just a reminder, to become your best you, you must know you. So this is a series of questions that you are going to answer and ask yourself, and this is going to help you formulate formalize your niche. So let's make this small. Number one, passion and enjoyment. If you could spend your days doing one thing, what would it be? Your passion is often the heart of your niche. Consider activities that bring you the most joy and fulfillment. What truly makes your heart race and your spirit soar? Identifying your passion is the foundation of discovering a niche that doesn't feel like work. And I can tell you that once I understood that business was passion of mine i can absolutely assure you this is just play to me this is just play number two past experience what have you done in the past that you could leverage in your niche consider your past career areas and interests reflect on your previous roles hobbies or areas of expertise these experiences are valuable assets in shaping your niche as they represent skills and knowledge that you've already acquired Number three, obstacles. Reflect on the obstacles that you've successfully overcome. How did you conquer conquer them? What did you learn in the process? These experiences can be valuable assets in your niche. Think about the challenges and hurdles you've faced in your personal or professional life. Your ability to triumph over adversity can be a powerful component of your niche. Past experience, I've got that twice. So I fucked up here somewhere. Must be life experience. What about your life experiences? Which ones could benefit others and how? These will become the stories that we weave into your contents to help people relate to you. A key to getting them to trust and like you, which ultimately determines if they will pay you. 
Consider the significant events and lessons you've encountered throughout your life journey. How can these experiences offer value to others facing similar situations or seeking guidance? Target audience, who specifically could benefit from what you have to offer? Define your ideal client or audience. Delve deep into the characteristics, needs, and pain points of your target audience. Identify your, identifying your ideal clients is a critical step in tailoring your niche to serve a specific group effectively. You need to know who you are going to target. This is really key, and there is a sheet that we have to help you do this. Your unique story. What makes you different from everyone else? Your unique story is a powerful element in carving out your niche. Note when I first started this course, I went into quite a lot of detail about my story. That was intentional to get you to understand me, to know me, to understand where my frame of reference is coming from. Why? So it's ultimately so that you can trust what I say. You're like, this guy has this background, he has this story, he's seen these things, I can trust what he is saying. Your background and your values and your experiences are what set you apart. Your personal narrative is what makes your niche distinctive and relatable to your audience. Your unique story. Seven, client benefits. What is the biggest benefit clients could gain from working with you? Highlight this to attract your ideal audience. Identifying the most significant transformation your clients can achieve by collaborating with you. Communicating these benefits clearly is essential for attracting the right clients to your niche. Ideal clients. Imagine your perfect life right now. What kind of clients would you want to work with? This vision can guide you on your niche selection and visit your ideal working scenario. Consider the clients or projects that would bring you the most satisfaction and align with your long-term goals. Identifying the ideal clients can help you shape your niche around your desired outcomes. Now you're going to go do this. So this is again in the self-discovery exercises playbook within the Creator OS. It is the eight questions exercise. Go and fill this in and spend time filling this in. See you in the next one. Okay, so we are in the Creator OS. So uh, this is where you will find all of the exercises. So these are all of the discovery exercises, self-discovery exercises and leveling up and design, dream life design exercises are all in here. So let's, um, let's go through the mission, vision and values, which is in this section here. So the first section is here. So look, first up, note your future is dedicated or dictated, let's hide this, by your vision of a dream future that you reach by your journey of your mission, which is guided by your values. So we need to find out what that all is for us. So the finding there's a, um, a, a video that I would recommend watching here by Andrew Huberman and Robert Green, which is about practical advice on finding your purpose. So I recommend watching that. Now let's dive into the actual worksheet. Cool. So most people float through life with this underlying feeling of angst that they are not, have not and will not contribute to the greater good of humankind. Life is servitude. Life is helping your fellow human. Life is using your unique set of experiences, skills, and interests to improve the lives of your global neighbors. Life is about finding meaning, about uncovering our purpose and the pursuit of what we personally find meaningful. Finding your meaning is a journey you must embark upon to make the impact you deeply long for, in order to make the impact you wish to make, you must move forward with purpose. How do you find purpose? You must highlight your mission. Your mission is your unique view on solving a problem that you see in the world. Your mission can and will evolve over time as you evolve as a human, but you must start with a mission. Your mission answers the question, why does my company exist other than for the purpose of making money? Because making money is the result, but it is not the outcome that we are aiming for. There are three steps to defining your mission. Step number one, highlight and define a problem in the world that you see or have experienced. Step number two, create a vision of a world in the future where you have solved that problem. Number three, is your, your mission is your journey to solve that problem. So 
let's define the problem. So what is the problem? This is the problem or set of problems you and your business will solve. So go through these exercises. Question number one, what problems have you seen or experienced in the world that compels you, that drives you, that inspires you? Why are these problems meaningful to you? You have to answer this question, like, why do you care? You have to think about this. Number three, why is it important to solve these problems for people? What are the outcomes for solving these problems for people? What happens when you solve these? Who are the group of people that experience these problems? What unites this group of people? What characteristics or demographics do these people share? Now, just to give you my example, so I have chosen to help the group of people of one person business owners, people who are like me want to escape the nine to five, build their own business and build ultimate freedom, but make an impact with the work that they do. And there are loads of problems with this, like everyone's stuck in a nine to five. Everyone is stuck in the traditional way of looking at the world. And I know that people feel about this the way I do. And so that's why these are meaningful to me. Why is it important to solve these problems for people? Because I feel like everyone deserves to feel like they're making an impact and ultimately to build a life of purpose. So that's my kind of problems. Then it's creating a vision for your future. And this is very personal and dependent on what you love, where you want to go in life. So you have to ask this. Your vision is a view into the future of where you want to go. This is your guiding light. Okay. You have to ask, what does your ideal future look like in a world where you've solved these problems? So for me, it is living in a world where people have autonomy over what they do, are doing work that they love, are solving hard problems and challenges, breaking free from the shackles of a nine to five, and ultimately making an impact with the work that they do. How do people feel after having these problems solved? You know, what is the result of breaking free from the nine to five? You know, for me, it's, it's pretty simple. Like I get to live a day. My days are filled doing what I want. You know, back when I was working in a job, one of the biggest things I fucking hated was the fact that I always felt like I wanted to break up my day. So I would spend an hour and a half commuting to the office in the mornings. And I would always feel like by the lunchtime, I was kind of running out of energy, you know, sat at a desk. I was just like, fuck. And I was like, I knew that if I could go to the gym, I would get a load of energy back. And in the afternoon, it would mean I could perform a shit ton better. And so one of the problems was that we only had an hour lunch break and an hour lunch break wasn't enough time to walk to the gym, to get a decent workout in, to shower, change and get back to the office. Like I could do that. And I did occasionally do that. I tried to push the limits on what was, what was allowed by, it would take an hour and a half. And for most people in an office, after coming back for an hour and a half later, after leaving people, you know, you could tell people were just thinking, why is this guy, he's taking the piss. And I hated that. I hated that. So that's one feeling that I have solved. <laughs> like I just got back to the gym from the gym an hour ago and I spent an hour and a half like that. It took me two hours to go to walk to the gym, to have, get a great workout in a proper full workout, go to the, go in the sauna, do some meditation and then come back. Like, and have time to warm up, cool down, do everything I want to do. And then I will come back and here I am. I have loads of fucking energy. So I've solved my problems. So I feel amazing. <laughs> so this is how I feel. So you need to state the stuff like, and there are loads of other reasons, like micro things. So this is where you get to brainstorm these ideas. State your mission. So this is how you will solve the problems and move the world towards your vision of a better future. So what do you need to build to annihilate the problem or set of problems? For me, it's building this business. So think about this. Then you need to commit your values. So why are personal values important? So this really is all about decision making and being able to set a flag in the ground and say, this is what I believe in. These are my values. And you, this by having values, it will attract like-minded people to you. And this is how you build your tribe. Values are a part of us. 
They highlight what we stand for. They can represent our ideals and unique individual essence. Values guide our behavior, providing us with a personal code of conduct, 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 personal code of conduct. And this is what makes decision making super easy. When you have a, uh, a set of personal rules, laws, and this code of conduct, when you are faced with a decision, it's very easy to say yes or no, based on does it align with your values? When we honor our personal core values consistency, consistently, we experience fulfillment. When we don't, we are more likely to escape into bad habits and regressive patterns of behavior. If you do not consciously define your own personal values, you will default to the values of the collective. And in the modern world, these are guided by the media. Your personal values will shape the decision-making of you and your business. And I've helped you out here. Here are a list of 100 personal values. Take your pick. So from the list above, what are the values that you feel most connected to? So take a look through here and see, like just select the words which really resonate with you. What values are essential to your life? What values represent your primary way of being? What values are essential to supporting your inner self? List them here. And it doesn't have to, it can be more than five, like just write them all down. Next, we are going to craft value statements for each value. So highlighting values in memorable phases or sentences helps you articulate the meaning behind each value. It gives you the opportunity to make the value more emotional and memorable. And the reason, the reason for this is that as we grow our business and you know, your, your values are going to be your guiding principles for your business. And when you hire people, it is really important that you hire people and that they can see and read your values so that when they make decisions, they are based around alignment with your values for the business. So it's really important you have these. And it's a reason why all big corporations have them too. And as much as we hate the corporate world, there are corporate, there are principles which we must build in our business because it is business runs off principles and you have to see yourself as a business. If you don't take this seriously, don't expect to win in business. Simple. So use inspiring words. Our brains are quick to delete or ignore the mundane and com commonplace. Look for words that evoke and trigger emotional responses. They will be more meaningful and memorable. Play to your strengths in crafting your values. Make your value statements rich and meaningful so they inspire you to uphold them. You could use other words from groupings you made in step three in your description. For example, let's say you've identified a personal value of health to represent other values like energy and vitality. Your value statement might be health to live a full vitality, live with full vitality and energy every day. And you're going to write these things down. Okay, so we're going to get these all down. And then eventually you will add them into yours. So here's mine. So my mission, vision and values are here. So my values are all written down here. Cool. So that is it for this lesson and we'll dive into the next one. Okay, so this one is the eight questions exercise. So again, in here, so we are in Creator OS, so let's open this up. And this is going to be the idea generation worksheet. So it is located down here, idea generation worksheet. You can access it in the left-hand list as well. So let's go into here. So this is where all of the self-discovery exercises are located. You can do them in here. They are also located um, so idea generation is in here. So let's go here. So this is where you are going to synthesize some of your self-discovery um, from some of the things that you've been through. So all of these self-discovery exercises, and we are going to synthesize this into some business ideas. So don't overcomplicate this. You are not stuck with an idea. Entrepreneurship is a constant evolution of what you do and how you serve others. For now, we are just brainstorming ideas that we will refine, test and evolve later on. Keep an open mind and enjoy the process. And yeah, just remember, you're not entrepreneurship is a constant evolution. So first up, I want you to watch this. So this is an amazing interview with Daniel Priestley from Ali Abdel. And Daniel Priestley was the 
coach, the business coach for my first ever coach, like about seven years ago, when I did my career transition from dentistry, I worked with a coach and he was one of Daniel Priestley's first, first ever coaching students. So Daniel Priestley has written a book called Key Person of Influence, which uh, again is one of the books that I recommend reading. A uh, bit of a, a very easy read, but a game plan to of really what we're trying to do here, which is become a value creator. And uh, yeah, this is a, a, an incredible watch and this will give you the game plan to, to get started. So you are going to list a bunch of at least 10 ideas for consulting, coaching, or freelance services based on your Ikigai results from exercise one. So coaching, consulting, freelance services, all we are doing is helping someone. Remember, we're talking about that bridging the gap. The bridge is from point A to point B in one or more of the three eternal markets. So this is what we call the transformation. Now, if you're not familiar with the three eternal markets, this is really ultimately what every business is trying is is a part of it solves a problem within one of these markets. So within health, wealth, or relationships. So point A, we need to define point A, where they are currently at. So financial, 10K a month, 2K a month, 100K a month, 10 pounds overweight, 20 pounds overweight, 100 pounds overweight, three out of 10 on the happiness fulfillment scale. So that can be a useful mechanism to understand where people are at. And then point B, what is their dream future situation? You know, and really this is, their dream future situation has to be what is reasonable for you to help them where, like get to when you work with them. So, you know, it could be in three months, a year, like where you, when you work with someone, what is the transformation endpoint to get them from 10K to 100K per month? Lost 20 pounds, feeling confident, eight out of 10 on the happiness or fulfillment scale. So these are what I call quantifiable outcomes. So this is a really key idea that I talk about in my in the mastermind program, which is this idea that point B needs to have a quantifiable outcome. So we need to be able to say, this is where you're at and this is where you are now. So we are going to list out some ideas for how you can help people. First, let's throw some ideas at the starting point. Where's the starting point? So list out some ideas based on your Ikigai, based on the self-discovery that you've done, your skills, your interests, and your, uh, the, like, uh, your passions, and list out some potential point A's based on the three eternal markets. And then you're going to list out some point B's. Now, let's list out a bunch of ideas about ways we can help people or businesses based on those point A's and point B's. For example, I help men in their thirties take control of their bodies by getting them to lose 10 pounds within 12 weeks. I help professional women feel more empowered within their workplace so they can get more, get the promotions they deserve. I help existing coaches and consultants scale past 30 K per month within 90 days. Right. So lists a load of ideas. There is no such thing as a bad idea. Get creative. More ideas, keep going. You'll then add them into the table below and you're going to score each one based on these three questions. So com complete the table below with your gut feeling scores. Just don't overcomplicate this. Just take a gut feeling, be like, okay, it's just a gut feeling. So question one, how much do I love this idea on a scale of one to 10? How likely can I get good results for clients on a scale of one to 10? Are people able to pay me at least 3K to achieve that result on a scale of one to 10? So you're going to list your ideas in here in this column. So in this column, you're going to list your ideas and you're going to score them in each of these. Okay. And then you're going to add them up. You're going to add up the scores in these three rows, columns, and then add the total here. And then you'll be able to rank them. You'll be able to move them around. So move them up and down and rank them. So what are the top ideas based on the total score? See where I'm going with this? And then you're going to list your top five scoring ideas. Okay. How simple is that? So this is for people who are stuck wondering what the fuck they're going to do. This is to give you some real kind of like actionable, practical guidance on how you can start to formulate some of your ideas, how you can take your skills and your interests and start pushing them towards a business. Okay. And this is how you're going to score those ideas. I think it's pretty sick. So make sure to watch this. It'll give you a bit of a background into this process and 
I will see you in the next one. Okay, so now that you've completed the deep self-discovery work, it's time to understand the fundamentals of what it means to level up. In this module, I'm gonna be walking you through my philosophies for obtaining success and self-actualization, which is the journey of self-mastery and ultimately fulfilling your full potential. So you'll learn about the fundamentals of success and self-mastery, as well as the inevitable challenges that you're gonna face on this journey and how to overcome them. So let's dive in. Right champs, we are on to the next module. This is the leveling up module. This is where we really talk about the fundamentals of what it takes to level up. So before we go into dream life design, we're gonna talk about really what are the fundamentals of this process. And this uh, this training is around the fundamentals of success. The world will ask you who you want to be. And if you don't know, the world will tell you. This is by Carl Jung, famous, uh, I think he's a psychologist or psychiatrist, I can't remember, um, and also philosopher. And so really this, what this means is that if you float through life, with no direction or purpose, you will just get molded to whatever the world wants you to be. And this is this is our default. So this is our default is that we let the world tell us what we're gonna be. And you know, this this happened to me. This is why I end up going down the route of being a dentist, was because I was young, I was fifteen when I had to make the choice of what do I want to do for the rest of my life. And imagine having to make such a a huge decision at the age of 15 when you have no context no experience no understanding of the world and you're just you're made to decide and after a long period of kind of reflection i said no i said no i'm not going to let the world tell me what i want to do I'm going to carve my own path. And so this is the philosophy of leveling up. Before you could walk, you couldn't. Before you could talk, you couldn't. Before you could read, you couldn't. Before you could write, you couldn't. Before you had a successful business, you didn't. Success, the accomplishment of an aim or purpose. If it is freedom that you're after, then you need to find the M word first. Meaning. Meaning is the M word. How do you find meaning? Well, I can tell you what meaning means to me. Meaning, in my opinion, and this is my perspective of meaning, is that meaning is serving and helping others. I truly believe that if you go through life with this mindset and perspective, you will get everything that you could ever dream, dream about. So my simple thesis for gaining financial freedom is this mindset perspective is what I believe is the secret to building the life of your dreams. So this is it. Starts by asking yourself one question. Okay, this is really important. How do I 10X my fellow humans wealth, health or happiness? So thinking back to the mission, vision and values. So the three eternal markets of wealth, health and, and relationships. How do I 10X my fellow humans, wealth, health, or happiness. So reminder, the three eternal markets, wealth, health, and relationships. They are linked to our core desires, wealth, financial freedom, health, being healthy, relationships, happiness. Okay, that's what those, that, that's the linking. So how can I 10X another human's wealth? How can I 10X another human's health? How can I 10X another human's happiness. We need to ask ourselves these questions. 
Doesn't matter if you're selling B2C or B2B. This is really important to understand this. Ultimately, what matters is that you are helping someone accelerate towards their core desires. Now in a B2C setting and a B2B setting, they're slightly different, but in a B2B setting, you are still, it's really important that there is an underlying desire of that person who is the decision maker and you have to fulfill those core desires. And that is what allows, that's what gets people to buy. The key is that you understand these are all linked as well. Okay. These aren't just all siloed. If you can kind of understand that wealth opens doors, it gives you the option to say no to stuff, which ultimately allows you to do the things that bring you more joy, which makes you happier, which allows you to be more confident, have more fun, be happy, meet the people and build the life that you want with the relationships that you love. Okay. You see how those are all linked. So this is a kind of cascade effect. So improved health leads to improved focus, which leads to improved performance, which leads to improved decision-making, which leads to improved confidence, which leads to higher risk tolerance, which leads to improved wealth. So that is how health and wealth are linked. Happiness, you improve happiness, you improve confidence, you improve networking abilities because you're more confident. You're going to speak to people with more confidence. You're going to be able to get, uh, you're going to be able to build relationships easier and better. That re results in more opportunities and that results in more improved wealth. So that's how happiness and wealth are linked. Can you see that? So this is a cascade effect. So this is why if you help someone get kind of their core desires, like 10x one of their core desires, they are linked to all of their other parts of their job. Uh, parts of their life. And this is something that I go on to help people, uh, help my students with in the sales process and sales mastery. In our sales mastery module, being able to link one of the other kind of core desires to the main one, which you help with is really critical in helping with the buying process and getting people to understand, yes, I need this because it's going to, it's good. Becoming wealthy is going to help increase my happiness increase my social status, bingo. Hopefully that makes sense. So you need to be the vehicle that allows someone to speed up their journey in the cascade cycle. Lead generation. Weak is I help you get more leads for your business. Okay is I help you get more perfect fit leads for your business. Best. I help you get more perfect fit leads for your business and give you the systems to close them into new clients so that you can finally get financial freedom and spend time with your family doing the things you love. Okay. That's the ultimate goal here. It's not just about getting leads for your business. What are the cascading effects of getting more leads for someone's business? And if you're not able to articulate those, you're never going to sell anything. So you need to be able to position yourself to understand in the cascade cycle so that you are solving not only this top, this upstream effect, but solving this upstream problem has downstream like problem solving as well, which leads them to their desired future. Weight loss. I help you lose weight. Now that's a weak offer. Okay. Is I help you lose 20 pounds so you can fit into your favorite jeans again. It's a little bit better, but best I help you lose 20 pounds in 90 days. So you'll be able to fit into your favorite jeans again, increase your confidence, turbocharge your focus, productivity, and performance so that you can work fewer hours to have more time to play with your kids and hang out with your friends doing the things you love. So can you see how there, again, it's the cascade effect. And this is why if you are in the weight loss niche, you need to be able to articulate these things because that is the ultimate goal. You need to understand what is the ultimate goal of my target, my target customer. Employee happiness. Week, I help you improve employee happiness. Better, I help you improve employee happiness so you can reduce churn. Churn is uh, loss of um, employees. So employees leaving the company. Best, I help you improve employee happiness so that you can have a magnetic company culture that skyrockets your NPS, your net promoter score, reduces employee attrition, attracts the very best talent industry talent so that you can build a business that fulfills its mission, makes a tangible impact and builds enterprise value for you to get an exit that helps you become financially free and spend more time doing the things you love. So 
Can you see how that's a completely different positioning to I just help you improve employee happiness? And this is what gets the business. This is what wins the business. How do you guarantee success? Now, I call this the success equation. Kind of, you may have seen this in my content. This is my perspective on the core elements that you need to swing success into your favor and basically guarantee it. At least this is what's guaranteed my success. So there are four elements that I believe are part of this. So one is time. Instead of thinking about time in days, weeks, and months, success comes in quarters and years and decades. And the longer you are able to ha have a viewpoint on time, the more you're going to be able to stick with things for a long period and ultimately guarantee success because ultimately success only comes if you stick with things for long enough. And most people in entrepreneurship give up just before they start to see success. So stick with it. Next, we have a proven game plan. Now, again, this goes back to my the earlier uh, uh, training around the myths of entrepreneurship, where the myth of a blue ocean, where you have to come up with a brand new idea, new way of doing things, and that that's bullshit. You need to know what's currently in the market. You need to see what's working and you need to take that and you need to make it better. And you need to follow a game plan that other people are using. And that is the, the beauty and benefit of working with mentors, coaches, programs, and those types of things. That is the beauty of education is that you follow a proven game plan. Next up is clarity. So the question is, well, I have a proven game plan, but what the hell should I focus on first? Because the game plan is made up of dozens, maybe hundreds of micro steps. But if you build them in the wrong sequence, if you attack them in the wrong sequence, you're just going to spin your wheels. So you have to hit things in the right, in the right sequence. And this is what clarity gets. So the importance of having clarity. And this is what I consider to be the turbocharger of success is accountability. And especially in entrepreneurship and this, you know, the starting of your own business when you're on your own and you have a ton of things that you need to get done and you have life throwing rocks at you every single day and things are hard and it feels overwhelming and you're questioning whether this is for you. What is the thing that is going to keep you on track? And that is accountability. That is having systems, methods, processes, and mechanisms to keep you accountable. And again, this is the benefit of working in a program and having a mentor, having a coach that tells you what to do and holds you accountable to the process. So in my opinion, these are the four elements that make up success. This is how we do it at Creator Launch. I kind of walked you through this in the, um, in the introduction training, but we give things enough time. We have proven game plans, systems, and mechanisms. We give clarity with custom roadmap, and then we have a ton of accountability mechanisms to keep people on track. The ultimate cheat code. Highlight someone doing what you think you would like to do. Pay to learn from them. Do exactly what they say. Let's go through that again. Number one, highlight someone doing what you think you would like to do pay to learn from them, do exactly what they say. If you do this, you win. Ask yourself, do I have all four elements of the success equation? Do I have time? Everyone has time. Do I have a proven game plan? Not everyone has a proven game plan. Do I have clarity? N most people don't have clarity. You know, I, I polled this in the, um, in Creative Launch University in the community. And I asked like, what are people struggling with right now? Is it content? Is it sales? Is it marketing? Is it clarity? And most people were saying it's clarity. They just don't know what to focus on. So most people don't have this. And candidly, without these two, without clarity and accountability, most people don't make progress. 
And then finally, accountability. Do you have mechanisms of, to keep you accountable? You know, there is a reason why when people work with a health coach, they lose weight because they have someone telling them, do this, don't do this. And then when people fuck up, <laughs> they have a coach there that n they know is going to say, okay, well, why did you fuck up? Don't fuck up again. And then they get back on track and they keep losing weight. And so, yeah, if you're, if you're a person who's never lost weight before, go fucking pay for a coach, lose weight, get it done. Here's a reminder for you. You are fully responsible for the path you take. You have options, but you are the one that's responsible. Now, there are three force multipliers for the success equation. These are kind of like levers to pull, which just turbocharge the success equation. They are discipline, sacrifice, and focus. Discipline, sacrifice, and focus. Now, we're going to go into this, by the way, in um, the next training in the Fundamentals of Self-Mastery. Uh, so we're going to go into exactly how I kind of build these in and how to really multiply them. But first up, I'm going to talk to you about this dude, because the, look, the truth is, by the way, if you don't know who the hell this guy is, uh, this is Sam Altman. He is the CEO of OpenAI, uh, the business behind ChatGPT. Now, he built within a couple of years, he took when ChatGPT got uh, released to the public, he took OpenAI, uh, I think up to a, I think it was a 75 uh, million or 75 million, can't have been 75 billion, but anyway, it was, a, he took the business from a relatively small enterprise value to a huge one. And look, the truth is, is that this guy plays a game at a completely different level that I'm, you know, I, as I told you in my introduction, I worked in tech and the game of tech for me was super risky. And most people who succeed in tech are ones who have decided to go down that route. And I didn't want to play that game. Um, but we can learn from people like Sam. And Sam wrote a blog post relatively recently uh, around what he considers the fundamentals of success to be. And look, the, the truth is, is that you, I could sit here and say, these are the fundamentals of success, but like, I'm not currently where I want to be. So I'm just telling you from my perspective, but we can learn from other people who are way further ahead. And so I'm going to go through what Sam considers to be the fundamentals of success. So the fundamentals of success, according to Sam Altman. Number one, compound yourself. Seek exponential growth in your endeavors and continuously aim to add another zero to your success metrics. Now think back to when I said you need to try and 10x someone else's wealth, health, happiness. This is really what this means. You are adding another zero to your success metrics by helping other people 10x. That's literally what, that's the math. <laughs> okay, so compound yourself by helping compound others and continuously aim to add another zero to your success metrics. So as well as helping other people 10x, you want to be trying to 10x you and your business. Have almost too much self-belief. Believe in yourself and your ideas almost to the point of delusion, but balance it with self-awareness. Now, this is something that is somewhat challenging and difficult to explain because I can only talk about it from my perspective, which is that I have always had self-belief. And I don't know why, to be honest with you. I don't know why. But there were times when I had my self-belief challenged. And this was when I was faced with, with adversity. And I was faced with 
challenges which were thrown at me, which I weren't expecting. And ultimately, then I had the opportunity to overcome them. And so I overcame challenges by putting in reps and building a bank of undeniable proof that when a challenge is thrown at me, I am able to overcome it. And in the game of entrepreneurship, where the game is just overcoming challenges, I therefore have enough proof that I can overcome challenges and therefore I know that I can win entrepreneurship. But you need to balance it with self-awareness. So where are your limits? Where are your, your kind of like black holes? Where are your blind spots that you can't see? And this is where self-reflection, tr tracking numbers and being diligent helps with this. Three, learn to think independently. Cultivate original thinking and be willing to try new ideas, even if they lead to failure. <laughs> the, again, as we go back to this idea that there is no original idea, there is only evolutions of ideas. And therefore the mindset that you need to have is that what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna, I'm gonna take I'm going to see and have a viewpoint of what is already existing. And I'm going to say, how can I make this better? And I'm going to come up with a hypothesis. So my hypothesis in science is just an idea that I think that this can be done in a different way that could result in better results. And what you do is then you take that hypothesis and you put it, you test it in the market, and then you get real world results to know if your hypothesis was right or wrong. You then take those results and you go through that cycle again. And it's a never ending cycle. So I'll give you an example for me with content. The way I look at it is, and I think when you're starting out, the mindset you need to have is, how can I build a bank of 12 months worth of content data where I put micro tests in the form of content posts out into the market and I get real world feedback on what my audience and the market felt about my ideas, my content. And that's the mindset you think that is going to help, help you build a long-term enterprise, which is, I'm just going to do this for 12 months, see what, and I'm going to look back. And this is what I do every three months, every quarter, I look back on my content and see how it performed. And then I take my ideas that worked well, and I make iterations on those ideas and I take what didn't work and I don't fucking do them again. <laughs> Okay. And that's the, the, how to test new ideas. And candidly, I don't believe there's any failure doesn't exist. I don't believe failure exists. I only think there are tests, tests and results, hypotheses, tests and results. Number four, get good at sales, learn to effectively communicate and sell your ideas to others while genuinely believing in what you're selling. Now the, the probably the number one longest lever for sales is conviction, is belief in what you're selling. And at the start, you need to, you need to convince yourself that what you are doing works and you need to get that across in your sales calls. And over time, when you get client results, you get proof that conviction grows. So at the start, of course, it's going to feel like you don't maybe have the belief, but this comes by putting the reps in. Number five, make it easy to take risks. Take calculated risks early in your career and keep your life flexible to pursue new opportunities. So I really, when I was 25 and I made the decision to move away from dentistry, I took a step back and I thought to myself, well, okay, well, I've got another 40, 40 years of my career ahead of me. What if I take the next five years to reevaluate, knowing what I know now about the world as a 25 year old, I've experienced some shit. And what happens if I take five years to get a new perspective and to take some calculated risks? So for me, that calculated risk was literally quitting a career, which I had invested seven years of university into time, energy, resources, and what I did was I'm going to go and see what happens when I work in the tech industry. And I plotted a path together, which was I'm going to work. 
unpaid internships at tech companies at the exact same time as I'm working as a dentist. And so that's what I did. So if I worked for six months, I worked six days a week, three days as a dentist, Thursday, Fridays, and Saturdays. And then Monday, Tuesdays, and Wednesdays, I worked at two unpaid internships in London. That was my risk. And people would have looked at that and thought, this is done. And my first job that I got was that eventually got enough experience in my first job to get my first job. Um, but my first job was paid me significantly less half of what I was earning as a dentist. And so I took risks. And if you're young, that is the time to take risks. But I would also say if you're in your thirties and your forties and you have another 30, 40, you know, 20, 30, 40 years ahead of you, it could be in your fifties, could be in your sixties. Like you've got decades ahead. Like take five years to fucking try some other shit. And th this is the risk. The risk is what happens is you build a life in your twenties where you have a mortgage, which is pretty much dead these days. Like most people in their twenties can't afford a mortgage. So that's out of the question, but kids, uh, car payments, loans, debt, student loan debt. These are all anchors that stop people from taking risks. And so in my opinion, in your twenties, you want to minimize how much risks, how much, uh, responsibilities you take on so that you can take more risks and try shit out. Fuck around and find out. Six, focus. Prioritize your efforts and be relentless in pursuing your goals. Now, this leads to this is like going to be uh, what we focus on in uh, the art of focus training. But you need to, in a world where we are bombarded by signal, noise, and the biggest companies in the world trying to own our attention, the number one asset you have is your focus and being able to tell those corporations, no, you will, you do not own me. And this takes practice. And it's why my phone is on permanently do not disturb mo mode. Okay. It's been that way for a couple of years now. Work hard. Seven, combine smart work with hard work for exceptional results especially early in your career. Now I've been, I've definitely made like the mistake of just working hard on not the right things. And I knew that at one, one, at some point things would change and I would have clarity on what I'm working on. And when I combine clarity with my work ethic, which I always knew that I had in my favor, then eventually results would come. Be bold, pursue ambitious goals and don't be afraid to go against the grain. Again, this kind of like is the, is the, you know, is one of the core principles of what we're doing here, which is walk the unconventional path. Don't be afraid to do what other 99.999% of people will never do. Because you will get results that 99.999% of people will never get. Be ambitious. You know, I always, I like, you know, I heard this years ago, which is this idea of <laughs> shoot for the stars and, you know, you will at least uh, fall or shoot for the moon and at least you'll fall amongst the stars. Something like that. I've maybe butchered it, but whatever. The idea is, is a fucking aim big. Aim big, big, but be bold. And think 10 times bigger than you think right now. And you will succeed. Number nine, be willful. Persist in the face of challenges and be optimistic about your ability to shape your circumstances. Now, this is... <sighs> Entrepreneurship is being able to be kicked in the face every single day and soak up that kick and go again. And part of that is just, 
you just got to go through it. You know, as all Mosey say, you've got to be able to do your rocky cutscene. You've got to do the fucking, like, training in the mountains in the snow, chopping wood, doing the hard shit. But be optimistic. Number 10, be hard to compete with. Build leverage and differentiate yourself to become indispensable. Now, there is a cheat code to this. And the cheat code is the core thesis of Creator Launch. You build leverage through building your personal brand. When you build a personal brand, you don't have any competition. So that is how you differentiate yourself. You differentiate yourself by being someone worth following, an authority, an attractive character, and having a new opportunity in a future-based cause, as we talked about in the trifecta of influence. So this is how you do this in this new economy. Number 11, build a network. Surround yourself with talented individuals and cultivate relationships by offering help and support. Now, this is something that, especially at the beginning of your career, is really important. And this is what I did. And I talked about this in my introduction video of how I went from, I managed to get my dream job as a dentist by surrounding myself with the best dentists in the world. And I followed, I no one told me to do this. You know, this was before anyone... This was before online business, before anyone, you know, I could, I just followed my gut instinct. I was like, if I put myself, if I surround myself and I put myself in the same room as these people. And at the time, this is the first step in the door was through online communities. And this is the beauty of these types of online communities. You never know who you're going to meet and who is going to go on to do the, be the next Gary Vee, be the next Tim Ferriss, be the, be the next whoever. And so always when it comes to networking, especially in the online world, make sure to give people the time of day and always have a good, make sure that you, you leave any interaction with, in a positive, positive way. So that people always have, always have something positive to say about you when they met you. It's one piece of advice I'd give you. And please respect people's time. This is my biggest, I don't have any. There's really only one thing that fucks me off. And I try, I think, I, you know, I'm trying to, I try not to be emotional about stuff. Um, but the one thing that really gets me is when people disrespect my time, whether that's being late for meetings. So if calls, schedules, schedule calls, um, or not showing up to stuff and just not having diligence around their time. That to me just shows that they don't respect my time and they don't respect their time. And I think the emotion out of it is really more of a, a one of like frustration for them. Like it frustrates me that they don't respect time as much as I do, because time is our ultimate only asset that we have. It's the only thing that we actually truly have. And it's limited. Our time on this planet is limited. And so when you have networking calls with people, when you book calls for stuff, fucking show up like at the, at the time that it's scheduled, learn to master your calendar. And please do not disrespect my time. Like if you book a call with me, if you, if you, uh, on calls with me, and this is, th this, this fucks me off so much that when, you know, if you, any of you have used zoom, you'll know that zoom loves to update itself right before a scheduled call. And so you go to sign into the call and all of a sudden Zoom is like, no, I am going to update myself. And that fucks me off because then I'm like one minute late for a call and I hate that. So I'm always, I always now try and make sure that I'm early. So I'm always um, try to get a minute or so before the call. So I'm prepped, respect other people's time and build a network, surround yourself with people. Number 12, you get rich by owning things. So focus on ownership and investments that have the potential to increase rapidly in value. Now, if any of you guys are Hormozy fans, you'll have been, you'll be familiar with the concept of investing into the S and me 500 and not the S and P 500. And I believe in that philosophy. So the, 
the way I look at things is that I don't have an investment portfolio. The only investment I'm investing in is me and my business. And that is what my investment portfolio is going to be. And so until you build a business that is profitable and making money and is revenue producing, I think it's dumb to be looking at investments. I think it's dumb. Like I think you need to have, and this is my aim, have a million cash in the bank before you can even start to look at capital allocation, because up until then you need to be investing all that money back into you growing you and your business and building enterprise value and an audience and a personal brand. Number 13, I think this is the final one. Be internally driven, find motivation from within rather than seeking external validation and prioritize meaningful work aligned with your values. And I've got a book recommendation for you. This is, it's the motivation myth by Jeff Hayden. Uh, I think, no, I don't have it here, but I talk about it later. And it's really this, this idea about how you can, how motivation is finding motivation from external sources. So I sent 5,000 odd DMs in the past six months and had conversations with thousands of, uh, of people that like connect with. And I asked them, I always ask them like, why did you follow me? Like, why did you follow me on Instagram or whatever? And the most common response from people is they liked my motivational content. They found me inspiring. And when I get that, <laughs> when I get that, I, I have this kind of like, you know, like push and pull because at one point I'd kind of, from one perspective, I'm like, that's great that I'm inspiring people, but then I know deep down that if you're relying on other people to inspire you, that's not the key. So prioritize meaningful work aligned with your values. Okay. So those are Sam Altman's fundamentals for success. Next up, we have the fundamentals of self-mastery. So let's dive in. Right. Okay. We are here for the fundamentals of self-mastery in the leveling up module. Let's get into it. So fundamentals of self-mastery. This is going to build on a lot of the stuff that we've spoken about before. So for example, the success equation made up of time, proving game plan, clarity, and accountability. And the three force multipliers for the success equation. So this is what we're going to touch on now. Discipline, sacrifice, focus. Remember, do not try to bend the spoon. That's impossible. Instead, only try to realize the truth that there is no spoon. Then you'll see that it is not the spoon that bends. It is only yourself. Remember, this is the, this is in relation in the context of Neo from the matrix going through his self discovery arc and his self mastery journey. So to define self actualization, you may be familiar with this, this phrase. So the realization or fulfillment of one's talents and potentialities, especially considered as a drive or need present in everyone, everyone wants to fulfill their potential. Everyone. It's probably the biggest fear of regret is that they will get to their, the end of their life and they haven't fulfilled their potential or at least scratched the surface of fulfilling their potential. And this is why it's part of my mission at Creator Launch to help people fulfill their potential. And this is, this is why this, this stuff, these topics all exist in this course, because it's so critical to self-actualization. Remember Ikigai, the nexus of what you love, your skills, what the world needs and what you can be paid for. Ikigai is a journey. So it's a journey that you go on in your life and it takes into account all of the things that make up you as a human. Now, in contrast to Ikigai being a journey, the process of self-actualization is a system. What makes up a system? A system is made up of inputs, processes, outputs, feedback. Inputs, processes, outputs, feedback. Ooh. So first up we have inputs. 
This is the energy that you put into the system. And it's made up of a bunch of things in the, in the context of what we're doing. It is what you stand for in your mission, vision, and values, clear goals. So what are you going to focus on self reflect, self reflection and awareness. So understanding who you are crafting your future self, self discipline, daily exercise, optimal nutrition, meditation, prayer, mindfulness, whatever you choose and sacrifice. So a sacrifice comes into it. We'll dive into that in a second. Then we have channeling that energy. You know, you have to direct the energy towards something and you do that through processes. So processes, what is the number one priority and focus right now? Remove all distractions or negative stimuli. Say no to everything that is not a priority. This is channeling that energy. Results, these are the outputs. So intensely focused and deliberate action completing things fast and getting it out into the market. Remember, there is nothing that beats actual real world was results in the market. 80% done is a hundred percent fucking awesome. Tracking results and making progress. This is the key with outputs. You track results, you make hypotheses, you make tests, put it out into the market, get results, get more feedback, go again. It's a cycle and the cycle ends with feedback. So adjustments, you make adjustments to your hypothesis based on the results. So modify change or refocus priorities based on real results and data, measure results against baseline and benchmarks, seeing what variants work together, what combinations work best together, making assumptions based on what variants could work better together. So these are the adjustments you make from the feedback you get from your tests. So self-actualization is a system of inputs, processes, outputs, feedback. And I mentioned this earlier. So this is a book recommendation. Uh, I actually made a YouTube video, one of my first YouTube videos years ago. Uh, you can go watch it, kind of a bit of a synopsis, but this is The Motivation Myth by Jeff Hayden. So many of you guys will be familiar with Atomic Habits from uh, by James Clear. I actually preferred this book to Atomic Habits, kind of similar-ish types of topics topics, but, um, I found this one made, I don't know. I, I really enjoyed this one and, and, you know, cynically, I would say that the reason why this doesn't get as much airtime as atomic habits is because James clear, uh, was running the Tim Ferriss methodology of book launching, which is just unbeatable marketing. And uh, that is why most books become New York Times bestsellers uh, because of their marketing campaigns. Um, but I personally felt like this was a better book than Atomic Habits. I read them at the same time, similar time, and I enjoyed this one way more. So check it out. And this is it's based around this idea that motivation equals inspiration is a myth because it isn't. Motivation is a an addition of discipline, sacrifice, focus, and relentless action. Motivation is not based on inspiration. So I call this the dream cycle. And this is the, this is everything that I've done and used to direct my life. So it starts off with actually dreaming, like what the fuck do you want your future to look like? What do you, what do you want your days to look like? Who do you want to be working with? What do you want to be wearing? Where do you want to be living? Like have to think about these things because they won't just pop out of thin air. Like you have to dream about these stuff, these things. And truthfully, this is a, this is something that we don't do anymore. We don't dream. And Again, on a, from a cynical perspective, I would say that that is what the world has designed us to not do, to not dream. So you have to break that by dreaming. Now, those dreams then go on to instruct goals. You take those dreams and you t set targets and you set long term targets, short term targets. And those goals then feed into decisions. You make decisions based on those goals. Do I focus on this? Do I need to do this to get this result? And 
to do, once you've made a decision, you have to act on it. So you make actions, you then are consistent with those actions, you get results, and it feeds back into the dreams at the beginning. Because once you had your mind opened and expanded, you can then redream and refocus your future. The self mastery triad. This is made up of skills, character traits, and beliefs. So what are these things? Skills. So skills are the practical abilities and knowledge required to excel in your field. Identify key skills. So determine the essential skills needed for success in your specific industry. You need to do continuous learning. So investing in ongoing education through courses, workshops, books, online resources, mentorships, coaching programs. You need to practice regularly. So you need to dedicate time each day to hone your skills through deliberate practice. You need to seek feedback. So actively seek feedback from mentors, peers, and importantly, customers to identify areas for improvement. Now, this is something that's going to be, um, and my students will see this, is that it's, I want to, as frequently as I can get away with, ask for feedback from my customers without, my students without, you know, making it feel like a hassle for them to give feedback, which, you know, if you think about being in, in a job and your like manager asks you for feedback and stuff, it's always, it's always a chore. And what I, what is, so there's always like a balance and the balance is, is that for me, I want to improve my product so much. It's going to have a positive impact on my students. And therefore I have to ask for feedback. And so once I kind of, you know, as an example, this program, once it's launched and once I've had my first batch of students go through it all, I will ask for where they believe gaps are. So this, this is, I have made these resources based on what I believe are the plugs that are going to, that are going to fill their gaps and their knowledge and skills gaps, but I may have missed some things and maybe things need to be positioned in a different way, in a better way. And so I'm going to ask my students, what can I improve? What am I missing? What can I, what can I add? What can I take away? What wasn't useful? really critical to to do that and at the start it's a very scary task for feedback from your customers because you know you don't want them to say something is shit <laughs> but you have to do it and embrace failure and again i just i don't believe in failures i believe in tests and results and decisions you make you again you have a hypothesis you make a decision based on that hypothesis you test it by putting something into the market, you get results. And there's, a, there's, there are, what is the result? Was the result better than what you did previously or was it worse? So in, you don't get failures, you just get more data to use to instruct your decision making. So I don't believe in failures. Character traits, what are character traits? So character traits are personal qualities and attributes that shape your behavior and decisions. Self-awareness, reflect on your strengths, your weaknesses and values to understand yourself better. It's the reason why I get, get you guys to go through this self-discovery process and go through those exercises. Spend the fucking time doing that stuff. Emotional intelligence, de develop empathy, self-regulation and social skills to na navigate relationships effectively. I've always been, you know, when we had to go through interviews for, to get into like, medical school, dental school. I did medical school interviews as well. And it was really funny because the, the, the biggest character trait, like this was the number one character trait that it was like, you have to make sure that you say in your interviews that you are empathetic, that you can empathize. Uh, because ultimately when you're a doctor or a dentist, you have to be able to empathize with a patient's pain. So you need to take their words, take their descriptions and be able to morph what they're saying in to be able to make a diagnosis based on what they're saying. And this is the truth is when you're 17 years old and you're going through these interviews, you don't have a fucking clue what other people are going through. You, you don't have any empathy. I mean, you say it in your interviews, you say I'm empathetic and I have empathy, but you have a fucking idea what it means to live in another person's existence. And, you know, I'm on the cusp of turning, turning 36 now and very, very, only very recently I have 
noticed that my perspective on empathy has, or maybe my ability to empathize has all of a sudden like really become clear because I, the way I see it is everyone is living their own existence. And as we said at the beginning of the, the understanding yourself module, which is like to be able to craft a new you, you have to understand your current you and that your current you and your current existence is based on your experiences, your, uh, your beliefs, your skills. And what I kind of realized is that people don't have a choice a lot of the time in what their current existence is. And something that really drives me is what I feel is like this ultimate privilege of the life that I have and the set of circumstances that led up to my, you know, led up to my current existence now. And as I had when I was younger, and I've always had this feeling of privilege that I was so lucky to have all of the experiences and things that my family worked hard to be able to give me. You know, my dad was this, the first person in our family history to go to university and that put our family's trajectory on a new, well, put our family onto a new trajectory. And he's both my parents sacrificed a lot to give myself and my siblings a life that I am very lucky to have had. And they made sacrifices for that. And for that, I'm eternally grateful. And it feeds my desire to want to help other people because I feel like my parents gave me a foundation and my ancestors gave me a foundation and I don't owe it to my future generations to do be the best of best person I can be. I feel like I, I, what I'm driven by is I, I owe it to them. I owe it to the people that walked before me. And what I've noticed recently is that I can really empathize with people's perspectives more, you know, bad people didn't choose to be bad people. Bad people are the accumulation of their existence, their experiences, their, where they were born, their circumstances. And I feel deep empathy. I can feel that now because I can, I see that I understand how the world operates. I understand how the fucking world operates now. And I didn't up until very recently, at least it feels that way. And therefore I feel like I have a lot more empathy and understanding of other people's perspectives and existences. So that's again, something that drives me anyway. We need empathy, self-regulation, social skills, and we need resilience. Cultivate the ability to bounce back from adversity and maintain a positive attitude in challenging times. This is the getting kicked in the face, getting straight back up again. And, uh, yeah, I've, I've, if you don't know what it's like to get kicked in the face, I mean, I haven't, unfortunately touched wood, haven't been kicked in the face and I don't intend to be, but I know what it's like to get punched in the face, I've been punched a few times and you just have to get back up again. Discipline, establish habits and routines that promote productivity and focus. We'll talk about this in the art of focus training, integrity, prioritize honesty, transparency, and ethical behavior in all your interactions. I know people who are fucking do not, do not build their businesses based on ethical and transparent behavior. I've seen it. And that is everything that I'm going to try. Well, I'm trying to do is have complete transparency. This is why I document everything and yeah, move through my business life with honesty. And I would encourage you all to do the same thing. 
Beliefs. Beliefs are convictions and assumptions that shape your perception of yourself and the world. Identi identify limiting beliefs. Recognize and challenge beliefs that hold you back or foster self-doubt. Now, I grew up in, an, in a family where uh, money was considered evil. I grew up in a family where my parents would talk about people who loved money or whatever. Um, I was grew up in a in a family where money and business was considered evil. So I've had a long journey to get over those limiting beliefs. And that's been reading resources, listening to audiobooks, podcasts, and surrounding myself with people who are trying to do good and changing my perspective on that. Positive affirmations. Replace negative self-talk with affirmations that reinforce confidence and optimism. Now, I'm actually going to be testing this out on the golf course. So golf is one of my favorite things, favorite hobbies. And I have, a few years ago, I experienced, I was on holiday with some friends playing golf and I had an absolute meltdown. And I lost like 16 balls in a single round, which if any of you have played golf, you know that most people maybe lose one, two, or three balls in a round. I lost 16. And these fuckers are expensive nowadays. And I spent the next few years having to try and rebuild my golf game because I completely lost confidence. And luckily now I've now built this back where I'm, I've for the last few years played pretty consistently and have but now i want to take it to the next level and i'm very aware of how confidence and visualization play a massive role in playing good golf so i'm going to be testing that on the golf course and this is with visualization so i do this in business i have next to me i have got a printed out version of my vision board so every morning when I'm doing my journaling, I see my vision, my future vision. And next to it, I have a letter of decl declaration. And these are the letter of decl declaration, which point, which spell out my North stars for this year. And there's a declaration that I'm going to hit these targets and hit these goals. And I've signed it at the bottom and I've got it next to me. Surround yourself with positivity. You need to surround yourself with supportive individuals and inspirational content. You need to cut the fucking shit out of your algorithms and you need to unfollow all the crap, all the fucking, all the crap you need to unfollow. Just fucking the biggest, biggest advice I can give you is cut the shit out of your life. And that includes people. If you live in a place where you have people that just feel like you're hold, they're holding you back, leave Go move to a different country, a different city. Put yourself and surround yourself by people who are not going to keep holding you back. Embrace growth mindset. Adopt a mindset that views challenges as opportunities for growth and learning. If you're here, you already have a growth mindset. Like that is the, that's, that, that is the reality. That's the one thing I know for a fact. If you are watching this video right now, you have this. It is... Something that I think, I actually don't, I don't know. I can see it from my perspective, but like, I've always had it. Um, maybe you are there and you, at some point you didn't feel like you had a growth mindset or maybe you felt like you weren't into personal development and, but who knows? So I don't know about this. Maybe I need to interview some more people about this. So here's an action step for you. I have a playbook in the creator OS identifying who you need to become. It is here, if we go back to the Create OS. So it is this worksheet here. So it goes through and gets you to do this. So go do it and I will see you in the next one. Right, this is the breaking through resistance training in the leveling up module, breaking through resistance. Your new life is going to cost you your old one. It's going to cost you your comfort zone and your sense of direction. 
It's going to cost you relationships and friends. It's going to cost you being liked and understood. It doesn't matter. The people who are meant for you are going to meet you on the other side. You are going to build a new comfort zone around the things that actually move you forward. Instead of being liked, you're going to be loved. Instead of being understood, you're going to be seen. All you're going to lose is what was built for a person you no longer are. This is from The Mountain Is You, one of the mandatory reading books in the Creator Launch Mastermind from the author Brianna Wiest. And the book is really all about how to get across, get away from self-sabotage, which is what happens when we bump up against the ceiling of our comfort zone. So what is our comfort zone? So our comfort zone is a settled method of working that requires little effort and yields only barely acceptable results. Say that again. A settled method of working that requires little effort and yields only barely acceptable results. It's what holds you back. Your comfort zone is what holds you back. Now, the second book that I recommend, this is, again, one of the books in the uh, mandatory reading list for the Launch Mastermind. This is Psycho-Cybernetics. And this is really all about the science of our thoughts and how they can be measured. And this is an incredible book because it's written by a doctor, a cosmetic surgeon, and it was written in the 1950s. And... It's my favorite personal development book. Um, and I don't know if it's because it's written by a doctor, if that makes a difference, but it's structured in a very easy to read and logical way. Um, and it's all about how you as humans, we as humans are, or Maxwell Maltz calls cybernetic, uh, cybernetic creatures, which means we see targets and we move towards them. And that's the point, the purpose of setting goals. Now, the problem is, is that we are goal-seeking organisms and this butts head against the fact that we are also comfort-seeking organisms. Our neurochemistry, our bodies and our physiology are designed to be both goal-seeking and comfort-seeking at the same time. And it is this phenomenon which keeps us within our comfort zone. These two are always fighting at each other, our goals versus comfort. And this is what happens. So in the process of, of leveling up over a period of time, we have levels that our comfort is set at. These are our comfort ceilings. And what happens is when we go through the process of leveling up, learning new skills, we feel these feelings when we start hitting the top of our comfort ceiling, the top of our comfort zone. And what happens is we then default back to our default standards. This could be seen in the process of losing weight, where we start losing weight and all of a sudden we fuck up and we go on a binge and we put back a load of weight on. This is the process of the yo-yo diet. This is what happens in yo-yo dieting, which I've been in, I, that's happened to me. And what happens is you need to set higher standards. And this is what the process of leveling up is. So over time, you increase skills, your comfort ceiling bumps you down, and then you need to burst through it by setting higher standards for yourself. Okay, and this is the process that you need to go on. So resistance, what is resistance? It's the internal barriers, obstacles, or challenges that individuals face on their journey towards personal growth and self-actualization. Why and how does resistance manifest during the journey of leveling up? So the first is the fear of the unknown. So when leveling up, you're often venturing into new territory that you can't see down the road because you haven't seen the path. You don't know what's at the end or like what is what happens when you walk down the path. This could be starting a new job, pursuing a new skill or making a significant life change. This uncertainty can trigger fear 
and apprehension about what lies ahead. Self-doubt. As you aim for personal growth, you might encounter self-doubt about your abilities and whether you're capable of achieving your goals. This inner voice of doubt can lead to feelings of inadequacy or imposter syndrome. Comfort zone. Our minds and bodies naturally resist change because they seek comfort and familiarity. Stepping out of your comfort zone requires effort and can evoke feelings of discomfort or even anxiety as you confront the unknown. Past trauma and conditioning. Previous experiences or trauma can create subconscious barriers to growth. Patterns of thought and behavior established in response to past events may resurface and impede progress. This requires conscious efforts to overcome. Attachment to identity. Now, this is a really interesting one because <laughs> ultimately this is all it's about. Because when we've, you know, as we will go through, we'll go through the process of crafting and designing a new identity, the people in your life won't recognize you. And you need to let go of that. You need to let go of the fact that that old person that the, these people in your life know you for, they don't know you anymore because you show up as a different human. But in the process of leveling up, you will feel resistance to it. And that is the attachment to your old self. And you need to get rid of those. Overwhelm. The process of leveling up may involve taking on new responsibilities, learning new skills, or confronting deep-seated issues. Now, this can feel overwhelming at times, and it can lead to that feeling of resistance as you navigate the challenges ahead. Lack of belief. Belief in oneself and the journey ahead is crucial for personal growth. Without belief in your abilities or the possibilities of change, you may succumb to feelings of resistance and be less likely to persevere through challenges. So... If it is hard, good. If you are scared, good. If you are worried, good. If you are doubtful, good. If you are uncertain, good. If you are overwhelmed, good. Resistance is your best signal that you are leveling up and creating a new identity. It is the best sign you will ever get that you are on the right path. So you take a deep breath. And you say to yourself, this is what it takes to become the leader that I'm destined to become. Thank you, universe, for reminding me I am right where I need to be. Start quantifying your days by how many healthy, positive things you accomplished, and you will see how quickly you begin to make progress. Next up, we have something that goes right along line. It's the kind of the follow on from this idea of resistance. And it's just an interesting, slightly different perspective on how to look at resistance. So let's talk about outwitting the devil. Okay, so as I said, this is a follow on from breaking through resistance. This is in the leveling up module. And this is called Outwitting the Devil. On your journey of self-actualization, you will come face to face with the devil every single day. Some of you will be familiar with this. This is a book called Think and Grow Rich by Napoleon Hill. It's all about learning to think like the rich so that you can start to behave like them. Now, 
This is his most famous book, but I think he's actually got a better one. And not many people know this book, but this is Outwitting the Devil. And it was originally written by Napoleon Hill in 1938, but it was considered to be too controversial to be published in its era. So it wasn't published until 2011, until his foundation or whatever, his family or whatever, just read it. They read the transcripts, they read the books, and they were like, this needs to be put out there. And I actually listened to this uh, on as an audiobook. And there are some some books that I think are best re uh, read and some that are best, uh, I think, are best listened to. This is 100% a book that is best listened to um, and read. Um, and when you read it, you will, you listen to it, you'll know why. If you have Spotify premium outside the US, I think maybe they have it in the US now, you have access to 15 hours per month of audiobook reading and or listening, and you can listen to it on Spotify for free. But what's it about? So in the book, Napoleon Hill talks about this concept of drifters. So these are what he defines as individuals who go through life without clear goals or plans, allowing themselves to be carried along by external circumstances, the opinions of others and of their own impulses and whims. The devil has tools and he uses tools like fear, procrastination, vices, and doubt to control and pull people back towards becoming or being their default state as a drifter. So this is the idea of, as we talked about resistance previously, the feelings of resistance that, and the, what resistance manifests as, which is typically fear, procrastination, defaulting to bad habits and doubt, it is based on this idea that the devil is always there and he's always pulling these things, pulling you back towards these things that don't allow you to progress, which I, when I listened to this and kind of, I thought it was an incredible, incredibly powerful way of thinking about your habits and your decisions, because when you're faced with the decision of, do I eat the Snickers bar? You can think to yourself, that's just the devil telling me he's on my shoulder whispering in my ear just it's just a snickers bar just well what does it matter just have the snickers bar and i now know that that is the devil trying to pull me away pull me back to being a drifter which is what we do not want to be so let's talk about these tools fear one of the primary tools the devil uses is fear so Hill discusses how fear can paralyze individuals, preventing them from taking risks and pursuing their goals. Get comfortable taking risks. Now, the way I see this is that the world and media, the biggest tool that the devil has, and Hill talks about it in his book, is how the devil uses media, propaganda, news to instill fear in the population. And this is why I don't read the news, don't listen to the news, don't watch the news. I don't give a fuck what's going on out there. Doesn't impact me. Just doesn't. Nothing does. Like knowing someone got murdered in Australia. How does that impact me? Like, doesn't. It's designed to be used as a fear tool. So stop listening to the biggest tool that the devil has, which is news and media. You know, if you watch the news and I see enough interviews, so I watched in long form interviews with interesting people, I kind of get an idea of what are some of the common themes that are happening in media. And, you know, there's always this common idea that the world is currently going to shit. That's always a narrative that is getting played, that the good old days are be behind us. The world is going to shit. What is happening? When, if you look at the reality and you look at how we are now living to an average age of 80, when 
a hundred years ago we were living to an average age of 55 you know we've nearly we have we've added another 30 percent of our onto our lifespan disease most of the biggest killers of disease like heart heart disease which used to be one of the biggest killers in uh, like the one of the biggest killers since the 1970s it's been reduced by 50 percent so this is hundreds of millions of people across the world who are not dying from heart disease based on our science and interventions so don't listen to the fear i look at the world in a very positive through a very positive lens i just see amazing things that people are doing I see the cool shit that everyone's doing. I see helping people. And I choose to use social media as a tool to help people rather than as being used by social media, which is what the media companies do. So think about it. Procrastination. So Hill identifies procrastination as a major obstacle to success. The devil takes advantage of people's tendency to delay action and divert them from their goals. This is doing the thing you know you need to do. Now, again, when now I've kind of seen from this perspective of kind of this like idea of the devil kind of playing with me, I think about when I get that feeling of procrastinating on something that I know I need to do, I just say to myself, that's the fucking devil. And I immediately take that as a trigger to say, just do it, do it now, do it right now. And I do it and I get stuff done. So realize that when you're feeling procrastination, that is you actually, that's you hitting your comfort, you're bumping up against your comfort zone uh, ceiling. And the devil is there being like, you don't need to do that. You don't need to get out of your comfort zone. Just stay doing all the shit you've always done. Just stay here. It's fine. It's comfortable. Feels good, right? You don't have to worry about anything. You don't have to do that stuff. Just stay the same. It's the devil. Vices. So Napoleon Hill talks about this idea of this thing called hypnotic rhythm to control people's habits and actions. Breaking free from negative habits and establishing positive ones is crucial for success. So swap, swap negative habits for positive ones. So it's essentially, it's really quite simple. It's like, you know what the vices are in this world. Shit food, alcohol, nicotine through cigarettes and vaping, gambling, drugs. Those are the things. And you have to understand that those are the tools that the devil uses to keep you from progressing. Okay. Doubt. Continuous learning and self-improvement as a means of outwitting the devil. Knowledge and education empower individuals to resist negative influences. Embrace self-education, self-actualization, and mastery. Doubt is just obliterated by constantly learning. You're only doubtful when you don't think, when you, frankly, you just don't know something. So you need to go and learn what it is you don't know, then put it into practice. So you get over doubt by leaning into self-actualization and mastery. Next up, we have the art of focus. Let's get to it. Right. So the art of focus, the final training within the leveling up module. And <laughs> it's funny because Danko wrote an entire book on the art of focus. And the truth is, I don't think it's that complex. Like, we're going to go through this, but some simple principles that you need to use to get focus into your life, because in a world of distraction, your dream life can be found in mastering the art of focus. Okay, so let's just talk about just a basic understanding of like what takes away our focus. So this is the called the triune brain theory. 
So it's this idea that the brain is made up of kind of three main constituents or kind of areas. Uh, the lizard brain. So this is to do with your fight or flight response. So this is your autopilot. So this is your decision making that is done automatically without you thinking about it. This is if what to do when you get mugged on the street, you fight or run. Simple, fight or flight. Mammal brain, this is the limbic system. So this controls emotions, memories, habits, and your decision making. And the human brain, the neocortex, which is uh, around language, abstract thought, imagination, consciousness, reasons, and rationalizes. And this is a word that you will have seen loads, dopamine. And dopamine is the currency of desire. Now, when if you think back to a couple of trainings ago, and I talked about the idea that humans are target-seeking uh, creatures based around, uh, from the book Psycho-Cybernetics, which is that we, when we have a goal, we go towards it. And this is the this is this is the chemical that is underpins everything all of that is dopamine dopamine is involved in absolutely everything that we do as humans pain perception working memory compulsion sleep wake cycles starting movement learning drug misuse and addiction breast milk <laughs> reward and motivation hallucinations and paranoia mood repetitive behavior attention and vigilance. It's involved in everything. Your ability to focus is dependent on your ability to moderate your access to dopamine triggers. So your ability to focus is based on your ability to moder moderate your access to things that trigger the release of dopamine. So there are, in my opinion, the five horsemen of elite focus. Mindfulness, time management, goal setting and deadlines, environment and technology. First up, mindfulness. So this is you being aware and mindful of your current situation, of your your current emotive emo, um, emotional state, your current energy levels, your current just feelings about what what are you doing right now? And you need to have mechanisms and systems that help you tease out, like, what are your thoughts so that you can order and you can add some order into the chaos that is inevitably our minds. So some of the methods that I use every day, well, I use all of these methods every day. So journaling, so brain dumping, thought synthesis. Now, um, I think that's the first spelling error I've had so far. So. That sucks. Um, journaling is a process that I do every morning, but I do it in, as you'll see in a second, in the Creator OS uh, demonstration, when we talk about action, I do it every morning in a very specific process. But then I do brain dumping um, when I'm feeling Typically, when I'm getting to that point where I need to re-reflect and set new targets and new goals, which maybe happens monthly, once a month, once every quarter, like, and that's really just getting all of this, all of my thoughts and ideas and just fucking throwing it all down. And this is a, the best way if you are, for me now, I do live in, I'm very fortunate that I live, I, because I've gone through this process of figuring stuff out, trying stuff out. I I now operate with quite a lot of clarity, a huge amount of clarity, which means that I can pretty much, I can start my week with a clear idea, really without putting much thought into it of what I need to get done. And then getting a load of work done, almost operating on autopilot because I have so much clarity. But you may not be there yet. And there have been times when I haven't had that clarity and what I've done is to gain clarity, I've had to dump everything out. And so if you're feeling this, if you're ever feeling overwhelmed, if you're ever, the, the best, the best thing to do is to just get a pen and a notepad and write a bunch of lists, 
Just fucking dump it all down onto paper and you will immediately feel better. Immediately. That's a promise. Meditation. Mental hygiene. Now, this is something that I've... The first time I did meditation properly was when I was in my first year after graduating as a dentist. I was in my first job and I used to do some, I used to practice meditation at lunchtime, do like 15 minutes, 20 minutes of like transcendental meditation. And I think I, I didn't understand, I didn't really understand things by that. What I understand now is that when we live in this like world of chaos and inputs, infinite inputs through these things, triggering our dopamine responses, that you have to carve out periods of time to settle the chaos in your mind. And so what I like to do is I, instead of doing like a block of an hour of meditating, which I'm definitely, it's funny. It's like, it's one of these things that the, the, you know, the, the meditating, uh, the meditation gurus will say, you know, pe- people will say, if you feel like you're overwhelmed and you've got loads of things going on, you, sh- you need to spend more time doing meditation. I t- totally agree with that. But when, especially in this period, the period, the early phase of you building your, your business where you've got lots of things to have to balance, you've got a life, you've got kids, you've got whatever, finding and carving out a full fucking hour. I mean, you can't. You just, that's just not realistic. So I look at it a bit differently. So I look at meditation as cumulative, accumulating time throughout the day, throughout over a, the awake, the waken, the hours that I'm awake. So I try and accumulate as much time as possible. And so I do this in the mornings. I do this in the shower, five minutes of just breath work. And then at the gym, I go to the sauna and I do 20 minutes in there. And that is again, breath work and focusing on my breathing. And that leads to, you know, that is linked to breath practice. And so, and then I also do this on walks. So I go for walks in the morning. So I have a half an hour walk in the morning before I start work. So again, like I'm basically, and then in the afternoon, I'll again aim to go out and do an hour walk. So I'm accumulating, I'm accumulating time for me during the day. And the idea is that you just want to give yourself time to be in your own thoughts. And so I don't do it in kind of one block. I do, you know, the best, the best is through walking, um, and in the sauna. So I do, I probably get an hour, a couple of hours worth of mindfulness and every day and then prayer and gratitude and connection. So I pray morning, evening, and I have a gratitude journal that I fill in every morning. So I'm doing that every single day. Time management. So this is something that we'll dive into in depth in the next module, which is uh, you will see my winning the week method. So it's a method for uh, based on the book, winning the week, which is a method for you to review and plan your weeks and to prioritize what you're going to work on. And it's made up of like time management is made up of reflection. So what have you done in the previous week? Estimating time for how long and what you need to get done next week. Work blocks, so blocking off work for your priority work. This is really critical to minimize task switching. You lose a lot of mental energy when you have to switch between different types of tasks. So this is why I don't do any calls in the mornings. So I have no calls before 1 p.m. And I do all of my calls in the afternoon. And so my mornings are for deep work, for deep focus, and then my afternoons are for calls, connection. And calendar protection. This is something that I 
protect my calendar at all costs because my calendar is my time. And so if you don't protect your calendar, who will? And I use a timer. So I've got a little kitchen timer that I use um, if I'm really wanting to get stuff done. I don't use it all the time, but when I'm really looking to like get a lot of stuff done, um, I set myself a timer to just force myself to get things done in a certain amount of time. Goal setting and deadlines. So you'll be maybe be familiar with the idea of smart goals. Um, very corporate. But again, as I've said before, sometimes there is merit to how to the corporate stuff. Uh, so smart goals, you need to have a goal that is specific. So outcomes, not tasks. So what are we trying to get done? What is the result of the inputs that we're putting in? Measurable, they need to be quantifiable. You need to quantify the results. Achievable, they need to be realistic. You actually need to be able to get it done. Like it's no point saying, oh, I'm gonna build a, let's build a $1 billion company in the next year. It's not realistic, but it does need to be challenging. It needs to push you outside of your comfort zone. So it needs to feel scary. And this is what I do with my goals. I just put some fucking slightly ludicrous goals, but I know that they are eventually I can get there. I just don't know how long it's going to take me to get there, but that doesn't matter. And relevant. Do they move the mission forward? Is this actually going to move me towards my end, my ultimate goal? And time bound. This is fucking critical in solo in the solopreneurship phase when you are working on your own is when you do not set deadlines to get stuff done, things will just f like you will just not do things as fast as you can and they will just drag and drag and drag. So the biggest recommendation I can, I'll make to you is prioritize really what is the priority project that you want to work on for the month or quarter, whatever, if it's going to take maybe dozens of hours or whatever, like for me, this putting together this, this program course material has taken hundreds of hours. And so I've had to let other stuff fall off, which is content production, content creation, so that I could get this stuff done as a priority. But I set myself a deadline. I said, this is the date that it needs to get done by and I'm on track. So you need to use deadlines and hold yourself to those deadlines. And finally, like environment. So tidy home, to tidy mind. Keep your shit tidy, declutter, get rid of the bullshit. Noise, noise cancelling headphones. Um, this is something that I use all the time. Focus triggers, no words, music. So don't use, mu don't listen to music with words in it. Stimulants, I use caffeine and nicotine. So I use, you know, there's a the disclaimer here or the, the warning is that nicotine is obviously highly addictive and um, I use it strategically. So I use the like little millet pouches um, and occasionally gum and I use it once in the morning, once in the afternoon to lock in and do not disturb. My phone is permanently on do not disturb mode permanently. And I, you know, I know there will be some of you which this, you know, if you have family, you have, that can't be the case, but just make people aware. You can set some kind of limits and stuff, but like consider it. Technology. So again, use do not disturb, own your attention. Don't let people own you. You can turn your phone to grayscale, reduces dopamine trigger. I've tried this. I just, I feel like I've, I've gone, gone pretty good at moderating my usage. One thing I've used that has been really, really good is unhook. It's a Google Chrome extension that allows you to, when you go onto YouTube, um, it comes up with just, you can set it so that it doesn't come up with any recommendations. So remember, YouTube is trying to grab your attention and suck it, suck it up by basically feeding you recommendations of things it knows that you want to, you want to watch. And so you can literally take it off by uh, toggling this uh, this Google extension on, and then it will remove. It'll just have a blank, the white blank screen. So it's actually fucking amazing how it works. Uh, works very, very well, and is amazing at stopping from you from sucking into the YouTube vortex. And then finally tracking. 
Like, how are you tracking this stuff? And I have a solution for you. And it's called the Creator Operating System. And that is what we're going to dive into next. We are going to design your dream life using the Creator OS Notion dashboard. So I will see you there. Okay, so you've done the self-discovery work, I hope. You understand the fundamentals of what is required to level up. And now it's time to put all of this together and actually design the life of our dreams. This is where you're gonna build a vision of your dream future, and you're gonna lay down the path for you to walk to turn that dream into a reality. Now, it's taken me, took me three years to build, test, and refine, but I have built this process into an easy to follow system and a workflow that's gonna help you at the start of every quarter to do this. So many of the largest creators have built and they sell Notion dashboards for over a hundred bucks and they make a lot of money through them. And I know that because I've seen, I paid for them and tested many of them. And most of them, if not all of them, absolutely suck because it's clear they don't use them. The Creator OS Notion dashboard not only is free, but it's exactly what I use to run my life and business every single day as a creator. It's how I craft my vision, align my mission, vision, and values for my business, set my goals, plan my quarterly projects, research, plan, and create across all of my content platforms, and most importantly, review, track, and act on a monthly and a quarterly cadence. Remember, your business is merely a reflection of the inputs you put into this system. This is a system that allows you to get crystal clarity on what you need to focus on and critically plan and act those inputs out every week and every day. This has absolutely transformed my life and I really hope it will do the same for you too. So let's dive in to Creator OS. Right, champs, here we are. So this is the kind of updated training for the Creator OS Notion dashboard. So as you can kind of see here now by this uh, video, we've had nearly 400 people watch this, which is amazing to me um, because I created this system because it solved the biggest challenge that I had in my life, which was being able to have one just simple location to run my life and business. And one of the biggest challenges that I've found with Notion over the years, I've used Notion now for about four years, and it is it can be a victim of its own sophistication. So Notion has a huge amount of uh, features and things that allow you to do some really cool stuff. Um, one of the main things is being able to link databases together, uh, which we're going to talk about here today. Um, but the biggest, the biggest challenge was that you could get lost in the complexity. And all I wanted was just one single pay place where I could plan, manage, track my life and business, just one place. And I found over the years I've used and tested and tried out numerous different versions of dashboards and te templates from some of the biggest creators in the world. And it became really clear to me when I used them that these people didn't use them. Like they were designed in such a complex or uh, they were either too complex, so you had to have multiple, like multiple pages, like locations within locations, um, and it just, yeah, it just wasn't a vibe for me. And so I've kind of worked really hard, and it's taken me three years to refine and build this system because it, I actually used it. And so it's taken me a long time to get here, but I'm really 
personally really proud of what I've managed to build because it solved the biggest problem that I had. And some from feedback from uh, the first kind of like batch of people who, that have used it over the past few months um, has been amazing. Like uh, it had had the the biggest effect that I wanted, which people was to pe people to actually use it and um, use it every day. That's the the key thing is that this is this is a place where you can come and this is like your your place where you feel like you have crystal clarity and you feel like you have control because that's the biggest thing ultimately that we're looking for is that when we've got loads of things that we're managing, loads of projects, loads of tasks, um, just really want one simple home base that you can come and just be like, okay, we're good. We know what we're doing this week. We're going to get it done now. And really happy with what I've built here and I've worked hard to now turbocharge this to make it a place where you can really craft and design your dream life. And so this is why this module of this course is around using this system to design your dream life, which I know if you use it to the way that I'm going to demonstrate to you, uh, you will have the same, same, same results. So I'm going to, there's just this first video. I'm going to give you just a quick walkthrough over the general, uh, gen general out outline of how it's been designed and the kind of thesis around it. Um, so just thinking if I need to cover anything else, I think we're good. So let's dive in. So this notion dash dashboard has been carefully designed to be the only resource you would need to dream plan and create your dream future as a creator. This has been designed and this is a really critical understanding of this is that this, this has been designed to be used for only three months at a time. And what you do at the end of your end of every three months is you start again. But what you do is I'm going to, I'm going to show you in the next video is you can link probably the only database that you need to, to link, which is content, it's your content calendar and your content database. Um, that's the only thing that you need to take, take across to your new one. And the idea is that it's supposed to get you to start from scratch every three months. So you're really not just like you're reflecting and reviewing what you did in the last three months, taking that information and now refocusing and targeting for the next three months. So really key idea is that you will create a new version of this every three months. And what I'm going to do is, is I will be updating this every three months. So before, um, before kind of like a couple of weeks before the end of the quarter, I will be updating this. I will actually be updating this, uh, the kind of template constantly, um, in the background and you'll always get the updated version. So it's not like the idea is that actually this isn't, this probably is 95% of what it will always be because I don't think it's like, uh, it needs to be more complex than it is. Um, I think that's the, the benefit of this. So understand that you will create a new version of this every three months and you will drag copy stuff that you've done from on the previous version, drop it into the new one and get going again. So you start fresh every three months. And this is really important. So you can realign your goals and, uh, yeah, go again. So you will need to duplicate and start from scratch at the beginning of each quarter, dream big crystallize your vision, create your game plan for each quarter, month and week, take action on the most important tasks every single day. And, um, I'll probably be getting rid of this video at some point and maybe, uh, probably adding this one in, uh, or might be the next video I'll add in here, which is how to link your old database, but the training will be in the school community, in the classroom, as you're watching this now. So let's just kind of go over this, uh, generally how this is set up. So. I'll just talk, I'll just uh, say this quote. So when it feels scary to jump, that's exactly when you jump. Otherwise you end up staying in the same place your whole life and that I can't do. And that's a quote from a dude in a film. I don't even know what film it is, but I've seen it as a kind of a, uh, it's from o Oscar Isaac who says it and I love it. 
So what is this made up of? Um, so I'll kind of go through all of these and we'll go through all of these one-on-one -on -one and each, uh, each video, there's going to be a video for each one of these. So there's an individual training because they need to, each one deserves its own training. But there are three sections. There is the dreaming section. This is where you will visualize your dream life, self-discovery exercises, idea generation, identifying who you need to become, mission, vision, and values, crafting your new identity, minimum viable offer worksheet, ideal customer avatar worksheet, the three alarms method, winning the week method, and the vision board. Then there is the planning section. This is where you will plan and engineer your dream life. Goals, revenue tracker, content research, quarterly networking tracker, quarterly projects. And then there is action. This is you actually doing the shit. This is where you will act like the person you want to become that you've designed in your dream life design. This involves idea capture. So this is the idea capture bank where you will have all your notes. So your second brain, new standards tracker, weekly outcomes planner, content power station. So this is how I've designed this is that it is all in one place. So it's all on one page. Whereas people have designed these things where it's like you have to go into pages. And I think the less when you're running your life, the less friction there is to get access to the information you need to get access to as fast as possible, the better. And uh, I've built this so that it's, um, let's move this out of the way. You can see there's also an easy, quick access. So this is how I also navigate to areas. So if I want to get to my content calendar, just click on that and it goes to my content calendar and, um, all designed to get, to be very easily accessible. So you can see we've got mission, vision, and values, vision board. And the idea by the way, is that every day when you scroll down to your action, you get reminded of your vision, your mission, vision, and values of your vision board, who you want to become, what does you, what do you want your reality to look like or what will it look like? And then planning. So quarterly snapshot, your goals, you'll get reminded of your goals. You've got your revenue tracker, content research. So looking and finding winning ideas from existing creators. So let's move this out of the way. Quarterly networking tracker. So just highlighting people that you want to, to meet and speak to. And this is a really critical part that people miss out is that social media needs to be social from a creator perspective. You need to meet with people. Um, so we've got that. We've then got our quarterly projects. So highlighting what projects we are going to, uh, to be working on and prioritizing them, the status of them and what department they sit under and then deadlines and estimating. This is critical estimating how many hours it's going to take and monthly quarterly review. So the review process is really important and this is how you do it. Um, and then at the end of each quarter, you're going to do a quarterly review and we'll go through this. So each one of these is going to be an individual training, short training, just to go through how I do it. And then your action station. So reminding yourself of your new standards. So what are your new health standards, wealth standards, relationship standards? Then the, this is the real kind of like, this is where you come every single day, um, to track and plan and get the tasks done. So this is the outcomes. This is what you're actually going to get done. So amateurs talk about tasks, professionals talk about outcomes and then your content power station. So this is a methodology that I've used to, to create content that I'll walk you through and then the content calendar itself. So again, all on one easy to access page. So you're not clicking into different sections all the time. Um, really, really key and critical. And that's it. So this is the kind of the intro video. And then the next one, what we're going to do is I'm going to talk to you in the next video about how, how to migrate, um, how to link your old, uh, your kind of like old databases, uh, from your other, your old dashboard, because you're not going to delete it. You're just going to have it as a, uh, as you're going to basically on the left-hand side down here, you're going to have all of your old creator OS notion dashboards. You're just going to set store these over time and it'll be sick.
So let's get into that. Okay, so one of the, like I said, the, the key idea is that you create a new one of these every three months. So I'm gonna show you how I do it and how you can do it and keep, keep things really simple. There are really only like uh, a couple of areas that you will need to, what I call, they're, they're databases essentially, that you need to migrate over to your new Create OS dashboard. So I've got the new template. So I've obviously, this is the template. Um, and so what I'm gonna show you the process of creating the uh, your new version. So once you've, you're gonna go to the link in your emails or wherever, like in, it's either gonna be the link um, will be somewhere on this on, in the classroom that you can get the new version of the template. You're gonna go and duplicate that template. Um, so uh, what that is gonna look like. So I'm gonna show you view site. So this will take me take you to the template. So what you do is that you then open this up, uh, make sure you're signed in. So I'm not signed in right now. Um, uh, so I'm, but it will, if you're signed in on desktop, so you need to be signed in on a desktop and there's gonna be a button here which says duplicate um, or, no, no, here you go, <laughs> duplicate. So you click on that and that's gonna duplicate this template into your own Notion dashboard. Um, and so this is going to be what it looks like so that you, you'll then have your own template that you can customize. And that is a key idea here is that you need to customize, you can customize all of this. So I'll show you my current Q1 2024. So you can see my version looks will look different because I've customized it. So change, change things, make it look like yours, like change the icon, change the header, like make this yours. Um, and so that's why mine looks a, a little bit different. I've customized mine. And that's the idea is that you need to customize yours too. Make it yours, own it. Okay, so there are three main areas or one, so you can see here I've got slightly different things. I've got links to, um, I've got a, a page with my workout. So I'm gonna show you how I move everything over. So here I've got the, the ones that I'm gonna move over into my new one. So this is my old one. So first up, I'm just gonna rename this. So let's rename this to Q2 2024. So here you go, Q, Q, Q2 2024. And we need to bring across a few different databases. So I'm going to go back to the old one. And so what are the what are the databases that we need to move over? So first up is idea capture. So this is my idea capture. So this is my just dump. This is remember, this is my dumping ground for ideas. This is where I will drop ideas and just have I've got fucking loads and loads of ideas. So if this is when I'm listening to a uh, podcast, audiobook, or whatever, I'm on a walk, and I, an idea comes to my head, and I'm like, get it down. So I'm going to go and just at the top here, I just drop it in. And there are some sections in here. If we go to the old one, there are some sections in the idea capture bank. So this is your dumping ground for ideas. Therefore, feel free to treat it like a dump. That's what I do. So it's supposed to be untidy, organized, and messy on purpose. And it's a place for idea capture only. Um, and you'll then refine ideas in the content calendar section of the dashboard. And so this idea capture bank is made up of two sections. One, the I didn't know that section. So this is where you'll drop ideas where, that you learned for the first time. And if you're like, hmm, if that is new for you, the, the thought you need to have is that will therefore be new news to someone else. And so if it's interesting and useful for you, then this is a, a great way to just get a bank of ideas, which are like sick. So this is the first section. I didn't know that section. So this is where you'll drop ideas that you learn for the first time, because if it was new to you, it will be new to others. Lessons, hacks, frameworks, stories, whatever, just list them in here. So you have an easy place to bank them, to bank them. So this is a cheat code for creating potentially viral content topics. Because again, if it's new to you and interesting to you, it'll be new and interesting to other people. Every time you learn something that makes you go, huh, I haven't heard that before. Make the next move you do to put it in here. Open this on your phone. And I have a shortcut on my phone on my, I've got a bunch of Notion shortcuts. There you can see workouts, my do dashboard, my second brain notes, and then idea capture. So within one tap, it opens up this page and then 
I get it. Why isn't this focusing? There you go, back. So you can see just a few ideas here. And then we've got the ideas capture section. And this is where you just dump anything that you can learn. So if I go back to mine, you can see it's just a load of ideas, just a dumping of ideas. And you've got my idea, my didn't know that section here. So loads and loads of like, didn't know that I'm just building that bank up of ideas. So this is one, this is one database. This is going to be a forever database where you will migrate it to your new dashboard. So let's show you how to do that. So we go to first up, what we're going to do is we're going to tag, we're going to tag this with a, uh, just with a simple, like Tom, for example, because I have like loads of pages and notes in my notion. And so this makes it easy to search. So then we're going to go to the new one and here we're going to say, we're going to press the, the, the forward slash um, and going to search for link to a page. And then I'm going to search for idea capture Tom and it comes up immediately and I'm just going to click bang and there you go. It's there. And so I'm going to drag that to the top and I'm going to delete this and I'm not going to delete this because this is the template. So I don't want to delete this, but that's how you then, that's how you link your, your database to the, to your new template. So I'm going to get rid of this and then you do the same for second brain. So your notes, so you're going to go my second, oh, so link to page, link to page, my second brain, Tom. And again, I'm just going to drag that to the top. Okay. So those now my old database from my old um, dashboard, which I'm not going to delete. I'm not going to delete my old dashboard. That's just going to stay stored down at the bottom. You're just going to store that and then it's here. So then again, just going to delete that because I don't want you to see my, my notes. <laughs> um, and then what are the other areas that you need to move across? So it's idea capture bank, my second brain. And then if I go over to here, I've got a couple of other areas that I will migrate over. So I've got my workouts so they can be, they'll be in the, um, on my one, you can see they're in my, uh, uh, my kind of index over here. And then I have got, then the only other thing to move across. So if I go to mine, I've got, I've also got notes for creator launch specifically. So you can create your own notes for whatever your business. So I have a business notes brain, um, and then I have my kind of like general notes taking. And then it is a case of the only other place thing to move across is your content calendar. So your content calendar, and again, this is my content calendar on my, uh, my, uh, old, this is my new dashboard. So I'm going to go to my old dashboard and I am going to open this up, go down to my content calendar and you can see what I've done is I have uh, tagged it COS, create OS. So this is my existing dashboard. Um, so you can see all of my, my content planned. Um, and I'm going to, so I've tagged it. So what we're going to do is going to go to the new one. So Q2 and it's going to go down to the bottom where I've got the old content calendar or the kind of like, uh, content database here, and I'm going to add my new one. So we are going to forward slash and we are going to scroll down in this instance, we're going to go down to database in line. So we're going to add the database in line into, into here. Um, and we're going to go and, oh, sorry, no, we're not going to add a new one. We are going to. Actually, what we are going to do is we're just going to copy and paste this over. So the way we do this is we open another tab. So we've got two tabs open. We are going to go to our old template. Uh, so this is my one. And then again, I'm going to scroll down to my content calendar. So actually what we'll do is we'll scroll down to my content calendar. You can see all my stuff. And 
I'm going to go copy. So I just click on the, the thing over here, copy, control C, command C, whatever it is. And then come over here and then just going to go paste. Let it load because it might be a little bit heavy. So it might take, a, might take a few seconds to do this because it's got a lot of data inside it. So it's duplicating all that data. And then it should, in a few seconds, drop a, uh, a version, your old calendar, which is your database. Uh, because this is the, the big question when people, when creators are making content, it's like, where are they going to store it? Well, this is where you store all of your content. It's in, this is a database which you can have different views of. Um, so I did this the other day and it took a, took a few seconds for it to load, uh, but it should get there eventually because it's got a lot of data in it. And then what we do is we just delete this one. So super simple. We're just going to delete this one. So you can see it's just loading. It's going to take a little bit of time. And then this is the only other thing that you need to, to do is then you've got your, your content database into your new template. Um, and yeah, this is clearly going to take a little bit of time. Um, and then you'll be good to go. And, uh, this is it. Like this is, uh, that's all you need to do to move over migrate over your new stuff. Um, so yeah, clearly this is going to take a little bit longer than expected, uh, but expect it to. And I'm going to pause this. Right. So nearly there and you can go and make a cup of tea during this process because that literally took like five minutes to load up. So <laughs> it's going to take a few minutes. Um, so be patient. And then once I've, uh, like once I've shown you this, um, I kind of explained to you, uh, very quickly how the benefit of this, uh, so here you go. This is now my content calendar. That is my database. This is my database of, it's not just a calendar. It is a database of all of my content. So if I go to my list view, you can see all of my content and again, how I've tagged it. Um, I will have every quarter I go through and put all of the links to all of these posts. So you can see, I've got, um, uh, YouTube videos. I've got, uh, written posts. I've got my newsletter. I've got, um, short form content. So I've got all of it in one place which is incredible. So I can have access to it. And then as you know, like we can go and just see all of the great posts that you've made, what to, to, uh, I, what to iterate ideas off. So this is sick and I'm fucking stoked that I came up with this because I haven't seen anything like this. And most people will fucking charge you hundred, a hundred plus dollars for a dashboard like this and they don't even use it. And it is nothing like this because it's not even usable. This is absolutely sick. And I'm, so glad that I have this. So I hope that you, you're going to have this. So this has now got my database. Um, and now, uh, there are a couple of other areas. I realized that you might want to migrate over from your old dashboard. So a couple of the different areas that you might want to do the same process is vision board. So again, all you do is you just go copy. So click on that thing, copy, and then you come to the new one and then you press control V and paste, and then it's there. So um, vision board might be one area, mission, vision, and values might be one. Um, and then goals potentially I'll let you decide what you want to migrate over to your, to your new one, but it's a super simple, it's just copy and pasting or, um, for your notes, it's just, uh, doing the linking process. So super, uh, super, super simple process. And I'm now going to delete this. So delete and we are back and I will change this back to create OS. And so that is how you, uh, that's how you, uh, will migrate your old, your kind of like your, it's not even your old, it is your databases. So your databases for notes, content, uh, vision board, you can just literally just copy and paste it or link it over to your new one. And like I said, you don't delete your old dashboard. You just store it, you save it like you would 
have a notebook that you will just collect over the years. You have a, you will build up a stack of quarterly dashboards and you will have everything. Is that my, that's my speaker. Um, sick. And, uh, that is, that is how you do that. So let's, uh, dive into the next one. All right. So we are now on to the process of dream life design, and this is a follow on from the self discovery, understanding yourself module, where you have gone through a bunch of exercises, which I'm going to show you, and you'll have gone through in the, um, on, on create OS. So they are located. The self discovery exercises are located in here. So in this page. So this is all of the exercises that you need to go through. And there's also a link to an incredible audiobook series called Reality Transurfing, which is a bit of an iconic book in the self-development space. This is how you can design your destiny. So I would highly recommend you go do that. You can get the link, link to the audiobook course is in school in the classroom. And this is the first process that you need to go through. So there's the exercise, the Ikigai exercise, the purpose test, personality test, genius test, your past behaviors. So highlighting your past behaviors, the eight questions exercise and your mission, vision and values. So you need to complete all of this stuff and then we're on to dream life design. So let's go back to this. And then uh, the only other one is you have the idea generation worksheet, which is the final part of the self discovery. So you go through the idea generation and again, do all that. And then we are on to dream life design. And the first, very first thing that you need to do during dream life design is you need to identify who the hell you need to become. So I have got a simple worksheet for you to go through this process. So identifying who you need to become, let's make this full size. So look, the cheat code to changing your life is finding someone or a collection of people that you relate to are inspired by and think are living an impactful and meaningful life. And then you need to reverse engineer how they got there. And you do that by highlighting their skills, their character traits and their beliefs. And important to note, the aim is not to become this person. You are using it as an anchor in the future, a future anchor to start moving your life forward. And remember you are the niche. So we are just using it as a way to highlight what skills we need, what character traits we need, and what beliefs we need to move our life into our dream future. It starts by gathering skills, evolving your character traits and building new belief systems. So this is how you're going to do this. Which key opinion leaders, thought leaders, niche experts inspire and motivate you? Who are the people in the public, in the public space who you resonate with? You know, for me, it, it is, it's like, it's Tim Ferriss. Alex Hormozy. Naval Ravikant. You know, who are the people that inspire you? Who is it? Who are these people? Um, so you need to, you need to do this. You need to go through this process and highlight who it is and just make a long list, a long list. It could be as many as, as many people as you want. Then you need to highlight what skills do these people currently have? What do they currently have? So what do skills does Tim Ferriss have? What skills do Alex Hormozy have that you don't? And you need to list as many of these as possible. So skills are what you will need to learn. These are the things that you're going to need to learn over the next decade to move your life towards the life that these people currently live. And again, the idea is not to be them. The idea is to collect skills that they have that you currently don't. The same for character traits. So what character traits do these people have that you currently don't? List the character traits that these people have that you currently don't have. So what are character traits? So character traits are defined as the individual qualities or attributes that make up a person's overall character. These descriptions can be physical, emotional, mental, or moral. And I've linked to a page where there's a list of character traits for you to select and list them here. Then what beliefs do these people have that you currently don't have? List the beliefs that these people have that you currently don't have. A belief is something that you believe or accept as true. 
You might believe something based on a fact, an opinion, or an assumption. What do these people believe that you currently don't? Now, these are commonly beliefs around the core of what you need to become that you grew up with. And, you know, for me, a, the common example that I've already talked about is this idea that I grew up in a household where money was considered evil and business was considered evil. And so I've had to wash away by those beliefs through education and understanding, well, what is money? Money is just energy. It is just a source of energy flow. And that there are incredible people doing incredible things. And I would say that entrepreneurship is the only thing that moves humanity forward. It is, it literally is. So what are the beliefs that you need to, to get? And that is the identifying who you need to become. Okay. On to the next step. Okay. So once we've done the self-discovery and the identifying who you need to become. So once we've done this, the next step is then to craft our new identity. And this is the worksheet that I've got to help you go through this process. Let's make this small. So James Clear, author of Atomic Habits, you do not rise to the level of your goals. You fall to the level of your systems and systems ultimately are standards. These are what determine your standard, your systems determine your standards. This is why we build systems into our life. And the idea that you are the architect of your life and you have to really understand that you can and will design your future, because if you don't, the world will tell you what you want you to be. Humans have the ability to hack their life by living in a state of belief that the dream is already reality. And you'll see that in the next training, this understanding that your vision of your future is just a reality that exists, but it's just further along in the timeline. And this is a key concept in the idea of reality transurf transurfing, the audiobook series and the, and the book that kind of walks you through this process of understanding that we have multiple different timelines and we get to choose to which timelines to navigate through and transurf. So by getting a clear vision of your dream life, getting specific about what it looks like and practicing feeling the emotions of that reality and the feeling of gratitude, a really key part of this process, which is why the very first part of my journaling that I have in this system that you'll see is the going through the process of gratitude. And you can turn your dreams into reality given enough time. So reminder, this is the dream cycle. You go from dreams to vision to goals, action, results, and beliefs, and it's a cycle. So step one is reflecting and reviewing your current reality. So reflecting and reviewing your current reality is critical in being able to highlight the behaviors, habits, and standards that you default down to, and the, the sum total of where, you're, where you currently are in life. This is the process of self-discovery and the self-discovery exercises that you go through here, okay? And once you've done that, step two is crafting your new identity. And this is a four step process of reviewing your current reality, crafting your new identity, creating your vision board, creating your new identity statements and affirmations. So first up is reviewing your current reality. So this is taking all of the, um, this is really looking at things at a very high level. And again, when I've gone through this process, this takes, this might take a day to go through this. This could take two, could take multiple days. So spend the time, like if you're going through this and you're like, fuck me, this is taking a long time. Fuck yeah, it is. Like, yes. Like what is the cost of like spending a couple of days thinking about how you want your future to look like in the grand scheme of your life? Like if you, if you don't, you will not get to any sort of vision of your dream future. So s lean into how long this takes, the longer, the better. So describe your current rea identity and reality in a few sentences. Literally just describe your life. Just do it. Just describe it. Where do you currently live? What is your home like? So what does your home look like now? You know, where are you living? How much money do you currently make? How much money do you have saved? What are your good habits? What behaviors serve you well? What are your bad habits? What behaviors do you default down to? Remember, 
in the process of leveling up, we hit a, um, we hit a, our, our comfort ceilings. So we have our comfort zone and we hit a comfort ceiling and then our comfort ceiling knocks us back down to our default standards. And so what we need to do is over time, we need to raise our default standards up and up and up. And we, that, that's the process of crush, crushing through our comfort zones. What is your current comfort ceiling? So what are your bad habits? Drinking, you know, used to be mine. Like every night I'd have a couple of beers, a glass of wine, a couple of glasses of wine, whiskey. Like <laughs> that was me being like, nope, you are hitting, heading towards your outside of your comfort zone. Stay comfortable. You know, for me as well, it's been vaping in the past. So a year ago or a year and a half ago, I was vaping every single day. It's horrible. These are the bad habits, which I now no longer have, but you need to highlight what they are. Could be food, could be vices, could be gambling, whatever the hell it is. Write these down. What are your positive character traits and abilities? What are your strengths? So I don't necessarily believe in strengths and weaknesses because I think everything can be learned. But like, what do you consider your strengths to be? What are your negative character traits? What are your weaknesses? So what are your weaknesses? And then what are you, what automatic negative thoughts, ants, pop up in your head on a day-to-day -day basis? These could be the sources of anxiety, stress, and overwhelm. So what are your automatic negative thoughts? Think about these things. So what are the things that pop up on a day-to-day -day basis that lead to anxiety, stress, and overwhelm? This could be fear. This could be, I don't have enough money. I can't pay my bills. This could be, um, one night this, remember, think this back, think back to the outwitting the devil training, which is these are essentially what are the thoughts that the devil is putting into your mind on a day to day basis when he's trying to, what, what are the tools that he, he is using to manipulate you into defaulting back down to your baseline standards? What was your childhood like? What past events do you worry about or replay in your mind occasionally or frequently? What things do you worry about in the future? What things block you from doing what you want to do each day and working towards your dreams and goals? Who are you currently angry at? What people or things do you blame? Who do you currently judge and what do you judge them for? What things do you love doing and could happily do every day? What things do you hate doing and never want to do again? What does the average day look like for you right now? From waking up, going to bed, be very specific, literally just write out, 7 a.m., 8 p.m., 8 a.m., 9, 9 a.m., like what does a day look like for you? And looking back in your life and childhood, what negative experience happened to you that you can look by, back on as lessons that helped you turn into the person you are? And these are the things that we will turn into stories that will help people learn to like us in our content. Okay, so that is step one. Next is you get to do all of that, but you get to design it for your future. <laughs> So again, this will take some time. Which public figures do you look up to, admire, and get inspired by? Again, that's the identifying who you need to become. What character traits do they have? What behaviors and habits do you assume they have or know they have that allow them to perform at the level they currently do? So these are the kind of skills. And skills, what skills do people have that are allowing them to be successful in what they currently do? What does your dream life look like in three years' time? Be very specific. So... Where are you going to be living? Where, where in the world do you want to be living? What does your home look like? How much money will you be making? How much money will you have saved? How will you be dressed? What is your health like? What will your body look like? And what will you be doing to stay in peak physical condition on a weekly basis? Are there material things that you desire? What will you have in three years? Cars, watches, jewelry, like just get specific. Who will you be working with? You know, who do you want your customers to be? Who do you want? Who do you want your uh, your colleagues to be? What are you going to be spending your time doing? Who are you going to be working with? Who do you not want to be working with? And what will your days be filled with? What will your lifestyle be like? Like, what do you want to be doing? What are your hobbies? What are the things you want to be doing? So envisage where you want to be three years from now. What are the big milestones that you'll hit on your path to getting there? For example, hit my first 10K month with my consulting business created my 100th video on YouTube, published my first, first book, list all of these things out. What are the skills you need to learn in the next three years to get you to that position? What do you need to learn? 
well, then you have it some behavior standards that you'll need to adopt to become that person in the next three years. You know, from a year and a half ago, when I was drinking, vaping, fat, I now don't do that stuff. So what current habits and behaviors of yours do you not meet those new standards? And then next is the creation process of your vision board. And this goes to, you have to have a clear mental vision of your future. And it's time to bring that future into reality. And in the next training, we're going to go through creating your actual vision board. So part, part one, who you must become to be worthy of your dream future. You must change your actions, habits, and behaviors. You can model these on people that inspire you. When faced with day-to-day -day decisions, you must ask yourself, what would X do in this situation? That's the easiest, you know, you will have, you've, I'm sure you've heard of what would Jesus do? It is the same, same thing. You need to ask this question, like what would Tim Ferriss do in a situation like this? What would Alex Hormozzi do in a situation like this? What decisions would they, would they make? Would they have the Snickers bar? Would they have the nine pints of Stella? Like what, what would they do? And then part two is what your dream future consists of. These are the material things that help you craft that clear vision of the future. These give you this, give you something to visually to latch onto. The key is practicing the feeling and emotions of already having these things. And you'll see this in the next, the next training, how I talk you through the process of what I do every day to do this. And then critically feeling grateful for already having them in your life, even though you don't have them now, you have them in your future and you have to be grateful for those things. Spend time finding images, social media, Google, Pinterest, Instagram, whatever, and to find images of the life and the person you wish to become. This could be images of homes, cars, people, art, clothes, whatever it is, just be specific. If you want a specific car, get an image of the exact model and color that you want. If you want a specific type of home, go to search some sites and find the exact home that you want. If you want to look a certain way, go and find images of people that have the body that you aspire to have. Get clear on what your future is going to look like. And once you have these images, you need to remind yourself of them every single day. And this is the process that I go through. And this is how I've built the uh, Create OS dashboard so that every day on the way down to your tasks, you go and spend some time looking at the vision of your future, looking at reminding yourself of your goals, your mission, your vision, and the actual specifics of your future. And I also have this on my lock screen on my phone. So very easy to have access to every single day. And then creating your new identity statement and affirmations. So the first thing that I do every morning is I open up my notes. I go to my creator OS. I click on that, tap it open. And let's just change this up. And I go down to here in my vision board and I click on this note, which is my reality. And this is a set of affirmations that I go through and I read. It takes me about 10 minutes every morning. I do that every morning and you need to do this too. Your new identity statement is the written down commitment or to the person that you wish to become. Once you have created your affirmations, you must read these out aloud to yourself every morning. You must read them with intention and whilst envision, envisaging, envisioning you in a situation where you have accomplished these, feel the emotions of having accomplished these. What does your future, what does that future version of you feel in those emotions? It must be read aloud whilst keeping a clear picture of the, the you achieving these in your mind. It will take practice, lots of practice, but what is better than practicing the vision of your dream life? Nothing. You must fill your body with an overwhelming feeling of gratitude as you recount these affirmations out loud. really important. So like I said, I have a shortcut and then here's mine. Like I've got mine here. You can read mine. Don't just copy mine, but you can access it there and see what I do and then just write yours out. And again, 
this will take hours. This process of crafting your new identity is going to take days to do. And do this outside of your... Don't do this where you work. Go and do this in a place like a coffee shop, uh, somewhere like go and take yourself out of your current reality and go and do this in a place that inspires you or gives you some energy and then gets you out of your day to day because you can really think big and this will take a time to do. Okay. And that is crafting your new identity. Okay. So once we've got a description and vision of our future, we then need to break this down into targets and goals. And so we go through a process of br breaking this down to goals and milestones. So that essentially goals are just milestones of, for you to get to that vision of your future. And those will constantly change over time. So this is a process that you go through multiple times and we break those goals then into projects. So first up is we're going to talk about goals. So we're going to go down to the goals section. Try here. And this is how I think about goals. So I think about goals as life changing targets. So your goals are just the target to achieve them. You must break those down to momentum building projects, which is the next stage that we'll go through after this training that will move you towards the target. There is only one type of goal, life changing goals. And these life changing goals must be broken down into momentum building projects that move you towards these goals. Critical. Your goals must be big and scary enough to feel impossible. This is the only way to make you wake up every morning feeling excited about attacking the projects to get you there. So I keep this quite simple. I have, life, I have health goals, wealth goals, and relationship goals. Relationship goals. And so quite simple, you just need to, you need to set a flag in the future and say, in five years, what do I want to be looking like? What do I want my health to be like? What do I want my wealth to be like? So th this is be specific, like how much do I want in cash in the bank? How much do I want my business to be doing in revenue? How much do I want my, uh, how much money do I want tied up in assets? Be super specific. How much do I want in a savings, emergency savings account? Like I have all of these things really broken down. Same for wealth, same for relationships. And then we're going to chunk it down into one year. So in a year's time, what is the milestone at the end of the year that feels scary? Scary, but if everything goes to plan, can be done. And let's just say, you know, I've the goals that I've set for a year, they are intentional that they will push me and there's a, a big a big chance that I don't reach them but I will there's a high chance that I get very close to them and maybe that goal doesn't get hit in a year but might get hit in a year and a half and so it's like realistic to you know might what can I really push myself to get done in a year but might take me a year and a half to get there okay so really kind of break this down into what do I want to, what can push me and compel me and excite me to wake up every day and attack these goals, because if they're not exciting and they're not scary, then you just fucking won't do them. And then we're going to chunk them down one level further into current quarter. So this is where things get really realistic. And so five year, one year, current quarter, and you're going to then turn these into projects. And that is what we're going to talk about in the next training. Okay. See you in the next one. Okay. So once we've gone through the process of highlighting our five-year goals, one-year goals, current quarter goals, we then need to turn these into momentum building projects. And this is the process that I, uh, I go through. So we're going to scroll down to the quarterly projects and you can see here quite simply, this is the like this is the simple process that you need to go through to highlight what projects you're going to work on in the next upcoming quarter. So there are three keys to making progress with projects that I found. One is estimating how much time they will take to complete. And 
adding these in hours, total hours, estimating the impact the project will have on moving your business forward, high, medium, and low impact, and giving a clear deadline and building this into your weekly review process and calendar to make sure you push yourself to get these things done. So deadline, impact, estimated hours. You can see I've got department in here. You can add your relationship goals. You can add your, uh, literally, you can just add whatever you want into here. Um, and then status. So what status are these at? And this is really the key is uh, how to prioritize what you're going to work on. And one of you know, the big recommendation I have is that you only focus on one core project per quarter and just try and get that done as fast as you can. So the one that's going to have the highest number of hours and impact. So you're going to look and say, how much impact and hours is this going to take? And get that one thing done, put it into your calendar, just smash it out as fast as you can and then move on to the next project. Don't just try and that what I do not do is I don't ha I don't run projects at the same time. I estimate what I want to do and I will know, I know, for example, and I'll show you, show you mine. So if I go to my one, so if we go down to projects, this is, these are my projects for the current quarter. And when I, this is what I highlighted at the start of the quarter projects that I, I brain dumped projects that are going to move me towards my one year goals and my quarterly goals, uh, my quarterly life changing goals. And I highlighted all of these things. Now there are one of the key things that I've, I will have spoken about is that how you need to be flexible, uh, occasionally with, with jumping on opportunities and trend jacking and uh, trend surfing. And so, you know, for this year, as an example, my, I, the big core project that I was going to get done is to complete the, uh, the create and launch program, the next version and refresh all of my assets and resources. And I knew that that was going to take me a long time. Now, the reality is, is this actually took me probably closer to a hundred hours, maybe 150. Um, and I've, the problem was is at the beginning of the year, um, I, Alex Hormozzi made an announcement about his investment in school. And what happened was, is my launching my school community was actually a Q, was going to be a Q2 project of mine. So I didn't even build that into my projects because that was going to be a Q2 project. But I saw the opportunity and I jumped on it. And instead of overthinking things, I just fucking jumped on it, opened, like launched my school community, made content and just jumped on that as fast as I could. And what that did is that that meant that my other projects shifted and it shifted by about six weeks. But I, so I didn't even have that in here. And so there's like some flexibility that you need to have as an entrepreneur is that you've got to take opportunities when they come and see them and follow your intuition and your gut feeling. You know, that's a really important thing is that you can plan all this stuff out, but if you're, you always go with your gut feeling on stuff. So always use your intuition and your gut. And I'm really glad I did because I followed my intuition and did exactly what I intended to do. But then what happened was that that pushed all of these other projects back by about six weeks. Um, and a lot of these things I will not get done in this quarter. You know, there's going to be a bunch of stuff in here. I will not get done. That's, that's great. That's fine. They, they then just get, I then will review. I will do my quarterly review. So my quarterly review process in here, I'll go through that process and then we will, um, we will then set the projects, uh, we'll review what projects need to get done and then build them into the next quarter. So the next plan. So that is how to do project design. Next one. Okay. Now it is time to get down into business, literally business. And, uh, this is where we start to pull all of this dis discovery and leveling up, uh, prep work into actually building our business because the core of our build business is us. And so we need to build a business based on the foundation of us. And so let's go through the process of how to do that. So. The way we do this is we have a minimum viable offer worksheet. So you'll have done the self-discovery exercises to understand what your niche could look like. You've done the idea generation worksheet to go through potential, potentially highlighting and ranking ideas. 
And the next stage is we're going to now wrap that up into a minimum viable offer. So let's go through this. So minimum viable offer worksheet. So this section is when you start to refine your ideas into something that can be sold as a high ticket product. So first up, we need to define the problem to be solved. So again, refer back to your, um, your, uh, the idea generation and, uh, the, uh, uh, mission, vision and values worksheet where we'll have talked about the potential problems that you can solve based on the problems that you see in the world. And the more accurately and vividly you can describe someone's problem, the more they trust you have the solution. So this is really key when it comes to messaging is that the more you're able to articulate the, articulate the problem that people have, if you can do, if you can articulate it better than they can even feel it, then they will trust you. They will trust that you understand them and their problems. So once you have taken this minimum viable offer and offered it to 30 people, you will come back and refine and this by creating another minimum viable offer, your V2. And this is a never ending process. So this is not something that you do once and then just it's done. This is something that you re revisit every quarter um, to really understand if your offer is hitting what it needs to be hitting within the market. So feel free to drop multiple ideas down. You just use this as a brainstorming opportunity. So what is the niche? In one sentence, what does your market really want? What is their current situation? Their point A, why did the people that I've worked with choose me? What is their specific desired situation? Point B, that they would give all their savings to achieve. What is the quantifiable outcome that they desire? Put a tangible number to this. Why did the people that I've worked with choose me? What is are the main problems in vivid detail? So what are the problems, all the areas of, that people are experiencing problems? So I'll use me, my offer as an example. So some of the main problems are people, uh, one person business owners struggle with getting leads for their business. They struggle with being able to articulate their offer in a way that is differentiated, powerful, and actually gets people wanting to work with them. They struggle with de delivery. So how do they migrate from one-to-one -one coaching or one-to-one -one consulting into a group coaching, group consulting uh, program? Um, how do they scale their business? How do they do sales? Like there's all of these problems that I help my students and solve. What is it costing them? So what are the consequences to stay where they are and not solving this problem right now? So this can be staying the same, having regret, time, money, health, relationships, and a combination of them. What do they think is holding them back from solving this problem? So skills, procrastination, clarity, fear, imposter syndrome, what is holding them back? What would it be worth to them to get them to their desired situation? What would their dream life look like if they achieved these desires? How would it change their life solving this problem? List these ideas down. What are the most niche participants? So what are potential clients doing to try and bridge their desired situation? What are all the other solutions out there? How well are they working for them? What are the tactics, methods, and systems, etc., that others try, but end up not working? Get granular here. You will call these out in your marketing messaging to get people to believe your unique mechanism is the answer to their, their problems. So for example, like me, most people, uh, I'm the anti-cold outreach dude. So organic cold marketing, like just alone sucks in my opinion. And my methodology is a hybrid approach where we do direct re direct response marketing in the form of uh, paid advertising alongside building a personal brand, building, doing brand marketing through organic content. So it's a hybrid approach where we, we're using all of the best elements of both so we get eyes on our offer and we build trust with our brand. Bam. As opposed to just people sending thousands of cold DMs or cold emails, which fucking sucks. So that is an example of one of the, you know, highlighting what other people are doing that don't, don't, what doesn't work. So what are most niche service providers? So what are your competition offering to participants to bridge to their desired solution? What other methodologies are people using? You know, I can, you know, for example, one is, um, so this is like for me, for me, one of, one of the alternative methodologies is setting up a cold email, uh, system where you create dozens of email addresses, set up 
dozens of email uh, accounts and send out, do list scraping of thousands of, of emails and then send out automated emails to thousands of people and just hope that eventually you get through to people. Um, the spray and pray approach, which is bullshit. <laughs> so what are other people doing? You know, how are other people trying to solve the problems that you solve? And then what are other niche participants, potential clients who are crushing it doing? What are the people who are fucking crushing it doing? How are they bridging the gap with the, with, to their desired situation and how well is it working for them? How is it different? So what are the best in the business doing? Based on the above, what is the minimum work possible that you could do to help your niche go from their current situation to their desired situation? So if you're doing done for you services, map out exactly what you'll be doing for them and how long it's going to take. If you're doing coaching, map out a six to 12 week program that you could achieve this with. And a key, a key metric here that doesn't get talked about enough is this idea of time to value. And this is when you first start working with someone, start working, working with someone with a new client. What can you do to get results fastest? This is something that I'm constantly going to be thinking about with my uh, service and my, my kind of offer is what can I do in the shortest amount of time that can get, get rapid time to value so that when someone starts working with me within ideally a week, two weeks, three weeks, you know, short period of time, they feel like they've made the, the investment back. That's the ultimate kind of emotion that you want. So this time to value idea. And then what time frame do you think it would take to achieve the desired situation in days? How long do you think it's going to take for you to get them results? And then what is fair, but still on the high side price that you could charge for this offer? It could be, you know, one and a half grand per month done for you service or two and a half grand coaching program. What does this look like? And this is where you need to do some research in the market. Go get on, go through sales process processes of competitors, go through their their, their processes and know what they're charging. That's the only way you do. You can find out what is the market, the market rate. Okay. And that is the minimum viable offer worksheet. Do this. Okay. So once we have done our minimum viable offer worksheet, so once we've gone through this process of highlighting this, we are going to then highlight and understand who our ideal customer avatar is. So this is the ideal customer avatar worksheet. Uh, and this, this is what AI thinks I look like, by the way. <laughs> so your business success is a reflection of how well you know your ideal customer. So be aware that the longer you operate, the better you will get to understand your ideal customer. But when you start, you need to make some assumptions about your ideal customer. So this worksheet will help you at least get a benchmark ideal customer avatar. Now, really key to understand, you cannot serve everyone. You can't serve everyone. And that's, that is the cheat code. The cheat code is you can't serve everyone, but it means you can serve a very, very specific type of person. And what your content does is it att attracts your ideal customer to you, but you need to be able to understand how to talk to, you need to know, understand the language that they use, the emotions that they have, the challenges that they, they are facing, the problems that they have. You get to choose who you want to serve. You get to choose who you work with. You get to choose who you spend your time with. How sick is that? How sick is that? Instead of being in a nine to five where you just get this dumped on you. So the better you deeply understand the circumstances, desires, fears, problems, challenges, preferences, behaviors, and habits of your ideal customer, the better you can craft content that sings to that person. Okay. So the better you understand this stuff, the better you can craft messaging and content that resonates with that person. Some of these questions you'll have already answered in the eight questions exercise from the self discovery exercises in the, un and in the, under in the understanding yourself module, refer back to those questions to complete this faster. 
Remember, this is also the case with B2B business services. You are trying to speak to a specific person within that business who ultimately may not be the end decision maker, but they will be the internal champion that pushes the decision makers to sign the contract with you. Go that, I'll go to, through that again. So in a business to business setting, when you're selling to businesses, you may, there are going to be multiple people within that organization that you need to convince in order for that contract to get signed. And there is going to be the champion of that deal, who is going to be the, the, your point of contact, your key point of contact. And you will need to work with them as a, in a partnership to push the opportunity, push the deal through in the business. And the, uh, the decision makers might be high, will be higher up in the organization and you need to work with the champion on doing that. And so remember your messaging and your content is going to need to have different levels to it so that you can speak to the champion, you can speak to the decision maker. Okay. So step one, demographic information. What is the age range of your ideal customer? So who is going to be making the decision here? So again, if you're in a B2B session, uh, B2B, um, uh, but if you're a B2B service provider, who is that champion? So what does the champion look like? You know, what is their role? Are they a head of marketing or are they a marketing manager? Are they director of marketing? You know, what si that depends on what size of business you target. So what does, who is that person? Are they typically female? Are they typically male? Who are they? Where does your ideal customer live? Country, city, rural area? What is their professional industry? What is their approximate income level? What is their highest level of education? You need to know this stuff. Psychographic information. What are their interests and hobbies? What the values and beliefs are important to them? What are their short-term goals and long-term goals? What are the challenges and pain points that your services can address? Describe their lifestyle. Are they busy professionals? Are they stay-at-home parents? Are they students? What, who are they? What are these people? Then behavioral information. So buying behavior, how do they typically make purchasing decisions? Online behavior, what social media platforms do they use? How do they typically consume online content? Videos, carousels, you know, like uh, day in the life, like what type of content is interesting to them? Communication preferences, how do they prefer to communicate? Email, phone, social media, what is their preferred channels of communication? Brand affinities, what brands or influencers do they follow and or admire? Who are the people that are interesting to them? Step four, emotional triggers. What are the deepest desires or aspirations of these people? What do they want to achieve? What pulls them? Really, really important that when you, when you get into the sales process, this is called the process of selling the vacation. So we, we, we are not product pushers. We are problem solvers and dream island destination givers. We give people the vehicle to get to their dream island. And you need to be able to articulate what does that island look like? What are their fears or insecurities related to your niche? What frustrates them about their current situation? What brings them joy or satisfaction in life? People buy with emotion. Your marketing messaging, your content, your sales process, Everything needs to speak to emotion because people, they buy, they make decisions with logic, they buy with emotion. So you need to be able to articulate this really well. Like arguably this is the most important part of this process. So list all these things out. Step five, putting it all together, give your ideal customer avatar a name to make them feel more real. Write a brief description that summarizes all the key demographic, psychographic, and behavioral traits of your ideal customer avatar. Find a representative image and just drop an image in here. Get, a, get an image of Karen in here. And then finally, reflection. So review. Take a moment to review your ideal customer avatar. Does it accurately capture the type of person you want to serve? Think about this. Does this picture, does this description really describe the person that wants you want to be your ideal customer? And then make any adjustments or additions to refine your avatar further. And again, this is something that you will refine over time. You'll need to come back over probably a couple of times a year and refine what this avatar looks like as you gather more data on your business and how you help people. Cool. That is your ideal customer avatar worksheet. Okay. Now on to the fun part, which is content creation. Okay. 
actually time to create. Now that we've done the prep work about who we are, where we want to get to, how we're going to break down our goals into projects, it's now time to put our word out there after we've done our offer creation. Let's get it out there. Okay, so I look at content as a three-step process. So I see it as content research, content creation, content review, performance review, content research, content creation, content performance review. And I've built a system here that allows you to do all those things seamlessly. And it's fucking sick. <laughs> okay. So first up content research, go find 10 people in your niche that are crushing it. And then you're going to go through the inspiration research section down here. So what we, the way I do it is I go and I highlight people in my niche and let's go search for some people. So, um, in the personal development niche, let's say someone like Ben Mir. So I'm going to go and I'm going to use Instagram, uh, desktop to quickly scan over all his content and see which content pieces have the highest likes and engagement. So I can see that this post has 43,000 likes. This post only has 13. This post only has 8,000. So I'm going to go and click on this and get the link bang. And I'm going to go into here. So Ben Mir, and I'm going to go bang. And next one, uh, Chrome. So 60 K. So that's obviously pinned. So fuck it. Yeah. Let's put this in. So going to go in here, bang. And then I'm just going to get a list of like 10, 10 ideas, 20 ideas. Like just, this is the process you need to go through. And then the next thing you need to do is you need to ask yourself, why, why did this content perform better than his others? And you then need to break down why you think these things worked. So for example, new year challenges to change your life. So there's a, obviously multiple different elements to content performance. There is the actual content itself. So what is what is the content itself and then there's the caption so what are they using the caption and the way i do this is that quite simply i just go here I'm trying to do this with my arm up but what i do is new year so just give it a bit of a tag and then click here and then I'm going to add some notes. So new year, new me, everyone loves that kind of stuff. And seven new year challenges to change your life in 2024. So I'm going to write that down. I'm going to write down the hook. So the hook is seven new challenges or oh, hang on, what did he put seven new year challenges to change your life in 2024, seven new year challenges to change your life in 2024. So I know that that is a hook that works. And I'm then going to make content around that hook. <laughs> I'm going to make my version. I'm not going to, I'm not going to copy and paste what he done. He's done, but I'm going to make my version. So, um, this is just an example of the workflow that I go through. So that is an example of how to do that. So creator one, oh, fuck creator one. So you need to go through that process and do research. Next, we are going to do creation. So we're going to go down to the content power station. And this is the content database, which is sick. And I'll show you why, because I have absolutely turned this into an insane resource on how to create content. And I'll show you why. So there are obviously multiple formats in which to make content. And I've created templates to help you create every single one. And I use every one of these templates to create my content. So this is exactly what I use. And it's what I've used to get 
hundreds of thousands of views across my content. So I have templates up here, which you can modify. So when we go up here, if we click on this, it'll open up these templates. So I've got a written post, short form video template, long form video template for YouTube, and then a newsletter template. So let's go through a written post. So you can edit these templates here. So you click on here, edit this template, and you can edit it as you wish. Um, but to create a new post, what you do, click on this and then click written post, and then it opens up this, and then it's got all of these different elements in. So let's go through written post. So we've got pillars. So you can change these, you can modify these. So you can modify these in the template. You can add these. So all you do is click on this and edit property, and you can add new ones into here. So based on your content pillars, what is type of post is this? Growth, authority, or personal post? Status, idea, poster planning, graft. Aim of post, add proof, how to, motivation, interview, testimonial. Link to post, post date. So what I'll do is when I first set this up, I will make sure I'm scheduling this in just so that it adds it into the content calendar. So I'll go, this is going to be on the 13th of March, for example. And then this adds it in. And then down here, this is all the good stuff. I literally tell you how to make content. So this, um, if you want to learn more about writing, this is an, a guest post or this kind of like a framework from a uh, friend, um, Alex Mathers, who is one of the, probably the best writing brand consultants on Twitter, um, previously been a student at Creator Launch as well. And he is a legend and he's got a post writing framework that you can use to learn how to write amazingly. So go do this. Um, and then making sure that you have a structure. So the hook, the inciting incident, the journey, the support, the outcome, and then more details on these things. And then I've got all of these things down here and I've got hooks post. So ba, ba, ba. I think this has been, okay. So I need to, I'm going to show you how I edit this template because there's, there's an error here. So I'm going to go and delete this because this is not one I want. So this is a post. Okay. So let me show you in real time how I mod modify a template. So there was a, there wasn't the hooks there. So I'm going to open up another tab. It's going to create a duplicate of this. And we are going to go down to the content calendar section. And we are going to go to the templates over here. So this is the template where, where I noticed there was an error. So I'm going to, I'm going to click on this. I'm going to put edit template. So this is now editing a version of the template. Let's make this small. So for some reason, there are not the hooks in here, so they've disappeared. So I'm going to go over to the other tab and we are going to go over to where I think I know there are the hooks. So I'm going to go to edit and the short form video and okay. So Why are the hooks not there? So the hooks have been removed. I must have deleted potentially the, let's have a look at it. Shit. Yeah. So the hooks have been, have gone, but I know where they are. So I'm going to open up my content calendar. So I'm going to close this. So I'm going to go over to mine or oh, my actual content calendar. So my version, and I will, I know that if I open up this version, so this will have my hooks. Okay. So this is a database. So I'm going to copy this. Ooh. I'm going to copy. So control C. And then I come on and add it into these templates. So this is back in these templates, smash them in. Must have accidentally d deleted those. So this is a bunch of awesome hooks that I use. I use for all of mine. Um, and let's add these in here. So this is in the long form content. So this is the long form content template. And then I'm going to add them into the short form. So hooks. Gonna add them back in here. 
And so you can see how I'm editing this template. So you can edit your template when you create these. And remember, this is creating a database that you will then copy over to your new version. So this, this will just remain, these will just stay. So you can edit these how you, how you want. Um, and those are sick. So that is that one done. And then I think, so we've got, I think all of them done. So the written posts, sweet. So now you've got hooks to choose from. You're gonna write your post in here. You're gonna write your caption. And then this, these are the value-based CTAs. So calls to actions, um, every one of your posts wants to have some sort of call to action. And I've got examples of what I've used on LinkedIn, uh, Twitter and uh, Instagram in my like caption. So these are like the, the, the PSs. I always have like a kind of a PS. So that's one thing I always add PS. And then I just copy and paste these when I do the actual post, I copy and paste these so they're easy to remember. And then I've also got hashtags down at the bottom so you can add, add your hashtags in. So super simple, this is exactly what I use and that's how you modify uh, a template. And the, then what you end up having, like I said, is you end up having the third part after the content creation process. So you can see, if I go back, you can see all of my content over the past few months. And I now have a, in the list view, I can go and I have all of this, this is my database of content. So when, when people are like, when you're, this was always a headache that I had. It was like, where do I store my content? You know, I used to have different pages. I used to have like a page for my newsletter. I used to have a page for my LinkedIn posts, my Instagram, and it was just fucking every, it was a mess. Now it's everywhere. So I have my, my newsletter. So I literally have my newsletters like written out here. So I have everything in here. Um, and you know, look like, I don't use this, like I use this as a way just to get stuff done really fast and then plan things out. And uh, you can also use it as a status view. So idea planning draft posted. So you can see I've got loads of ideas and planning. And these are, these are things that I've probably posted, but I haven't changed the status yet. So I, at the end of the quarter, I'll go through, change the status, they'll all be posted. And then I start again. And then the best thing is, is that you can see what has performed well. So every quarter I go through the process and I go, I'll literally look at all of my posts one-on-one -on -one, and I will take a gut feeling. I'll say, did this perform well? And I will give it a performance score. So I'll say, great, mediocre or shit. <laughs> and again, you can change these. You can literally change, change these. You just have to go to their edit property and you can change what you have. It could be ABC, one, two, three, whatever the fuck you want. And again, the great thing is once you modify this and you copy the database over to your new dashboard, it just stays there. So you are building this database. And what you can do eventually is you can pull, you can download this as a CSV. I'm sure there's going to be an opportunity to upload this kind of shit to, to um, I haven't even tried this yet, but uploading the CSV with all of this information into ChatGPT and then getting ChatGPT to spit out ideas for you. So that is the benefit of using this as a database. And I'm like super stoked with this, like super stoked because I haven't seen anything like this. There's nothing out there, which is as, as like simple, easy to use and build a database uh, of content like this. So super, super, super proud of this. And then, so that's it. The three step process is the research. So researching ideas from top creators. And again, you're not just, you're not, co you're not copying their ideas. You're taking inspiration from them. And most importantly, you are questioning why they worked. You are analyzing them and you're questioning and you're, you're, you are like a scientist. You're breaking apart the reasons why that stuff worked. So that's step one. Step two is the content creation. And then step three is the performance review, research, creation, performance review. I can't believe this course is free. <laughs> okay. So we are nearly at the end of the creator accelerator course. Got a couple more trainings to go through. Um, but it is at this point where I would like to ask you to please share some love and maybe, you know, if you've, if you are, have found any of this course valuable, useful, and in any way it's helped you and, uh, Perhaps you have used or are using the creator OS dashboard, which, you know, like I've said, most creators charge $100 plus for this. Um, 
hundreds of dollars, maybe thousands for this level of uh, course as well. Um, and you know, I'm, I'm giving this out you for free, out for free, and the only ask I have of you is to share some feedback and some love with a testimonial. So if you scroll down to here, um, you will find a link to uh, leave a short testimonial and review. And this is the only way that I get feedback on whether this stuff is actually helping people or not. Because otherwise, honestly, we get hundreds of people, thousands of people using this. And I don't know if it's actually been, you know, I don't know how to improve it. I don't know if it's any, if it's actually helping people. So this would be really, really useful if you could please leave a testimonial. And you just go to here, you can either record a video or just write a short testimonial. Uh, it will take you five minutes to do max. And that is my ask for you. And um, yeah, I hope this has been helpful. And um, let's uh, crack on with the rest of the rest of the course. Okay, so now we've gone through how I do my my outcomes management. So my weekly and daily workflows for getting stuff done. And let's talk about the process that I go through at the end of every month. Uh, or the beginning of every month and at the beginning of every quarter. So I have this built in. So this is in a monthly, our monthly and quarterly reviews. So look, just a note on this, the metrics below that I've added into here, they're the ones that are relevant to my business. So modify these depending on your priority metrics and platforms. At the beginning of every month, take a full day. So you're going to see this method from Sahil Bloom, my former boss, to review your numbers for the previous month. This is one of the highest impact activities that set apart amateurs from professionals. If you fucking do not review where you've been and what you've accomplished, you are, you are not a professional. You are simply an amateur and you will stay that way. So professionals take this process really, really, really seriously. So this is one of the highest impact activities. And it's the key that you are reflecting. It, the key is that you're reflecting on what inputs you put into the system last month and last quarter and the result, what the resulting outputs were. So remember, we our business is a machine and a system. We need to put energy into it through inputs and we look at what the results and the outputs were. And then we make hypotheses and we go again. You can then plan to make changes to your inputs accordingly. So eventually you should be looking to delegate this process out to a VA. So it's done pretty seamlessly. Um, uh, and that's the, when it comes to getting the numbers put in. So the numbers can be done by a VA, but the reflection needs to be done by you. And I would actually say that there's probably benefit to not delegating this out and just doing it yourself. But what we want is data, data, you know, the, the, the data, uh, scraping bit can be done by a VA. So first up, we have a monthly review template. So again, once we, we're going to have three of these in a quarter, we're going to have, well, actually we're going to have only going to have two because the third one is going to be a, uh, uh, that's not the case. We'll have three per month. So we're going to duplicate this. And this is going to be called. So for argument's sake, the beginning of Q. Uh, so this is going to be, it's in March now. So let's say this is March. Oh, this will be for, for the quarter. So January 2024. And I'm going to delete that. So January 2024, and this is what this looks like. So this is based on the idea of a think day. So this is from Sahil Bloom, um, and this is taken from his kind of his link that you can see. So his essential tools for a think day. So the idea is that you take a day away from your business. So you take a day to get away from the day-to-day -day tasks and take an opportunity to take a bird, look at it, look at things from a bird's eye view perspective. So essential tools for a think day, journal, pen, books, articles that have been wanting to read, secluded location. This is, again, another one of those instances where you want to get away from your day-to-day. -day. You want to remove yourself from your day-to-day -day kind of situation and put yourself into a into a different location, place where you can really just not think about the tasks in the day-to-day. -day. So thinking questions prompts to spark my mind. These are the thinking questions. So how can you do less but better? Are you hunting antelope, big important problems, or field mice, small urgent problems? We always want to be in a proactive uh, instead of a reactive state. So we want to be predicting what we want to be having complete focus on the stuff we want to focus on and not reacting to stuff. What are your strongest beliefs? What would it take for you to change your mind on them? What are a few things that you know now that you wish you knew five years ago? What actions were you were engaged in five years ago that you cringe at today? What actions are you engaged in today that you'll cringe at in five years? What would your 80 year old self say about your decisions today? This is a really good one. So 
again, take a day to do this. Like if it's a weekend, take a weekend day, like plan this into your schedule. These, I have these planned. I have a full day every month. I go into my calendar for the whole year and I block out a day for each month. And it's a, typically a weekend day. Sometimes if it's not, sometimes it's not, sometimes if it's a Friday, I'll take it as a Friday. So this can be at the start of the month. It doesn't have to be the first of the month. It can be second, third, fourth, whatever, but you just need to set it, set a monthly review day in the diary. And, you know, this, uh, the, you know, Sahil talks about this idea of walks in between these thinking blocks. Um, walking is the lubricant to the mind. So do that walk. So first up project status review. Um, this is my process. So this isn't from Sahil. This is my process. So what could I have done better last month? What was I proud of last month? What projects are on track? What projects are currently not on track? Why are they not on track? Are my projects currently prioritized correctly? What's causing my, me anxiety? What am I worried about for the future? What do I want to achieve over the next four weeks? And then these are the inputs for your system and the outputs. So content posts, a so number of content posts. So how many individual posts have you done? This, you know, this, these are the main posts. So how many main Instagram posts have I posted this month? And the idea is for you to be able to see if fuck, I haven't, haven't had as much business this month. Well, I only posted five times, no shit. So, um, again, modify these based on your circumstance. So what channels do you use? What are the metrics relevant to your business? How many DMs? So this is a new conversation started, a really real key metric that we use in our business um, to understand conversation flow. Networking calls, sales calls. Then outputs, what does this result in? Revenue, leads, closing rates. So these are all the different rate, like again, modify these for your yours. And so that's done every month. So we do that every month. And we do the same, sim sim similar every quarter. So we just look at metrics and then we do the, the quarterly business review, the same thing, asking ourselves these questions. What do I want to achieve over the next three months? Okay. So same process again. So again, tell me this isn't sick. Like you have to go through this. You have to do this reflection. Um, and I've made this a tap in for you. Um, and hopefully this is going to help you. This has absolutely helped me. And I think it's really important to take some time, you know, quarterly, by the way, quarterly is a week that I take off. And I know, you know, for a lot of you, you might have jobs right now that that sounds impossible, but like that's four weeks a year, but at the beginning of a quarter, um, and I learned this from Sam Ovens to take a week away from your business to reflect on what has happened in the past three months because it's a long a long amount of, a big amount of time and you can then use that that week to synthesize your ideas synthesize your plans and your goals for the next quarter and then you sit down and you say this is what i'm going to get done for the next three months so one day for a month you know so the way i look at it is um uh, i do my reflections are weekly i take one hour to do weekly reflection i do one day to do monthly reflection and i take one week for quarterly reflection simple. Okay. And it's so important that you do this and build towards this. And if you say, if you have a busy life and you're saying, oh, I can't, I can't find a fucking day to take off. You're lying to yourself. You just aren't prioritizing it. You absolutely can take it. You do have this, you have this, you could, it could be a weekend. It could be a Saturday or Sunday. Everyone has a day a month that they could, they do. You just need to plan it in advance, set it in the diary and, and see it as an investment in your future. Just like you would go, you know, for me, one of my hobbies playing golf is a full day out. And I see my monthly review process just as important as my, um, hobbies. Does that make sense? So you have to prioritize this and, and prioritize the importance of investing back into reflection and review. And I've made this easy for you. Okay. So no excuses. Okay. Sick. And, uh, I think then we are on to the next one. See you there. Right champs. We are now at the action station. This is where you are going to actually get stuff done. And it's made up of obviously the content. So there's the content creation content, but there's the new standards. So what are your new standards that you are going to hold yourself to, to break past your comfort ceiling? 
And then there is the actually getting shit done. This is the, this is really, again, a, a part of this system, which again, I'm, I'm like personally, like I'm proud of because it's just helped me. Like I just use this every single week and day to make sure that I'm getting the stuff done that I need to get done, prioritizing and having clarity on the things that are going to move my, my life and my business forward. So, um, Let's dive into it. It looks really simple, but um, there are a few different parts to this. So first up is if you want to do a bit of meditation, there's a really great guided meditation um, link here. So go watch this. It's by Joe Dispenza. And then there's also a really, really, really important video that you need to watch here from the number one mindset coach out there, Ed Milet, about how to hold yourself to elite standards of productivity. And I, I cannot do a better job than Ed has done in this video. Short video, 20 minutes, I think. Go watch it here. Um, I watch it quite frequently to, to remind myself of how I need to get stuff done. This is turbo. Now there's the getting stuff done. So in here, what I have is I've got something to do every week. At the beginning of every week, you are going to click on this and you are going to duplicate. And that is going to be the first step that you take at the beginning of your week. So this is a template that you duplicate and then we'll go through exactly what is in this template for you to complete. It's going to be made up of tasks and just management. So as always, Notion is acting slow. So let's, so here we have our weekly outcomes template and I'm going to rename this. So I'm going to say, this is the week commencing and say, let's say this is March. March 4th, 2024. Now, the idea is that in a, over a quarter and um, like you will see and just opened up my version here, you'll see how you will build a stack of your weekly kind of your basically just this is the, your weekly outcomes and we'll go in through this. So that's the idea is that you end up at the end of the quarter with 12 of these. So we're going to start with this. Let's close this down and minimize this. And I'll show you what this is made up of. So this is made up of um, a bit of a calendar to just get an idea of what you have. You, these are your tasks. So every day you'll add your tasks into here, your key meetings, your outcomes. And what we do is we start the week with reflection. And the reflection is done in this portion, the weekly journal preview, which we will open up here. So this is a process that I go through at the beginning of every week. And remember, I said earlier on in the course that I start every single day and every single week with gratitude. So I look at my vision. So I, before I do this, I go through my vision board. So I go, when I scroll down, I keep all of these open, by the way. So this is just, all these toggles are closed so that you can kind of uh, easily nav navigate through this, but I keep all this open. So these are all open during when I use this on a day-to-day -day basis. So I scroll down and I can go through all of these. So I can have my goals my revenue tracker, got all of this up. And so I start every week with a preview. So a preview of the week. And this is my like journaling process of prepping for the week. So I start every week with asking myself, what am I grateful for? So something that I have now that I would beg to have had years ago. And for me, that's like right now in my life, it is the fact that I get to live my life, what I, how I dreamt to be living it a few years ago. So when I was spending my mornings stuck on a fucking cramped train um, for an hour and a half every morning to get to work and on the way back, I don't have to do that now. When I am when I get to go to the gym, which I'm about to go to in the next half an hour, that is what I dreamt to be able to do. I get to go in the middle of the morning instead of when the gym is empty, instead of having to go at lunch when it's fucking busy or in the evening when it's rammed and I'm super, super, super grateful for that. So I write this down every day and at the start of every week. So something that I would have had, I now have that I would beg to have had years ago, something that I now have now, which I would beg to have in 50 years time. And I, you know, I won't go into what mine are, but like, you need to think about this stuff. Something I have now that I would beg to have if I was sick or injured. And then it's like, okay, stepping up. So showing up what I'm grateful for, stepping up, what am I committed to? So what am I committed to? And then giving back, what is my intention for this week? What is my wish? What am, why am I here? Reminding myself this. So I go through this every day, every week and every day. 
Then I take a snapshot. So I look at my last week's performance and I go through this. I spend, this takes me 10 minutes. So I go and I look at revenue, cash collected, number of new conversations, and you can modify this, modify this, uh, this template. You go modify your template so you can modify all of this stuff. And I take a snapshot of where I'm at. So, you know, you may not be on these channels, just fucking do what you want. Just put this in. This is your performance. You need to start with your performance in mind. And then highlighting what is this week's one thing. So what is the one thing that you need to get done this week? So to highlight that. Then what would make this week incredible? What are this week's main projects? What are this week's key outcomes? And then highlighting the key meetings and calls that you have this week. So super simple. This takes me 30 minutes to go through every week at the start of every week. And then I, so I have that. So I have my weekly journal preview. So I don't need to duplicate that. I just do that for, that's in every week, the start of every week. And then I duplicate this. So this is my daily journal. So I go to this and I go duplicate. And then I change this to, so I always do, my Monday one is my weekly journal preview. So I don't do this again on a Monday. So what I do is, and I'll say Tuesday, Tuesday, 5th of March. 2024 and I'll open this up and it's the same format. So it's the same format. So something I have now would have begged to have had years ago, something I have, I have now, I would have begged to have had back in 50 years time, something I have now would have begged to have if I was sick or injured. Who do I love? Why am I so happy? What am I most committed to? How committed am I? What is my intention? What is my wish? Why am I here? What is today's one thing? So getting focus, real focus on what today is trying to, to accomplish. What's the mission for today? Today's key outcomes, key meetings and calls, and today's content posted. So what have I got scheduled in the content calendar? And so I do this every morning. It takes me 15 minutes to do every morning. Simple. And then again, I have a list that this ends up being Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, you know, just adds up here. And then next week, you go again, you duplicate this, have another week. So you start each week from scratch. I add my tasks into here based on my one thing. So I, what is my one thing? What are the key projects? What are the top three outcomes that I want to get done? Simple. Don't tell me this isn't sick because it fucking is. It is mm -hmm. sick. And I do this as, as you've just seen, this is literally what I do. So I do this every day. And as you can see, I've got my standards here as well. So these are the standards that I'm holding myself to this quarter. You can write yours down here, your non-negotiable daily standards. And that is the process I use. Simple, right? Oh, fuck. So let's get rid of that. Let's get rid of that. Simple. So this is what I do to make sure I start every week and every morning with absolute crystal clarity on what I need to get done. And it is the absolute game changer. Tell me there's a better way to do this because there fucking ain't. I'm telling you that for free. Okay, next up, we are on to the next thing, which is reviews. So now we get the stuff done and then every month and every quarter, we're going to do a review. Let's go to it. Right, Jam, so I'm going to share with you a really simple hack that I found last year from a uh, creator called Eric Partaker. He's got, he's written a book. So these last two trainings are on, uh, based on frameworks that I've used from a couple of books. So one is the three alarms method. So they are located down here. So the three alarm alarms method and the winning the week method. So we'll do the three alarms method first. So this is an idea. This is a process again, it's from the book by Eric Partaker, who's a CEO coach, executive coach, and super simple hack that really helped me transform my life last year. So I was struggling at the beginning of last year to stick to new habits and behaviors I set myself at the beginning of the year. And then I found this super simple hack that changed everything. So it's called the three alarms method. And I now use this every day, very simple. And it's allow, allows me to refocus my energy into habits and behaviors. And here's how it works. So simple, you set three alarms to go off at different points during the day. And yes, I just have it on my phone and I have a set, set these alarms at these times. So the idea is that each alarm is a signal for you to switch your focus. So you, you'd be familiar with like the idea that 
uh, we kind of touched on, which is you don't want to minimize task switching. So the best way to do that is to create work blocks or blocks in your day where you have a focus on one type of activity so that you're not having to mentally switch between loads of different things, you know, throughout your day. So I have my, and we'll go into in the next training in the winning the week method, which is how I set up my week to win. And I do that by sectioning blocks, work blocks throughout the day where I have different focuses. So here are my focuses. So these are my alarms. So 6 a.m., this is when I wake up and this is my where I focus on writing. So from 6 a.m. through to 11 a.m., this is my focus on being a writer, writing and creating content. So this is when I write my newsletter, my content, you know, my uh, projects, my program, like all of my synthesizing information is done when it's quiet. I don't take calls in the morning. So that's one of my rules. I do not take calls until 1 p.m. And then I get all of my work done, my deep work done. I can put my headphones on, put a house house music mix on and just fucking get in the zone and uh, smash it. Then at 11 a.m. I have an alarm that goes off and rem and that is my signal, my trigger to now turn into athlete mode. And this is when I'm like, okay, done writing. I'm now in how the fuck do I absolutely smash my work out of the gym? So the alarm goes off, I walk to the gym again. Um, whatever I'm either listening to podcast, audiobook, or mix like to get me in the zone. And I start thinking, I look at my, my program and what I'm going to be doing at the gym and thinking ahead to crushing that workout. And so that's my athlete trigger. And then at 2 PM, that's when my third alarm, my final alarm goes off. And that is my advisor alarm. And so this is when I have all of my calls. So whether they're sales calls or client calls, I have all of my calls in the afternoon. And this, this is a trigger for me to get into the mind of, okay, I'm now helping people. So I have my writing time, I have my athlete time and I have my advisor time. So my question to you is what are yours? You know, for you, it could be like family time. It could be, I just, you know, in the afternoon or 5 PM onwards is my family time. It's my cutoff. You know, I go, you need to then, des you need to design this for your specific circumstance. So this is just mine. And this is based on the, the, the dream life that I designed it you know, uh, last year and I'm now living it. And these are my triggers to get me to do this stuff. So each arm alarm acts as a trigger to switch focus. And especially as an entrepreneur, you have to wear multiple hats. The best way to do that is to minimize task switching. So you batch stuff up into blocks and crush every block. So that's really helped me. And I think it can really help you too. Okay. Next on to how to win the week. Right, champs, this is the final training in the Creator Accelerates course. And this ultimately is potentially one of the most important parts, which is how do you structure your weeks to win? So this is the final training in the Dream Life Design module. It is the winning the week method. So this is taken from the book, Winning the Week, How to Plan a Successful Week Every Week by Demir Bentley and Kerry Bentley. And if you haven't got that book, it is part of the uh, Launch Mastermind mandatory book reading list and uh, you need to read it. So winning the week method. So the winning the week method is really based upon uh, this idea that quite simply you need to, the people who just drift into each week without any idea of what they are, what they need to get done, um, lose. It is that simple because this is the process that all of the, this is the process that winners go through. Um, it, it, whether it's this framework or how people, you know, how they do it, like they go through some sort of process of reviewing their past week and previewing and planning their, their next week, their upcoming week. So this is a simple process to go through, um, which uh, if you have never done anything like this, planning your week, this is a very, quick and easy to do. And the key thing is that um, this takes away friction for wanting to preview our week because this, this is this is why this happens. So I'll go into this here. So it's made up of six part or seven parts, removing resistance, learning a lesson, choosing leverage priority, interrogating your calendar, ex uh, triaging your task list, allocating time, demand and supply and executing your plan. So step zero really is 
this idea of removing the resistance. So what does this mean? As you know, if we go back to this idea of resistance towards leveling up. Now, one of the most kind of like, frankly, brutal ways that the devil controls us is it makes us feel resistance to planning our future week because typically we don't like thinking into the future, especially if we have a job, if we have a nine to five, we we don't want to think about our bosses. We don't want to think about our job. We don't want to think about the stuff. And so that can be extremely anxiety provoking. And what this does is this kicks off a fight or flight response from your limbic brain, your lizard brain, that keeps you from consistently and thoroughly planning ahead of time. So it's it's our this is our defense mechanism for when we reach our comfort ceiling. It is our defense. It's our it's the devil that's telling us, nah, bah, nah, nah. You stay down here. You stay down here where you're comfortable not thinking about the future, not thinking about the things you want to do, not thinking about your dreams and your vision and your, you know, where you, your goals and your projects. And this is super common at the end of the week. It's like weekend time. I can forget about things. I can have nine pints tonight and fucking wake up tomorrow. I'm going to feel like shit, but at least I don't have to think about my future. I don't have to think about next week. So step zero of the winning the week method is removing this internal resistance through a really, um, simple and uh, beautiful method. So what you need to do to remove the resistance is create a craveable experience that allows you to go through this process of planning your week. So in, in the book, they recommends linking the, the planning process. So what you're going to do is you're just going to take an hour, an hour, either like ideally on a Saturday, Saturday morning makes the first thing that you do on a Saturday morning, because once you do it, you then have the weekend to do whatever the fuck you want. Amazing, right? So what you do is you create a craveable experience. So the, the example is go to a nice cafe, go have an amazing croissant and a coffee, put some headphones in and spend an hour just quickly reviewing and then planning your week and getting it done. So you create a craveable experience. So you, instead what happens instead of it triggering your fight or flight, it triggers this idea of like, yeah, I get to fucking do this. I get to go and have an amazing croissant and you treat yourself. So you start linking this process to having a treat and something positive. So you link this to a positive experience rather than a negative fear experience. Step number one, Learn a lesson. So you need to look back on last week and look for a lesson or improvement each week that creates a positive feedback loop where you get slightly better each week. So this, the impact can be completely life-changing if you do this every week for one year. See this as an opportunity to try new things, evaluate your wins and losses and fine tune your game. Step two, choose your leveraged priority. So the biggest planning error is choosing the wrong priority or choosing multiple equal priorities instead of just one. This spreads your focus and dilutes your impact, trapping you in a vicious cycle of overwork. Instead, identify the top leveraged priority that you'll aim to complete early on in the week, ideally on Monday or Tuesday. Okay, so what is your, this is when it comes to the planning, this is your one thing. What is your one thing that you need to get done? Step three, interrogate your calendar. Your calendar represents your entire supply of time, your precious 168 hours a week. Your task in this step of the winning the week method is to make sure your calendar is accurately representing your time supply, meaning finding every tiny error buried in your calendar and correcting them. To be, true, to be able to truly trust your calendar, you'll have to interrogate your calendar like a lawyer interrogating a witness. So you need to really deeply look at your calendar and say, what what did I do last week that I didn't need to do? What was reactive instead of proactive? Did I allocate enough time to that priority, leverage priority task that I need to get done? So ask these questions. What shouldn't be on your calendar but is? What shouldn't, what should be on your calendar but currently isn't? How much flex time will you need to deal with emergencies this week? You know, really key to build this in, build, build blocks of emergency time where you might need to be reactive to stuff. Because as you grow as an entrepreneur, you will have to be somewhat reactive to some things, but you want to main le leverage priority tasks to be planned, thoughtful and built into your calendar. What could be arranged more optimally in your calendar? What can you move around? When exactly will your leverage priority get done? Where are the landmines in my calendar? Did my calendar review unearth some hidden tasks? ruthlessly triage your task list. 
So the nature of human beings is to want to do more than they have time for. But in, in a world where you can't do it all, you need to ruthlessly triage your task list. That means letting go of the fancy of getting it all done and asking a far better question. How can I do the most good with my limited to supply of time? So ask yourself these questions. Is it related to your number one leverage weekly priority? Is it incredibly time sensitive? Can this task be tarcoed? So can it be automated, con consolidated, so grouped into other similar tasks or delegated? I think I spelled delegated wrong, but um, is it a someday, someday task? Do you, as in, is it, is it a task that needs to just get done someday, not priority? Do you need more information about the task to make it actionable? Then allocate your time demands to your time supply. So step one, put the good stuff, another typo, put the good stuff in first, the things that give you most energy and joy. Schedule your deep work, put in any unplanned, unwanted work, UWW. Stuff shallow work into the cracks, keep going until all of your supply time has been allocated. So really key is putting the good, the good stuff in first, put the good stuff in first. And for me, this is working out hobbies. This is time for walking and doing stuff. And I just build this in. This is like, could be your relationship time. This could be date night. This could be time with your, with your kids. What is the good stuff that brings you energy and joy? And you want to be doing stuff, doing that stuff, put it into your calendar first. Next scheduling your deep work. So I do all my deep work in the morning. Then you also want to build and build in blocks of unplanned and unwanted work. This is the emergency stuff, the, the reactive stuff. And then you want to stuff shallow work into the crack. So stuff that doesn't require deep work, small little tasks, you know, things on your task, you know, you know that you need to get done. Could be like accounting stuff, like sending one off emails to people could be that kind of little tiny micro tasks that don't take a huge amount of brain power and you could just build them into the cracks. And then you just keep going until all of your supply time has been allocated. So your, your, you want your calendar to start looking like blocks. And this is what my calendar looks like. So my calendar looks like this, has looked like this for a long time now where I do, I've got my, um, like my morning exercise done. I've got my journaling time. I've got my deep work blocks and what are my focuses for those blocks? I've then got my calls and stuff in the afternoons and I have everything block blocked out. So if your calendar at the moment just looks like, you know, appointments, if your calendar is just an appointment setting tool, you're, you're, you are not using your calendar. You are going to lose, going to lose. It needs to look like this. So use this. So remove resistance, learn a lesson, choose leverage priority, interrogate your calendar, triage your task list, allocate time and demand and supply and execute your plan. And I've also got a playbook in here for you to walk through this. So in Create OS, we've got the winning the week method playbook. So it is in here. So it'll take you through the exact process in a bit more detail and explain the kind of like logic behind these steps and how to actually do them. So go through all of these and that'll take you a little bit of time to go through and get familiar with. So again, I made this super simple for you and a tap in. So with winning the week there, enjoy. This is how to scale your coaching or consulting business past 30K per month without sacrificing a limb. Who this video is for, this is for ambitious coaches, consultants, or freelancers that want to make a tangible impact with their work. Maybe you've made some sales, but you just can't break past that five to 10K per month ceiling. You're excited by the prospect of earning 100K per month, not just a year. You know your niche and you know who you want to serve. You're like me and you hate bosses, authority, and the whole concept of the nine to five. You're sick of relying on bullshit methods like cold outreach or organic marketing that just suck time, energy, and excitement from you, and they don't work. Struggling, you might be struggling for clarity, looking for a predictable, consistent, proven roadmap to grow your business. And you understand how important the next three years are to rapidly grow a personal brand and make sure you're on the right side of the wealth gap after the AI revolution. Now, who this video is not for, this is not for people who love cold outreach or organic marketing. You guys can leave. People who don't like helping other people, you guys can also leave. People who just want to make 10K per month, you guys can stay if you want. And people who like to figure it out themselves, 
you guys already left and people who get a kick out of sacrificing limbs. I hope you guys get locked up. So who am I? My name is Tom Youngs and I'm the founder of Creator Launch. I'm on a mission. I'm on a mission to help a million, at least that number is probably going to increase at some point, a million creators to find their purpose, uncover their mission, break free, make their impact and unlock their true potential. I used to be a cosmetic dentist, which is mad to think. And I've also been a digital consultant to some of the world's biggest enterprise brands across the world, Chanel, Virgin, Urban Outfitters, Selfridges, Harrods, loads of others as well. I've also done sales and customer success for enterprise software solutions. Um, so I've been at the coalface of technology for the best part of seven years since I stopped being a teeth looker at her. And I've also owned my own SMMA agency where we were doing 40K per month when I left. And I've also been a freelance growth consultant for one of the biggest newsletter agencies, Paperboy Studios, by the creator Sahil Bloom. And I have a new business called Creator Launch. It's not new, it's been there, we've had it for a while now. But this is, this is what I do now, and we are a growth infrastructure partner. We help hyper-ambitious creators scale their coaching or consulting businesses past 30K per month with micro-education hybrid business models, attraction and authority flywheels, value synthesizing and sales asset frameworks, sales mastery, and scaled delivery systems. And in this video, I'm going to show you how you can grow your business past 30K per month, just like students like ours, like Ben, have done in five steps. So let's get to it. Step number one is pivot to a scalable micro-education business model. Now, this is Goldman Sachs, who have predicted that the creator economy could approach half a trillion dollars by 2027, which is a doubling in size within the next three years. Fast approaching and an incredible opportunity. That's why I'm doing what I'm doing now. And this is what I used to be doing. I used to run an SMMA agency where we used to do community building for tech companies on Discord. And this in my opinion, absolutely sucked. It was non-leveraged work, really hard to scale. It was a revenue roller coaster. We just didn't know if the next month was going to be as consistent as last month. It was just always up and down, and that was stressful as fuck. And it was non-existent profit margins. Couldn't pay ourselves anything because all of our money was having to go to who we were outsourcing all the work to, and that also sucked. Despite us doing 40K per month, we were, I was taking home none of it. So where am I looking now? I'm looking at the creator economy as an opportunity where attention is the number one asset in this new digital era. Here are a few of the biggest creators in the world who have microeducation businesses. And these guys are all guys that I interviewed on my Summit Club podcast last year. Dakota Robertson, who you might be familiar with, he has his own 100k plus per month uh, microeducation business about ghostwriting. Danko, he's got a 300k per month Microeducation business about personal branding in the digital, in the creator economy. And Ali Abdal has a 300K per month YouTube channel building microeducation business called Part Time YouTuber Academy. And there's me. I have Creator Launch. So I do this stuff too. And this is where the new opportunity is. So we have been living in a world where we have the old way of doing things, where delivering coaching and consulting services were done in the old pre-digital world, where if you were a coach, you were doing non-directive, goal-orientated support, client-centered approach, holistic development, and you were very much a coach, or you were a consultant where you're problem solving, you were solution focused, and you had very specialized expertise, and it was very directive, you're directing people to do stuff. Versus the new way to do things, and in my opinion, is the most effective way to do things, which is a hybrid of everything, where you are doing everything, and you are doing a mix of do-it-yourself, done with you, and done for you services instead of just doing one or the other, instead of saying, I'm a coach, I'm a consultant, I'm a freelancer, we ask ourselves the question, what is the best way to get results for my ideal customer? And this, in my opinion, is the only way to differentiate yourself as a whale in an ocean of sardines. The benefits of this is high profit margins. You can average like 18, 90% plus profit margins, upwards of 30K per month, which is insane. It's a highly leveraged and scalable model, which means that you can remove yourself from the business and actually go on holiday. And you can have consistent, consistent and predictable revenues, which is also big thumbs up. Step number two in this is building your attraction and authority flywheel. Now, this is the most effective and elegant way that I've found to build an online business and personal brand at the same time. It is absolutely damn sick. So 
Number one is you get access to the biggest leads ocean in history, AKA the meta platform, Facebook and Instagram, 4 billion users per month. Tell me, tell me a better platform. There isn't one. It, you automate the process of getting lead generation, so no, no more wasting hundreds of hours of cold DMs or emails. This attracts perfect fit people to your business so you don't get any more tire kickers or time wasters. And this grows your personal brand and audience at the same time. It builds digital influence and authority. And the best thing, no more revenue roller coaster because you build pipeline equity, so you pay your future self. This is the method that we use to get people to know, like, and trust you. And they, these are the three critical elements of buying. So what we do is we attract strangers with content and ads. We engage them and nurture them with highly valuable educational nurture content, turn them into prospects. We then convert them into customers through sales assets. These customers get results and they start promoting you. And this gets fed t into the top of the system and we're happy. So how do we do this? This is done through the seven steps to freedom method. I just had to come up with a catchy name. So step number one is profile optimization. We need to make sure it's SEO optimized. There's a clear unique mechanism in our profile and we have a target ideal customer that it makes it clear we are for that person. And there's a clear call to action. Step number two is we create pinned posts directing our new traffic. In my opinion, web websites are dead. Instead, we direct the flow of traffic to sales assets, lead magnets, communities, and video sales letters just like this using pinned posts. So we are much more about traffic directing rather than just traffic accumulation, which in my opinion is what websites did. And keep in mind that I used to help consult for the biggest brands in the world to help them literally make their websites work better. So take that, take that as you wish. Step number three, run boosted reels videos or carousel posts. So we run simple ads that call out our ideal customer, telling them how we help people with a call to action to being to follow me to learn more. What this does is we this allows us to create a bank of our perfect fit customers and provide pipeline equity for us in months to come. What we then do is we create highly engaging value content, create short form educational content to demonstrate expertise and build trust with our audience. We then, step five is we create long form sales assets to nurture our new audience. These are done on YouTube or Spotify to help our new audience members solve their biggest problems. We'll get into how we create them in a second. We then have conversations. We have new, we DM new followers, commenters, likers, and anyone engaging. So we do warm outreach, warm DM following our appointment setting framework and script. And then we step seven, we get on sales calls with perfect fit leads. We have sales calls, perfect fit leads. We charge at least 3K, close to 20, 30%. And we start working with people we love. Well, maybe what we love, but we love to help and resonate with our message. Okay, this is our game plan. And it starts with creating growth content and follow ads. And this is where we take a cold audience and we start warming them up. We then create nurture content and retargeting ads to help them see us more frequently and to spend more time with us. We funnel people into a free private community. It could be on school, could be a Discord, could be Facebook groups. Pick your poison, you choose whatever you want. I think school's currently the best. And then we connect with people in the DMs when start, things start getting really warm. We then get people on sales calls. We make sure we get paid in full and we convert people into new clients. We take them through onboarding. We push them into our private community, which again, could be on school, could be wherever the hell you want. And then we provide the entire infrastructure they need to guarantee there's an asterisk because nothing in life is guaranteed, but as much as possible, guarantee that their success to get the results that you can get help them get. What we then is what after we what we then do is after we've got the results we then create sales assets that showcase that we are capable of getting results and we push them in through the top of the funnel at the top here in the form of content. Okay, step number three is we do value synthesis. So we are value synthesizing and creating sales assets. So your role in the creator economy is to be a value synthesizer. What is the definition of a value synthesizer? I made this up. So this is a person who is able to take the infinite volume of information floating in the internet, pull out exactly what works and then serve it to a target demographic via content, a demographic that also fits their ideal customer profile. So we do this by creating long form content in the form of sales assets. What is a sales asset? A sales asset is a piece of content that simultaneously generates traffic at the same time as converting traffic by showcasing your skills, your expertise, your story, your passion, 
your knowledge and it builds reciprocal equity with your audience. It's like a goodwill bank, that's what we call it, critically shifting beliefs to align with yours. And once someone's beliefs shift to align with yours, that's when they buy. You can see I do this on my YouTube channel. You can see how I do it. So how do we do this? How do we actually create sales assets? First up, we use, we build a goodwill reciprocity bank account with ideal customers. This is based around the law of reciprocity, which is if I give you something, you feel like you owe me something. This also demonstrates our authority in our niche, which builds trust. And this gives our ideal customers the chance to spend hours with us, which is the unbeatable trust builder. We then have multiple different types of sales assets. Again, you can take a look on my channel to see how I've done it. So we're looking at case studies, testimonials, interviews with key opinion leaders in, in your niche. We have video demonstrations showcasing your technical expertise and ability. We have thesis explanations showing your strategy and your thought process around your thesis. And then we create video sales letters just like this. Now, step one of creating the sales assets is Zoom and Loom are your biggest friends. Step two is you're actually distributing them on long form channels like YouTube and Spotify. Those are your biggest friends for sales assets. You can see how I do this on my Summit Club podcast, which is why I post all of my YouTube stuff on Spotify as well. Next up, we've got sales mastery. Step four, master the skill and art of sales so that you never have to worry about making money ever again. Sales is both a skill and a process. How do we do this? So step one is getting people onto sales calls. We do this using the appointment setting framework. We have an ACA framework, which is acknowledge, compliment, ask. So you acknowledge what they say, you compliment them on what they said, and then you ask them a, a follow-up question. This is part of the discovery phase. We ask a series of discovery phase questions. We then transition through into offering them a call if we feel like they are the right fit for what we're, what we're doing. We then have a series of Calendly automations and uh, uh, Calendly automations and reminders that set up to increase show rate on calls. And we have a uh, specific pre-call prep message, which again, maximizes show rate and the likelihood of someone being the right fit for a sales call. We then actually do the sales call. So we have a framework which we use, close the closer framework, which is clarify the problem, label the problem, overview of past experiences, sell the vacation or the plane flight, explain away objections, and then reiterate the benefits. Those are the main things I'm always trying to tick off in a sales call. And we do that in a number of phases. We have seven phases of a sales call. We have the introduction phase, which is about rapport building and setting a frame. We have the discovery phase, which is understanding the background of your prospect and also understanding what their current situation is, what their desired situation is, what pain they're currently in, what problems they're currently facing and why the driver of why they want to get from where they are to where they want to get to. We then transition into the pitch phase. We then get into where we showcase our offer. We then get into the committing phase where we actually ask our prospect, is this something you are ready to commit to? We then go through an objections phase, which is where we do objection prevention instead of obje objection handling. And then we go into the closing phase, which is where we are taking credit card details. <laughs> okay, step number four is mastering the seven longest levers of turbocharged sales. This is the difference between a, uh, a good salesperson and a great salesperson. So the use of tone, the use of conviction, pain hunting, verbal pacing, results-based thinking, sales resistance, trigger disarming, and neuro-emotional persuasive questioning. Step five is buying back your time with an appointment setter to manage DMs. So once we have proof of concept, with uh, we've got our attraction and authority flywheel set up, we then buy back our time to spend more time doing the things we love by hiring an appointment setter to manage our DMs and book consistent calls with perfect fit leads. Step number five is transitioning to a leveraged world-class scaled delivery method. So this dude, this lad called Arch Archimedes, he once said, give me a lever and, pl and a place to stand and I will move the earth. Give me a fulcrum and I shall move the world. Give me a firm spot in which to stand and I shall move the earth. Now, this is really all about the idea of leverage and how important it is to have um, to have systems in place where we can input things and they have outsized returns. And this is what we're doing with moving to uh, scaled delivery. So paradoxically, by creating systems to increase leverage, this will inevitably result in your customers getting more effective, faster, and more predictable results. Let me say that again. So paradoxically, by creating systems to increase the leverage to remove yourself from the business, this inevitably results in your customers getting more effective, faster, and predictable results. So if you want to get better results to your customers, you need to do this. 
How do we do this? Step number one is we synthesize information into self-directed learning resources. We do that through video courses, trainings on our hot seven topics. We have a customized implementation pathway for all of our customers. You then guide them along a customer success timeline, helping them from get from point A, their current situation to point B, which is their desired situation. We then migrate from one to one to leveraged coaching, move from one to one coaching to leveraged group coaching. We have topic masterclasses, we have guest expert masterclasses, we have Q and A's and we have troubleshooting. And this allows us to deliver all of the information in a much more leveraged way. And the key to understand is like, all of your customers are going to be having in like they're going to be having the same problems and encountering the same challenges and so this is a much more effective way of showcasing people okay this is some of the things that you need to be looking out for down the road giving people a heads up and it's a much it's a much more effective way of getting better results faster we then do success tracking so we create systems that allow accurate success tracking for your customers we remove any ambiguity and use data milestones and checkpoints to track and measure your customers progression along your customer success timeline and then we track key performance indicators to measure success progression and to overcome any sticking points and plateaus okay so now you know how building an attraction and authority flywheel and delivering your services in a much more leveraged hybrid approach through a microeducation business model is the key to securing your financial freedom in this new digital era. But you may be wondering, how do I package my services into a world-class offer? What types, styles and topics of content should I be posting on my growth platform? How often should I be posting on my growth and nurture platforms? What is my magnetic core messaging that attracts my perfect fit customers? How do I know which projects to prioritize to move the business forward the fastest? How do I structure each specific sales asset so they each have the highest chance of both driving and converting traffic into a new customer? What are the core, what are the core key performance indicators I need to know that I'm on the right path? What questions do I need to be asking when I'm setting appointments in the DMs? What questions do I need to be asking when I'm speaking to prospects on sales calls? What tone do I need to be using when I ask each of these questions? You may have some more questions in your head as well. And that is why I built Launch, which is our 12 month growth infrastructure program that provides all four elements of the success equation. So what is the success equation? These are the four elements that I've used in my life and business to maximize the chances of success. So we give things enough time. We make sure that we use a proven game plan. We have clarity on how we are going to roll out that game plan. And then we have accountability systems to make sure that when we are veering off to the side, we have something to slap us around the side of the head to make sure we stay straight. And this is what we've built at uh, Creator Launch. So this is our 12 month growth infrastructure program where we have made sure we have ticked off every single element of the success equation. So time, we give things enough time. So we make sure that we work with our partners for 12 months. We run a proven game plan. So everything goes through our proven game plan. We roll things out as a through, via a custom roadmap. So every single one of our partners has a different, uh, a different a set of circumstances when they join. And so it's up to us to build a custom roadmap for them to roll out based on the sequence that they need to roll out. And then we have absolutely bucket loads of accountability. So we've got one-on-one -on -one coaching, message support, group coaching, KPI reporting, accountability pods, trainings, resources, masterclasses, community. We have multiple levels and I look at the accountability as ticking off the four layers of accountability, which is one-on-one -on -one accountability, buddy accountability, which we have with accountability pods. We have group accountability, which we have um, with our group coaching and then we have community accountability. And then on top of that, we have KPI reporting and tracking and success measurement, which is just absolutely insane. And that is why we get success. So this is launch and what do we have in the program? We have a number of self-directed learning resources. We have 100 plus training videos. We have 10 times modules. Uh, so we have 10, 10 different modules. We've got micro-education business model, understanding yourself, leveling up, dream life design, building your machine, personal branding accelerator, world-class delivery, marketing magnet, content machine, sales mastery. We have a free Creator OS Notion dashboard. This is my secret weapon. It's taken me three years to build and this is what I use to manage my life and business every single day. We have 30 plus playbooks and standard operating procedures for you to plug and play straight into your business. We have a mandatory reading list and then we have four layers of accountability. So like I said, we've got the one-on-one -on -one coaching, we've got our onboarding workshop, we've got quarterly business reviews, 
We've then got weekly group masterclass sessions, monthly accelerated pod mastermind groups. This is our entrepreneur buddy buddy system. And then we've got monthly KPI tracking and reporting. And then we've got our clarity framework. This is so that you get absolute crystal clarity on what you need to get done. So we've got our three month clarity roadmap that I build with you. We have our student success tracker, which keeps us right on the path. And then we have progress checkpoints to make sure that when we're going off to the side, I come along to slap you on the side of the head and we make sure we stay straight metaphorically not physically and then we have monthly kpi reporting which means that we are always going for goals and then where are we trying to get to so everything is target orientated and then we have quarterly business reviews so we act like a damn business this is everything you need to answer all of these questions that we've just asked plus all the other questions you don't even know what to ask yet most importantly now, this is also the same process that allowed Felipe, one of our students, to recently quit his nine to five, move from New York City to Brazil and go all in on his podcast scaling consultancy. And this was taken an hour ago and I've put this in. This is his view now in his uh, his kind of uh, farm in Brazil, which is so sick. So he's going to be there for the next few months building his uh, slice of the digital pie. And this is also the same process that allowed Ben to secure $50,000 worth of funding for his tech consultancy as well. Uh, so yeah, right. Here's a bonus for you. Step number six, apply to join launch. So who should apply to join? Who should apply to join? Ambitious. I will just bold that. You have to be ambitious. Ambitious coaches or consultants that want to make a tangible impact with your work. You know your niche. You know who you want to serve. You've made some sales, but you can't break past that five to 10K per month ceiling. Creators that get excited by the prospect of earning 100K per month, not year. If that scares you, don't bother. Struggling for clarity and looking for a consistent, predictable and consistent proven roadmap to grow your business. Understand how important the next three years are to rapidly growing a personal brand and be on the right side of the wealth gap after the AI revolution. If you're sick of spending hours every day sending thousands of cold DMs or emails that never get opened, tired of working with broke clients who just don't value your expertise, hate wasting time on sales calls with tire kickers who are not perfect fit for your business, you want a consistent pipeline of roasting hot leads ready to work with you. You want to finally quit your nine to five or part-time job so you can go all in on your business, finally make the impact you know you're destined to make. You're stuck working one-on-one -on -one with clients and want to move more to a scalable delivery system so that you can make a bigger impact and serve more people. It's time for you to get paid what you're worth. Build your dream business that buys back your time and allows you to do more of the things you love doing with the people you love the most. And you deeply appreciate the value of education, skipping years of trial and error by proven pathways, learning proven pathways that already work. You want the option to say no and the freedom to say yes to whatever the hell you want, most importantly. So if you're looking for a proven game plan to scale past 30K per month, clarity on how to predictably grow your personal brand in the rapidly growing creator economy, a disgusting number of layers of accountability to keep you on track. If any of these are you, you know what to do. Click the button below this video. It's either a button or it's going to be a link in the description to book a short 20 minute game plan call with me. And on this call, we are going to discuss the biggest challenges that you're facing right now in your business and see if you're going to be the right fit to join our private 12 month growth infrastructure program and community. So if any of that sounds interesting, and if you want to keep hold of your limbs, just click the link down below and I will see you on the call. Right. Ciao.